Section Zero of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume Two, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosato Johnson, and John Rudd. Section Zero an outline narrative tracing briefly the causes connections and consequences of the great events from the rise of greece to the christian era charles f horn ph d earth's upward struggle has been baffled by so many stumbles that critics have not been lacking to suggest that we do not advance at all but only swing in circles like a squirrel in its cage. Certain it is that each ancient civilization seemed to bear in itself the seeds of its own destruction. Yet it may be held with equal truth that each new power, rising above the ruins of the last, held something nobler, was borne upward by some truth its rival could not reach. At no period is this more evident than in the five centuries immediately preceding the Christian era. Persia, Greece, Carthage, Rome, each in turn, with some justice, proclaimed Lord of the world. Each in turn felt the impulse of her glory, and advanced rapidly in culture and knowledge of the arts, and each in turn succumbed to the temptations that beset unlimited success. They degenerated not only in physical strength, but in moral honesty. Let us recognize, however, that the term world ruler, as applied to even the greatest of these nations, has but a restricted sense when the Persian monarch called himself Lord of the Sun and Moon. He only meant in a figurative way that he was acquainted with no other king so powerful as himself, that beyond his own dominions he heard only of feeble colonies, and beyond those the wilderness. Alexander, when he sighed for more worlds to conquer, had in reality made himself lord of less than a quarter of Asia, and of about one-sixtieth part of Europe. No man and no nation has ever yet been entrusted with the government of the entire globe. None has proved sufficiently fitted for the giant task. Each empire has been, as it were, but an experiment, and beyond the border line of seas and deserts which ringed each boastful conqueror, there was always other races developing along slower, and it may be surer, lines. In those old days, our world was in truth too big for conquest. Armies marched on foot. Provisions could not be carried in any quantity unless a general clung to the seashore and depended on his ships. What Alexander might with more truth have sighed for was some modern means of swift transportation possessed of which he might still have enjoyed many interesting bloody battles in more distant lands. THE DEVELOPMENT OF THE GREEKS Taking the idea world power, in the restricted sense suggested, Persia lost it to Greece at Salamis. As the Asiatic hordes fled behind their panic-stricken king, the Greeks, looking round their limited horizon, could see no power that might vie with them. The idea of pressing home their success and overthrowing the entire unwieldy Persian Empire was at once conceived. But the Greeks were of all races least like to weld earth into one dominion. They could not even unite among themselves. In short, it cannot be too emphatically pointed out that the work of Greece was not to consolidate but to separate, to teach the value of each individual man. Asia had made monarchies in plenty. King after king had passed in splendid, glittering pomp across her plains, circled by a crowd of obsequious courtiers. 
trampling on a nameless multitude of slaves. Europe was to make democracies, or at least to try her hand at them. It has been well said that a democracy is the strongest government for defense, the weakest for attack. Every little Greek city clung jealously to its own freedom and to its equally obvious right to dominate its neighbors. The supreme danger of the Persian invasion united them for a moment, but as soon as safety was assured, they recommenced their bickering. Sparta, with her record of ancient leadership, Athens, with her new-won glory against the common foe, each tried to draw the other cities in her train. There was no one man who could dominate them all and consecrate their strength against the enemy. So, for a time, Persia continued to exist. She even, by degrees, regained something of her former influence over the divided cities. Among these, Athens held the foremost rank. She was, as we have previously seen, far more truly representative of the Greek spirit than her rival. Sparta was aristocratic and conservative. Athens, democratic and progressive. The genius of her leaders gathered the lesser towns into a great naval league, in which she grew ever more powerful. Her allies sank to be dependent on unwilling vassals, forced to contribute large sums to the treasury of their overlord. This was the age of Pericles. As Athens became wealthy, her citizens became cultured. Statues, temples, theaters made the city beautiful. Dramatists, orators, and poets made her intellectually renowned. A marvelous outburst, this of Athens, displaying for the first time in history the full capacity of the human mind. Had there been similar flowerings of genius amid forgotten Asiatic times? One doubts it. Doubts if such brilliancy could ever anywhere have passed and left no clearer record of its triumphs. Amid such splendor, it seems captious to point out the flaw. Yet Athenian and all Greek civilization did ultimately decline. It represented intellectual, but not moral, culture. The Greeks delighted intensely in the purely physical life about them. They had small conception of anything beyond. To enjoy, to be successful, that was all their goal. The means scarce counted. The Athenians called Aristides the just, but so little did they honor his high rectitude that they banished him for a decade. His title, or it may have been his insistence on the subject, bored them. His rival, Themistocles, was more suited to their taste, a clever scamp who must always be dealing with both sides in every quarrel and outwitting both. Athens was driven to banish him also, at last, at his too flagrant treachery. But he was not dismissed with the scathing scorn our modern age would heap upon a traitor. He was sent regretfully, as one turns from a charming but too persistently lawless friend. The banishment was only for ten years, and he had his nest already prepared with the Persian king. If you would understand the Greek spirit in its fullest perfection, study Themistocles. Rampant individualism, seeking personal pleasure, clamorous for the admiration of its fellows, but not restrained from secret falsity by any strong moral sense. That was what the Greeks developed in the end. Neither must Athens be regarded as a democracy in the modern sense. She was only so by contrast with Persia or with Sparta. Not every man in the beautiful city voted or enjoyed the riches that flowed into her coffers and could thus afford, free from pecuniary care, to devote himself to art. Athens probably had never more than 30,000 citizens. The rest of the adult male population, vastly outnumbering these, were slaves, 
or foreigners attracted by the city's splendor. But those thirty thousand were certainly men. There were giants in those days. One sometimes stands in wonder at their boldness. What all Greece could not do, what Persia had completely failed in, they undertook. Athens alone should conquer the world. By force of arms they would found an empire of intellect. They fought Persia and Sparta both at once. Plague swept their city, yet they would not yield. Their own subject allies turned against them, and they fought those too. They sent fleets and armies against Syracuse, the mighty power of the West. It was Athens against all mankind. She was unequal to the task, superbly unequal to it. The destruction of her army at Syracuse was only the foremost of a series of inevitable disasters, which left her helpless. After that, Sparta, and then Thebes, became the leading city of Greece. Athens slowly regained her fighting strength, her intellectual supremacy she had not lost. Socrates, greatest of her sons, endeavored to teach a morality higher than the earth had yet received, higher than his contemporaries could grasp. Plato gave to thought a scientific basis. Then Macedonia, a border kingdom of ancient kinship to the Greeks, but not recognized as belonging among them, began to obtrude herself in their affairs, and at length won that leadership for which they had all contended. A hundred and fifty years had elapsed since the Greeks had stood united against Persia. During all that time their strength had been turned against themselves. Now at last the internecine wars were checked, and all the power of the sturdy race was directed by one man, Alexander, King of Macedon. Democracy had made the Greeks intellectually glorious, but politically weak. Monarchy rose from the ruin they had wrought. As though that ancient invasion of Xerxes had been a crime of yesterday, Alexander proclaimed his intention of avenging it, and the Greeks applauded. They understood Persia now far better than in the elder days. They saw what a feeble mass the huge heterogeneous empire had become. Its people were slaves, its soldiers mercenaries. The Greeks themselves had been hired to suppress more than one Persian rebellion, and to foment these also. They had learned the enormous advantage their stronger personality gave them against the masses of sheep-like Asiatics. So it was in holiday mood that they followed Alexander, and in schoolboy roughness that they trampled on the civilization of the East. In fact, it is worth noting that the most vigorous resistance they encountered was not from the Persians, but from the remnant of the Semites, the merchants of the Phoenician city of Tyre. In less than eight years, B.C. 331 to 323, Alexander overran the whole known world of the East, only stopping when, on the border of India, his soldiers broke into open revolt, not against fighting, but against further wandering. If this invasion had been the mere outcome of one man's ambition, it might scarce be worth recording. But Alexander was only the topmost wave in the surging of a long, imminent, inevitable racial movement. Its effect upon civilization, upon the world, was incalculably vast. Alexander and his successors were city-builders, administrators. As such, they spread Greek culture, the Greek idea of individualism, all over the world. How deep was the change made upon the embruted Asiatics, we may perhaps question. Our own age has seen how much of education may be lavished upon an inferior race without materially altering the brute instincts within. The building up of the soul in man is not a matter of individuals, but of centuries. Yet, in at least a superficial way, Greek thought became the thought of all mankind. 
we may dismiss Alexander's savage conquests with a sigh of pity, but we cannot deny him recognition as a most potent teacher of the world. His empire did not last. It was in too obvious opposition to all that we have recognized as the Grecian spirit. At his death the same impulse seems to have stirred each one of his subordinates to snatch for himself a kingdom from the confusion. Instead of one there were soon three, four, and then a dozen semi-Grecian states in Asia. The Greek element in each grew very faint. From this time onward, Asia takes a less prominent place in world affairs. Her ancient leadership in the march of civilization had long been yielded to the Greeks. Now her resemblance of military power disappeared as well. Only two further happenings in all Asia seem worth noting, down to the birth of Christ. One of these was the Tartar conquest of China, an event which coalesced the Tartars, helped make them a nation. It was thus fraught with the most disastrous consequences for the Europe of the future. The other was the revolt of the Hebrews under Judas Maccabeus, against the Grecian rulers. This was a religious revolt, a religious war. Here, for the first time, we find a people who will believe, who can believe, in no god but their own, who will die sooner than give worship to another. We approach the borders of an age where the spirit is more valued than the body, where the mental is stronger than the physical, where facts are dominated by ideas. Had Alexander, even at the moment of his greatest strength, directed his forces westward instead of east, he would have found a different world and encountered a sturdier resistance. He himself recognized this, and during his last years was gathering all the resources of his unwieldy empire to hurl them against Carthage and against Italy. What the issue might have been, no man can say. Alexander's death ended forever the impossible attempt to unite his race. Once more and until the end, the Grecian strength was wasted against itself. This gave opportunity to the growing powers of the West. Alexander is scarce gone ere we hear Carthage boasting that the Mediterranean is but a private lake in her possession. She rules all western Africa and Spain, Sardinia and Corsica. She masters the Greek of Sicily, against whom Athens failed. Rome is compelled to sign treaties with her as an inferior. The Growth of Rome Rome was husbanding her strength. The little republic of B.C. 510 had grown much during the two centuries of Grecian splendor. Her people had become far better fitted for conquest than their eastern kinsmen. It is presumable that here, too, it was the difference of surroundings which had differentiated the race. The ancient Etrurian, non-Aryan civilization, on which the Latins intruded, was apparently more advanced than their own. For centuries their utmost prowess scarce sufficed to maintain their independence. Thus it was not possible for them to become too self-satisfied, to stand afar off and look down on their neighbors with Grecian scorn. The ego was less prominently developed, the necessity of mutual dependence and united action was more deeply taught. Their records display less of brilliancy but more of patient persistency than those of Greece, less of spectacular individualism, more of truly patriotic self-suppression. In Rome, even more than in Sparta, the state was everything. During the early days, men found their highest glory in making their city glorious. Their proudest boast was to be citizens of Rome. To trace the slow steps by which the tiny republic grew to be mistress of all Italy would take too long. She settled her internal difficulties as all such difficulties must be settled, if the race is to progress. That is, she became more democratic. 
as the lower classes advanced in knowledge and intelligence. They insisted on a share of the government. They fought their way to it. They united Rome, mastered the other Latin cities, and admitted them to partnership in her power. She conquered the Etruscans and the Samnites. For a moment we find her almost overwhelmed by an inroad of the wild Celtic tribes from the forests of Central Europe. But fortunately for her, the other Italian states were equally crushed. It was weakness against weakness, and the Romans retained their foremost place. Not till more than a century later were they brought into serious conflict with the Greeks. In the year B.C. 280, Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, who had won a temporary leadership over a portion of the Greek land, undertook the conquest of the West. Fifty years before, Alexander, with far greater power, might have been victorious over a feebler Rome. Pyrrhus failed completely. If the Romans had less dash and a less wide experience of varied warfare than his followers, they had far more of true heroic endurance. The Greeks had reached that stage of individual culture where they were much too selfishly intelligent to be willing to die in battle. Pyrrhus withdrew from Italy. Grecian brilliancy was helpless against Roman strength of union. Then came the far more serious contest between Rome and Carthage. Carthage was a Phoenician, a Semite state, and hers was the last, the most gigantic struggle made by Semitism to recover its waning superiority, to dominate the ancient world. Three times in three tremendous wars did she and Rome put forth their utmost strength against each other. Hannibal, perhaps, the greatest military genius who ever lived, fought upon the side of Carthage. At one time, Rome seemed crushed, helpless before him. Yet in the end, Rome won. It was not by the brilliancy of her commanders, not by the superiority of her resources. It was the grim, cool courage of the Aryan mind, showing strongest and calmest when face to face with ruin. Our modern philosophers, being Aryan, assure us that the victory of Carthage would have been an irretrievable disaster to mankind, that her falsity, her narrow selfishness, her bloody inhumanity would have stifled all progress, that her dominion would have been the tyranny of a few heartless masters over a world of tortured slaves. On the other hand, Rome up to this point had certainly been a generous mistress to her subjects. She had left them peace and prosperity among themselves. She had given them as much political freedom as was consistent with her sovereignty. She had well nigh succeeded in welding all Italy into a Roman nation. It is noteworthy that the large majority of the Italian cities clung to her, even in the darkest straits to which she was reduced by Hannibal. Yet when the fall of her last great rival left Rome irresistible abroad, her methods changed. It is hard to see how even Carthaginians could have been more cruel, more grasping, more corrupt than the Roman rulers of the provinces. Having conquered the governments of the world, Rome had to face outbreak after outbreak from the unarmed, unsheltered masses of the people. Her barbarity drove them to mad despair. Servile wars, slave outbreaks, are dotted all over the last century of the Roman Republic. The good, if there was any good, that Roman dominion brought the world at that period, was the spreading of Greek culture across the western half of the world. As Rome mastered the Greek states one by one, their genius won a subtler triumph over the conqueror. Her generals recognized and admired a culture superior to their own. They carried off the statues of Greece for the adornment of their villas, and with equal eagerness they appropriated her manners and her thought, her literature and her gods. But this superficial culture could not save the Roman Republic from the dry rot that sapped her vitals from within. As a mere matter of numbers, 
the actual citizens of Rome, or even of the semi-Roman districts, close around her, were too few to continue fighting over all the vast empire they controlled. The sturdy peasant population of Italy slowly disappeared. The actual inhabitants of the capital came to consist of a few thousand vastly wealthy families who held all the power. A few thousand more of poorer citizens depended on the rich, and then a vast swarm of slaves and foreigners, feeders on the crumbs of the Roman table. In the battles against Carthage, the mass of Rome's armies had consisted of her own citizens, or of allies closely united to them in blood and fortune. Her later victories were won by hired troops, men gathered from every clime and every race. Roman generals still might lead them. Roman laws environed them. Roman gold employed them. Yet the fact remained that in these armies lay the strength of the Republic, no longer within her walls, no longer in the stout hearts of her citizens. Perhaps the world itself was slow in seeing this degeneration. The Gracchi brothers tried to stem the tide, and they were slain, sacrificed by the nation they sought to save. Cornelius Sulla, the man who completed, and at the same time made plain to all, the change that had been growing up. Having bitter grievances against his enemies in the capital, he appealed for redress, not to the Roman Senate, not to the votes of the populace, but to the swords of the legions he commanded. Twice he marched his soldiers against Rome. He brushed aside the feeble resistance that was offered and entered the city like a conqueror. The blood of those who had opposed his wishes flowed in streams. Three thousand senators and knights, the flower of the Roman aristocracy, were slain at his nod. Of the common folk and of the Italians throughout the peninsula, the slaughter was immeasurable. And when his bloody vengeance was at last glutted, Sulla ruled as an extravagant, conscienceless, licentious dictator. Rome had found a fitting master. The Struggle of Individuals for Supremacy The Roman people, the mighty race who had defied a Hannibal at their gates, was clearly come to an end. Sulla had provided the power of the Republic to be an empty shell. After his death, men used the empty forums a while, but the surviving aristocrats had learned their awful lesson. They put no further faith in the strength of the city. They watched the armies and the generals. They intrigued for the various commands. It was an exciting game. Life and fortune were the stakes they risked. The prize? The mastery of a helpless world, waiting to be plundered. Pompey and Caesar proved the ablest players. Pompey overthrew what was left of the Greek Asiatic kingdoms and returned to Rome the idol of his troops. Well nigh as powerful has been Sulla. Caesar, looking in his turn for a place to build up an army devoted to himself, selected Gaul and spent eight years in subduing and civilizing what was in a way the most important of all of Rome's conquests. In Gaul he came in contact with another, fresher Aryan race. Rome received new soldiers for her legions, new brains fitted to understand and carry on the work of civilizing the world. When Caesar, turning away from Britain, marched these new-formed legions back against Rome, even as Sulla had done, it was almost like another Gallic invasion of the south. Pompey fled. He gathered his legions from Asia, and the world resounded once more to the clash of arms. This, then, was the third and final stage of the huge struggle for empire. War was still the business of the world. Rome had first defeated foreign nations. Then she had to defeat the uprisings of the subject peoples. Now her chiefs, finding her exhausted, fought among themselves for the supreme power. Armies of Asiatics, armies of Gauls, each claiming to represent Rome, 
battled over her helpless body. Caesar was victorious. But when the conquering power which had once belonged to the united nation became embodied in a single man, there was a new way by which it might be checked. The government of Rome, like that of the Greek and Asiatic tyrannies, became a despotism tempered by assassination, and Caesar was its foremost victim. His death did not stop the fascinating gamble for empire. It only added one more move to the possible complexities of the game. The lesser players had their chance. They intrigued and they fought. Egypt, the last remaining civilized state outside of Rome, was drawn into the whirlpool also. Cleopatra and Antony acted their reckless parts, and at length, out of the worldwide tumult, emerged young Octavius to assume his role as Augustus Caesar, acknowledged emperor of the world. Note, however, that the term world is still one of boast, not truth. Emperor over many men, Augustus was. But the powers of nature still shut many races safe beyond his mastery. The ocean bounded his dominion on the west. The deserts to the south and east. The German forests to the north. These last he did essay to conquer, but they proved beyond him. The wild German tribes, having no cities, which they must defend at any cost, could afford to flee or hide. Choosing their own time and place when they rose suddenly, smote the legions of Augustus, and melted into the wilderness again. Rome was checked at last. No civilized nation had been able to stand against her, but the wild tribes of the Germans and the Parthians did. Barbarism had still by far the largest portion of the world wherein to live and develop, and gather brain and brawn. Rome could not conquer the wilderness. End of section zero. Section one of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Institution and Fall of the Decemvirate in Rome, B.C. 450, by Henry G. Liddell. When wars and pestilence had laid a heavy burden upon the Roman people, there appeared to have been a period in which internal commotions and civil strife were stilled, and the quarrels of patricians and plebeians gave way to temporary truce. On the inevitable renewal of the old struggle, the College of Tribunes adopted a measure favorable to the plebeians, insofar as it provided means for checking the abuse of power on the part of consuls in punishing members of that class in connection with the prosecution of suits against them. The passage of this measure had the effect of reopening former conflicts, the patrician elements becoming greatly alarmed at what they regarded as a fresh encroachment upon their hereditary rights. The contest was long and bitter, each side either bringing forward or rejecting again and again the same measures or the same representatives. Finally, compromises were made, and in the year B.C. 452, a commission of ten men, called Decemvirs, constituting the Decemvirate, was chosen consisting wholly of patricians who entered with great efficiency upon the discharge of legislative duties, which resulted in the production of a new code. This was approved by the Senate and by the popular representatives, and was published in the form of ten copper plates or tables, which were affixed to the Speaker's pulpit in the Forum. Among the new decemvirs appointed in the year B.C. 450 were several plebeians, the first official representatives of the entire people who were chosen from that class. The patrician burgesses endeavored to wrest independence from the plebs after the battle of Lake Regillus, and the latter, ruined by constant wars with the neighboring nations, being compelled to make good their losses by borrowing money from patrician creditors, and liable to become bondsmen in default of payment, at length deserted the city, 
and only returned on condition of being protected by tribunes of their own. They then, by the firmness of Publilius Valero and Leatorius, obtained the right of electing these tribunes at their own assembly, the Comitia of the tribes. Finally, the great consul Spurius Cassius endeavored to relieve the commonalty by an agrarian law so as to better their condition permanently. The execution of the agrarian law was constantly evaded, but on the conquest of Antium from the Volsians in the year B.C. 468, a colony was sent thither, and this was one of the first examples of a distribution of public land to poorer citizens, which answered two purposes, the improvement of their condition, and the defense of the place against the enemy. Nor did the tribunes, now made altogether independent of the patricians, fail to assert their power. One of the first persons who felt the force of their arm was the second Appius Claudius. This Sabine noble, following his father's example, had, after the departure of the Fabii, led the opposition to the Publilian law. When he took the field against the Volsians, his soldiers would not fight, and the stern commander put to death every tenth man in his legions. For the acts of his consulship he was brought to trial by the tribunes M. Duilius and C. Sicinius. Seeing that conviction was certain, the proud patrician avoided humiliation by suicide. Nevertheless, the border wars still continued, and the plebeians suffered much. To the evils of debt and want were added about this time the horrors of pestilential disease, which visited the Roman territory several times at that period. In one year, B.C. 464, the two consuls, two of the four augurs, and the curio Maximus, who was the head of all the patricians, were swept off a fact which implies the death of a vast number of less distinguished persons. The government was administered by the Plebeian Ediles under the control of the senatorial Interregis. The Volsians and Aquians ravaged the country up to the walls of Rome, and the safety of the city must be attributed to the Latins and Hernici, not to the men of Rome. Meantime, the tribunes had in vain demanded a full execution of the agrarian law. But in the year B.C. 462, one of the sacred college, by name C. Terentilius Harsa, came forward with a bill, the object of which was to give the plebeians a sure footing in the state. This man perceived that as long as the consuls retained their almost despotic power and were elected by the influence of the patricians, this order had in its power to thwart all measures, even after they were passed, which tended to advance the interests of the plebeians. He therefore no longer demanded the execution of the agrarian law, but proposed that a commission of ten men, decimbiri, should be appointed to draw up constitutional laws for regulating the future relations of the patricians and plebeians. The reform bill of Tarantilius was, as might be supposed, vehemently resisted by the patrician burgesses, but the plebeians supported their champion no less warmly. For five consecutive years, the same tribunes were re-elected, and in vain endeavored to carry the bill. This was the time which least fulfills the character which we have claimed for the Roman people, patience and temperance combined with firmness in their demands. To prevent the tribunes from carrying their law, the younger patricians thronged to the assemblies and interfered with all proceedings. Tarantilius, they said, was endeavoring to confound all distinction between the orders. Some scenes occurred which seemed to show that both sides were prepared for civil war. In the year B.C. 460, the city was alarmed by hearing that the capital had been seized by a band of Sabines and exiled Romans under the command of one Herdonius. Who these exiles were is uncertain, but we know, by the legend of Cincinnatus, that Queso Quinctius, the son of that old hero, was an exile. It has been inferred, therefore, that he was among them, that the tribunes had succeeded in banishing from the city the most violent of their opponents, and that these persons had not scrupled to associate themselves with Sabines to recover their homes. The consul Valerius, aided by the Latins of Tusculum, levied an army to attack the insurgents, on condition that after success the law should be fully considered. The exiles were driven out, and Herdonius was killed, but the consul fell in the assault, and the patricians, led by old Cincinnatus, refused to fulfill his promises. Then followed the danger of the Equian invasion, to which the legend of Cincinnatus as given above refers. The stern old man used his dictatorial power quite as much to crush the tribunes at home as to conquer the enemies abroad. 
One of the historians tells us that in this period of seditious violence, many of the leading plebeians were assassinated, as the tribune Genusius had been, and to this time only can be attributed the horrible story, mentioned by more than one writer, that nine tribunes were burned alive at the insistence of their colleague Musius. Society was utterly disorganized. The two orders were on the brink of civil war. It seemed as if Rome was to become the city of discord, not of law. Happily, there were moderate men in both orders. Now, as at the time of the succession, their voices prevailed and a compromise was arranged. In the eighth year after the first promulgation of the Tarentillian law, this compromise was made, B.C. 454. The law itself was no longer pressed by the tribunes. The patricians, on the other hand, so far gave way as to allow three men, triumviri, to be appointed, who were to travel into Greece and bring back a copy of the laws of Solon, as well as the laws and institutes of any other Greek states which they might deem good and useful. These were to be the groundwork of a new code of laws, such as should give fair and equal rights to both orders, and restrain the arbitrary power of the patrician magistrates. Another concession made by the patrician lords was a small installment of the agrarian law. L. Asilius, tribune of the plebs, proposed that all the Aventine Hill, being public land, should be made over to the plebs, to be their quarter forever, as the other hills were occupied by the patricians and their clients. This hill, it will be remembered, was consecrated to the goddess Diana, Jana, and though included in the walls of Servius, was not yet within the sacred limits, Pomerarium, of the patrician city. After some opposition, the patricians suffered this Isilian law to pass, in hopes of soothing the anger of the plebeians. The land was parceled out into building sites, but as there was not enough to give a separate plot to every plebeian householder that wished to live in the city, one allotment was assigned to several persons, who built a joint house, flats, or stories, each of which was inhabited, as in Edinburgh and in most foreign towns, by a separate family. The three men who had been sent into Greece returned in the third year, B.C. 452. They found the city free from domestic strife, partly from the concessions already made, partly from the expectation of what was now to follow, and partly from the effect of a pestilence which had broken out anew. So far did moderate councils now prevail among the patricians, that after some little delay they agreed to suspend the ordinary government by the consuls and other officers, and in their stead to appoint a council of ten, who were, during their existence, to be entrusted with all the functions of government. But they were to have a double duty. They were not only an administrative, but also a legislative council. On the one hand, they were to conduct the government, administer justice, and command the armies. On the other, they were to draw up a code of laws by which equal justice was to be dealt out to the whole Roman people, to patricians and plebeians alike and by which especially the authority to be exercised by the consuls or chief magistrates was to be clearly determined and settled. This Supreme Council of Ten, or Decemvirs, was first appointed in the year B.C. 450. They were all patricians. At their head stood Appius Claudius and T. Genusius, who had already been chosen consuls for this memorable year. This Appius Claudius, the third of his name, was son and grandson of those two patrician chiefs who had opposed the leaders of the plebeians so vehemently in the matter of the tribunate, but he affected a different conduct from his sires. He was the most popular man of the whole council, and became in fact the sovereign of Rome. At first he used his great power well, and the first year's government of the Decemvirs was famed for justice and moderation. They also applied themselves diligently to their great work of lawmaking, and before the end of the year had drawn up a code of ten tables, which were posted in the forum, that all citizens might examine them and suggest amendments to the decemvirs. After due time thus spent, the ten tables were confirmed and made law at the Comitia of the Centuries. By this code, equal justice was to be administered to both orders, without distinction of persons. At the close of the year, the first decemvirs laid down their office just as the consuls and other officers of state had been accustomed to do before. They were succeeded by a second set of ten, who for the next year at least were to conduct the government like their predecessors. The only one of the old decemvirs re-elected was Appius Claudius. The patricians, indeed, endeavored to prevent even this, and to this end he was himself appointed to preside at the new elections. 
for it was held impossible for a chief magistrate to return his own name when he was himself presiding. But Appius scorned precedence. He returned himself as elected, together with nine others, men of no name, while two of the great Quinctian gens who offered themselves were rejected. Of the new Dechemvirs, it is certain that three, and it is probable that five, were plebeians. Appius, with the plebeian Opius, held the judicial office and remained in the city, and these two seem to have been regarded as the chiefs. The other six commanded the armies and discharged the duties previously assigned to the quaestors and ediles. The first Dechemvirs had earned the respect and esteem of their fellow citizens. The new Council of Ten deserved the hatred which has ever since cloven to their name. Appius now threw off the mask which he had so long worn, and assumed his natural character, the same as had distinguished his sire and grandsire of unhappy memory. He became an absolute despot. His brethren in the council offered no hindrance to his will. Even the plebeian Dechemvirs, bribed by power, fell into his way of action, and supported his tyranny. They each had twelve lictors, who carried facies with the axes in them, the symbol of absolute power, as in the times of the kings so that it was said Rome had now twelve Tarquins instead of one, and one hundred and twenty armed lictors instead of twelve. All freedom of speech ceased. The Senate was seldom called together. The leading men, patricians and plebeians, left the city. The outward aspect of things was that of perfect calm and peace, but an opportunity only was wanting for the discontent which was smoldering in all men's hearts to break out and show itself. By the end of the year, the Dechemvirs had added two more tables to the code, so that there were now twelve tables, but these two last were of a most oppressive and arbitrary kind, devoted chiefly to restore the ancient privileges of the patrician caste. Of these tables, it should be observed that they were made laws not by the vote of the people, but by the simple edict of the Dechemvirs. It was no doubt expected that the second Dechemvirs would also have held comitia for the election of successors but Appius and his colleagues showed no such intention, and when the year came to a close, they continued to hold office as if they had been re-elected. So firmly did their power seem to be established that we hear of no endeavor being made to induce them to resign. In the course of this next year, B.C. 449, the border wars were renewed. On the north the Sabines and the Equians in the northeast invaded the Roman country at the same time. The latter penetrated as far as Mount Algidus, as in B.C. 458, when they were routed by old Cincinnatus. The Dechemvirs probably, like the patrician burgesses in former times, regarded these inroads not without satisfaction, for they turned away the mind of the people from their sufferings at home. Yet from these very wars sprung the events which overturned their power and destroyed themselves. Two armies were levied, one to check the Sabines, the other to oppose the Equians, and these were commanded by the six military Dechemvirs. Appius and Opius remained to administer affairs at home, but there was no spirit in the armies. Both were defeated, and that which was opposed to the Equians was compelled to take refuge within the walls of Tusculum. Then followed two events which were preserved in well-known legends, and which give the popular narrative of the manner in which the power of the Dechemvirs was at last overthrown. Legend of Sixius Dentatus in the army sent against the Sabines, Sisius Dentatus was known as the bravest man. He was then serving as a centurion. He had fought in 120 battles. He had slain eight champions in single combat, had saved the lives of 14 citizens, had received 40 wounds all in front, had followed in nine triumphal processions, and had won crowns and decorations without number. This gallant veteran had taken an active part in the civil contests between the two orders, and was now suspected by the Dechemvirs commanding the Sabine army of plotting against them. Accordingly, they determined to get rid of him, and for this end they sent him out as if to reconnoitre, with a party of soldiers who were secretly instructed to murder him. Having discovered their design, he set his back against a rock and resolved to sell his life dearly. More than one of his assailants fell, and the rest stood at bay around him, not venturing to come within sword's length, when one wretch climbed up the rock behind and crushed the brave old man with a massive stone. But the manner of his death could not be hidden from the army, and the generals only prevented an outbreak by honoring him with a magnificent funeral. Such was the state of things in the Sabine army. 
Legend of Virginia. Footnote. Dionysius is the authority for this legend. End of footnote. The other army had a still grosser outrage to complain of. In this there was a notable centurion, Virginius by name, his daughter Virginia, just ripening into womanhood, beautiful as the day, was betrothed to L. Isilius, the tribune who had carried the law for allotting the Aventine Hill to the plebeians. Appius Claudius, the Dutch envir, saw her and lusted to make her his own, and with this intent he ordered one of his clients, M. Claudius by name, to lay hands upon her as she was going to her school in the forum and to claim her as his slave. The man did so, and when the cries of her nurse brought a crowd round them, M. Claudius insisted on taking her before the Dechemvir, in order, as he said, to have the case fairly tried. Her friends consented, and no sooner had Appius heard the matter than he gave judgment that the maiden should be delivered up to the claimant, who should be bound to produce her in case her alleged father appeared to gainsay the claim. Now this judgment was directly against one of the laws of the Twelve Tables, which Appius himself had framed. For therein it was provided that any person being at freedom should continue free till it was proved that such person was a slave. Isilius, therefore, with Numitorius, the uncle of the maiden, boldly argued against the legality of the judgment, and at length Appius, fearing a tumult, agreed to leave the girl in their hands on condition of their giving bail to bring her before him the next morning, and then, if Virginius did not appear, he would at once, he said, give her up to her pretended master. To this Isilius consented, but he delayed giving bail, pretending that he could not procure it readily. In the meantime he sent off a secret message to the camp on Algidus to inform Virginius of what had happened. As soon as the bail was given, Appius also sent a message to the Dechemvirs in command of the army, ordering them to refuse leave of absence to Virginius. But when this last message arrived, Virginius was already halfway on his road to Rome, for the distance was not more than twenty miles, and he had started at nightfall. Next morning, early, Virginius entered the forum, leading his daughter by the hand, both clad in mean attire. A great number of friends and matrons attended him, and he went about among the people, entreating them to support him against the tyranny of Appius. So when Appius came to take his place on the judgment seat, he found the forum full of people, all friendly to Virginius and his cause but he inherited the boldness as well as the vices of his sires, and though he saw Virginius standing there ready to prove that he was the maiden's father, he at once gave judgment against his own law that Virginius should be given up to M. Claudius till it should be proved that she was free. The wretch came up to seize her, and the lictors kept the people from him. Virginius, now despairing of deliverance, begged Appius to allow him to ask the maiden whether she were indeed his daughter or not. If, said he, I find I am not her father, I shall bear her loss the lighter. Under this pretense he drew her aside to a spot upon the northern side of the forum, afterward called the Nova Tabernke, and here, snatching up a knife from a butcher's stall, he cried, In this way only can I keep thee free, and so saying stabbed her to the heart. Then he turned to the tribunal and said, On thee, Appius, and on thy head be this blood. Appius cried out to seize the murderer, but the crowd made way for Virginius, and he passed through them holding up the bloody knife, and went out at the gate, and made straight for the army. There, when the soldiers had heard his tale, they at once abandoned their decemviral generals, and marched to Rome. They were soon followed by the other army from the Sabine frontier, for to them Asilius had gone, and Numitorius, and they found willing ears among men who were already enraged by the murder of old Sucius Dentatus. So the two armies joined their banners, elected new generals, and encamped upon the Aventine Hill, the quarter of the plebeians. Meantime, the people at home had risen against Appius, and after driving him from the forum, they joined their armed fellow citizens upon the Aventine. There, the whole body of the commons, armed and unarmed, hung like a dark cloud ready to burst upon the city. Whatever may be the truth of the legends of Sisius and Virginia, there can be no doubt that the conduct of the Dechemvirs had brought matters to the verge of civil war. At this juncture the Senate met, and the moderate party so far prevailed as to send their own leaders, M. Horatius Barbatus and L. Valerius Potidus, to negotiate with the insurgents. The plebeians were ready to listen to the voices of these men, for they remembered that the consuls of the first year of the Republic when the patrician burgesses were friends to the plebeians, were named Valerius and Horatius, 
and so they appointed M. Duilius, a former tribune, to be their spokesman. But no good came of it, and Duilius persuaded the plebeians to leave the city and once more to occupy the sacred mount. Then remembrances of the great secession came back upon the minds of the patricians, and the senate, observing the calm and resolute bearing of the plebeian leaders, compelled the decemvirs to resign, and sent back Valerius and Horatius to negotiate anew. The leaders of the plebeians demanded, first, that the tribuneship should be restored, and the comitia tributa recognized. Secondly, that a right of appeal to the people against the power of the supreme magistrate should be secured. Thirdly, that full indemnity should be granted to the movers and promoters of the late secession. Fourthly, that the decemvirs should be burnt alive. Of these demands, the deputies of the Senate agreed to the three first, but the fourth, they said, was unworthy of a free people. It was a piece of tyranny as bad as any of the worst acts of the late government, and it was needless, because any one who had reason of complaint against the late decemvirs might proceed against them according to law. The plebeians listened to these words of wisdom and withdrew their savage demand. The other three were confirmed by the fathers, and the plebeians returned to their quarters on the Aventine. Here they held an assembly according to their tribes, in which the Pontifex Maximus presided and they now for the first time elected ten tribunes, first Virginius, Numitorius, and Isilius, then Duilius, and six others. So full were their minds of the wrong done to the daughter of Virginius, so entirely was it the blood of young Virginia that overthrew the Decemvirs, even as that of Lucretia had driven out the Tarquins. The plebeians now returned to the city, headed by their ten tribunes, a number which was never again altered so long as the tribunate continued in existence. It remained for the patricians to redeem the pledges given by their agents Valerius and Horatius on the other demands of the plebeian leaders. The first thing to settle was the election of the supreme magistrates. The decemvirs had fallen, and the state was without any executive government. It has been supposed, as we have said above, that the government of the decemvirs was intended to be perpetual. The patricians gave up their consuls and the plebeians their tribunes, on condition that each order was to be admitted to an equal share in the new decemviral college. But the tribunes were now restored in augmented number, and it was but natural that the patricians should insist on again occupying all places in the supreme magistracy. By common consent, as it would seem, the comitia of the centuries met and elected to the consulate the two patricians who had shown themselves the friends of both orders, L. Valerius Potidus and M. Horatius Barbatus. Thus ended the government of the Decemberate. End of section 1. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 2 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 1. Section 2. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 1. Under the sway of Pericles, many changes occurred in the civil affairs of Athens affecting the constitution of the state and the character and administration of its laws. Events of magnitude marked the struggles of the Athenians with other powers, the development of art and learning was carried to an unprecedented height, and the age of Pericles is the most illustrious in ancient history. Pericles began his career by opposing the aristocratic party of Athens, led by Simon. In this policy, he was aided by complications arising with Sparta and Argos. Directing his attack particularly against the Areopagus, he succeeded in greatly modifying the composition of that body and diminishing its powers. The exile of Simon, the strengthening of Athens by new alliances, and the vigorous prosecution of wars against Persia and Corinth combined to establish his supremacy, 
which was still further confirmed by the building of the long walls connecting Athens with the sea, and by the acquisition of neighboring territory. A favorable convention was concluded with Persia, Athens resumed a state of general peace, and Pericles found himself at the head of a powerful empire formed out of a confederacy previously existing. The strength of this empire was indeed soon impaired by ill-judged military movements, against the advice of Pericles himself, but during six years of peace which followed, he succeeded in perfecting a state whose preeminence in intellectual, political, and artistic development has no rival. In the later wars of Athens, the renown of Pericles was still further enhanced, but his chief glory arose from the architectural adornment of the city, and especially from the building of the Parthenon and the splendid decoration of the Acropolis. While his work of judicial reform remains an added monument to his fame, and among the masters of eloquence his orations preserve for him a foremost place. Pericles was of the tribe Acamantus, and of the township of Cholargos, and was descended from the noblest families in Athens on both his father's and mother's side. His father, Xanthippus, defeated the Persian generals at Mycale, while his mother, Argaristi, was a descendant of Clisthenes, who drove the sons of Pisitratus out of Athens, put an end to their despotic rule, and established a new constitution admirably calculated to reconcile all parties and save the country. She dreamed that she had brought forth a lion, and a few days afterward was delivered of Pericles. His body was symmetrical, but his head was long, out of all proportion, for which reason, in nearly all his statues, he is represented wearing a helmet, as the sculptures did not wish, I suppose, to reproach him with this blemish. The Attic poets called him Squillhead, and the comic poet Cratinus, in his play Chirones, says... From Kronos old in faction is sprung a tyrant dread, and all Olympus calls him the man-compelling head. And again, in the play of Nemesis, Come hospitable Zeus with lofty head, Telecladies too speaks of him as sitting, Bow down with a dreadful frown, Because matters of state have gone wrong, Until at last from his head so vast His ideas birth forth in a throng. And Eupolis, in his play of Demoi, asking questions about each of the great orators as they come up from the other world one after the other, when at last Pericles ascends, says, The great headpiece of those below. Most writers tell us that his tutor in music was Damon, whose name they say should be pronounced with the first syllable short. Aristotle, however, says that he studied under Pythocleides. This Damon, it seems, was a sophist of the highest order who used the name of music to conceal this accomplishment from the world, but who really trained Pericles for his political contests, just as a trainer prepares an athlete for the games. However, Damon's use of music as a pretext did not impose upon the Athenians, who banished him by ostracism, as a busybody and lover of despotism. Pericles greatly admired Anaxagoras, and became deeply interested in grand speculations, which gave him a haughty spirit and a lofty style of oratory far removed from vulgarity and low buffoonery, and also an imperturbable gravity of countenance and a calmness of demeanor and appearance, which no incident could disturb as he was speaking, while the tone of his voice never showed that he heeded any interruption. These advantages greatly impressed the people. The poet Ion, however, says that Pericles was overbearing and insolent in conversation, and that his pride had in it a great deal of contempt for others, while he praises Simon's civil, sensible, and polished address. But we may disregard Ion as a mere dramatic poet who always sees in great men something upon which to exercise his satiric vein, whereas Zeno used to invite those who called the haughtiness of Pericles a mere courting of popularity and affectation of grandeur to court popularity themselves in the same fashion, since the acting of such a part might insensibly mold their dispositions until they resembled that of their model. Pericles, when young, greatly feared the people. He had a certain personal likeness to the despot Pisistratus, and as his own voice was sweet and he was ready and fluent in speech, Old men who had known Pisitratus were struck by his resemblance to him. He was also rich of noble birth and had powerful friends, so that he feared he might be banished by ostracism and consequently held aloof from politics, but proved himself a brave and daring soldier in wars. 
but when Aristides was dead, Themistocles banished, and Simon generally absent on distant campaigns, Pericles engaged in public affairs, taking the popular side, that of the poor and many, against that of the rich and few, quite contrary to his own feelings, which were entirely aristocratic. He feared, it seems, that he might be suspected of a design to make himself despot, and seeing that Simon took the side of the nobility and was much beloved by them, he took himself to the people as a means of obtaining safety for himself, and a strong party to combat that of Simon. He immediately altered his mode of life, was never seen in any street except that which led to the marketplace and the national assembly, and declined all invitations to dinner and such like social gatherings. But Pericles feared to make himself too common even with the people, and only addressed them after long intervals, not speaking upon every subject and not constantly addressing them, but, as Critolaus says, keeping himself like the Salaminian Trireme for great crises, and allowing his friends and the other orators to manage matters of less moment. Wishing to adopt a style of speaking consonant with his haughty manner and lofty spirit, Pericles made free use of the instrument which Anaxagoras, as it were, put into his hand, and often tinged his oratory with natural philosophy. He far surpassed all others by using this lofty intelligence and power of universal consummation, as the divine Plato calls it, in addition to his natural advantages, adorning his oratory with apt illustrations drawn from physical science. For this reason, some think that he was nicknamed the Olympian, though some refer this to his improvement of the city by new and beautiful buildings, and others from his power both as a politician and general. It is not by any means unlikely that these causes all combined to produce the name. Pericles was very cautious about his words, and whenever he ascended the tribune to speak, used first to pray to the gods that nothing unfitted for the present occasion might fall from his lips. He left no writings except the measures which he brought forward, and very few of his sayings are recorded. Thucydides represents the constitution under Pericles as a democracy in name, but really an aristocracy because the government was all in the hands of one leading citizen. But as many other writers tell us that, during his administration, the people received grants of land abroad, and were indulged with dramatic entertainments, in payments for their services, in consequence of which they fell into bad habits, and became extravagant and licentious, instead of sober, hard-working people as they had been before, let us consider the history of this change, viewing it by the light of the facts themselves. First of all, Pericles had to measure himself with Simon, and to transfer the affections of the people from Simon to himself. As he was not so rich a man as Simon, who used from his own ample means to give a dinner daily to any poor Athenian who required it, clothe aged persons, and take away the fences round his property, so that any one might gather the fruit, Pericles, unable to vie with him in this, turned his attention to a distribution of the public funds among the people, at the suggestion, we are told by Aristotle, of Demonides of Oya by the money paid for public spectacles for citizens acting as jurymen and other paid offices and largesses he soon won over the people to his side so that he was able to use them in his attack upon the senate of the areopagus of which he himself was now to member never having been chosen archon or thesmothet or king archon or polymarch these offices had from ancient times been obtained by lot, and it was only through them that those who had approved themselves in the discharge of them were advanced to Aeropagus. For this reason it was that Pericles, when he gained strength with the populace, destroyed this senate, making a fieltes, bring forward a bill which restricted its judicial powers, while he himself succeeded in getting Simon banished by ostracism, as a friend of Sparta and a hater of the people, although he was second to no Athenian in birth or fortune, and won most brilliant victories over the Persians, and had filled Athens with plunder and spoils of war. So great was the power of Pericles with the common people. One of the provisions of ostracism was that the person banished should remain in exile for ten years, but during this period the Lacedaemonians, with a great force, invaded the territory of Tanagra, and as the Athenians at once marched out to attack them, Simon came back from exile, took his place in full armor among the ranks of his own tribe, and hoped by distinguishing himself in the battle among his fellow citizens to prove the falsehood of the Laconian sympathies with which he had been charged. However, the friends of Pericles drove him away as an exile. 
On the other hand, Pericles fought more bravely in that battle than he had ever fought before, and surpassed everyone in reckless daring, the friends of Simon also, whom Pericles had accused of Laconian leanings, now that they had lost a great battle on the frontier and expected to be hard-pressed during the summer by the Lacedaemonians. Pericles, perceiving this, lost no time in gratifying the popular wish, but himself proposed a decree for his recall, and Simon on his return reconciled the two states, for he was on familiar terms with the Spartans, who were hated by Pericles and the other leaders of the common people. Some say that, before Simon's recall by Pericles, a secret compact was made by him by Elpiniki, Simon's sister, that Simon was to proceed on foreign service against the Persians with a fleet of two hundred ships, while Pericles was to retain his power in the city. It is also said that when Simon was being tried for his life, Elpiniki softened the resentment of Pericles, who was one of those appointed to impeach him. When Elpinike came to beg her brother's life of him, he answered with a smile, Elpinike, you are too old to meddle in affairs of this sort. But for all that, he spoke only once, for form's sake, and pressed Simon less than any of his other prosecutors. How, then, can one put any faith in Idomeneus, when he accused Pericles of procuring the assassination of his friend and colleague Ephialtes, because he was jealous of his reputation? This seems an ignoble calumny which Idomeneus has drawn from some obscure source to fling at a man who, no doubt, was not faultless, but of a generous spirit and noble mind, and capable of entertaining so savage and brutal a design. Ephialtes was disliked and feared by the nobles, and was inexorable in punishing those who wronged the people. Wherefore, his enemies had him assassinated by the means of Aristicus of Tanagra. This we are told by Aristotle. Simon died in Cyprus, while in command of the Athenian forces. The nobles now perceived that Pericles was the most important man in the state, and far more powerful than any other citizen. Wherefore, as they still hoped to check his authority, and not allow him to be omnipotent, they set up Thucydides of the township of Alopechai as his rival, a man of good sense and a relative of Simon, but less of a warrior and more of a politician, who, by watching his opportunities and opposing Pericles in debate, soon brought about a balance of power. He did not allow the nobles to mix themselves up with the people and the public assembly, as they had been wont to do, so that their dignity was lost among the masses. But he collected them into a separate body, and by thus concentrating their strength, was able to use it to counterbalance that of the other party. From the beginning, these two factions had been but imperfectly welded together, because their tendencies were different. But now the struggle for power between Pericles and Thucydides drew a sharp line of demarcation between them, and one was called the party of the many, the other that of the few. Pericles now courted the people in every way, constantly arranging public spectacles, festivals, and processions in the city, by which he educated the Athenians to take pleasure in refined amusements. And also he sent out sixty triremes to cruise every year, in which many of the people served for hire for eight months, learning and practicing seamanship. Besides this, he sent a thousand settlers to the Chersonesi, five hundred to Naxos, half as many to Andros, a thousand to dwell among the Thracian tribe of the Bisaltai, and the others to the new colony in Italy founded by the city of Sybaris, which was named Thuri. By this means, he relieved the state of numerous idle agitators, assisted the necessitous, and overawed the allies of Athens by placing his colonists near them to watch their behavior. The building of the temples by which Athens was adorned, the people delighted, and the rest of the world astonished, and which now alone prove that the tales of the ancient power and glory of Greece are no fables, was what particularly excited the spleen of the opposite faction, who inveighed against him in the public assembly, declaring that the Athenians had disgraced themselves by transferring the common treasury of the Greeks from the island of Delos to their own custody. Pericles himself, they urged, has taken away the only possible excuse for such an act, the fear that it might be exposed to the attacks of the Persians when at Delos, whereas it would be safe at Athens. Greece has been outraged and feels itself openly tyrannized over when it sees us using the funds which we exhorted from it for the war against the Persians, for gilding and beautifying our city as if it were a vain woman, and adorning it with precious marbles and statues and temples worth a thousand talents. 
To this, Pericles replied that the allies had no right to consider how their money was spent, so long as Athens defended them from the Persians. While they supplied neither horses, ships, nor men, but merely money, which the Athenians had a right to spend as they pleased, provided they afforded him that security which it purchased, it was right, he argued, that after the city had provided all that was necessary for war, it should devote its surplus money to the erection of buildings which would be a glory to it for all ages, while these works would create plenty by leaving no man unemployed and encouraging all sorts of handicraft, so that nearly the whole city would earn wages and thus derive both its beauty and its profit from itself. For those who were in the flower of their age, military service offered a means of earning money from the common stock. Well, as he did not wish the mechanics and lower classes to be without their share, nor yet to see them receive it without doing work for it, he had laid the foundations of great edifices, which would require industries of every kind to complete them, and he had done this in the interests of the lower classes, who thus, although they remained at home, would have just as good a claim to their share of the public funds as those who were serving at sea, in garrison, or in the field. The different materials used, such as stone, brass, ivory, gold, ebony, cypress wood, and so forth, would require special artisans for each, such as carpenters, modelers, smiths, stonemasons, dyers, melters, and molders of gold, and ivory painters, embroiderers, workers in relief, and also men to bring them to the city, such as sailors and captains of ships and pilots for such as came by sea, and for those who came by land, carriage builders, horse breeders, drivers, rope makers, linen manufacturers, shoe makers, road menders, and miners. Each trade, moreover, employed a number of unskilled laborers, so that, in a word, there would be work for persons of every age and every class, and general prosperity would be the result. These buildings were of immense size and unequaled in beauty and grace, as the workmen endeavor to make the execution surpass the design and beauty. But what was most remarkable was the speed with which they were built, all these edifices, each of which one would have thought it would have taken many generations to complete, were all finished during the most brilliant period of one man's administration. In beauty, each of them at once appeared venerable as soon as it was built, but even at the present day the work looks as fresh as ever, for they bloom with an eternal freshness, which defies time and seems to make the work instinct with an unfading spirit of youth. The overseer and manager of the whole was Phidias, although there were other excellent architects and workmen, such as Callicrates and Ictinus, who built the Parthenon on the side of the old Hecatompedon, which had been destroyed by the Persians, and Coriobus, who built the Temple of Initiation at Eleusis, but who only lived to see the columns erected and the architraves placed upon them. On his death, Metagenes of Xipite added the frieze in the upper row of columns, and Xenocles of Cholargos crowned it with the domed roof over the shrine. As to the long wall, about which Socrates says that he heard Pericles bring forward a motion, Callicrates undertook to build it. The odium, which internally consisted of many rows of seats and many columns, and externally of a roof sloping on all sides from a central point, was said to have been built in imitation of the king of Persia's tent, and was built under Pericles's direction. The Propylaea, before the Acropolis, were finished in five years by Menisocles, the architect, and a miraculous incident during the work seemed to show that the goddess did not disapprove, but rather encouraged and assisted the building. The most energetic and active of the workmen fell from a great height and lay in a dangerous condition given over by his doctors. Pericles grieved much for him, but the goddess appeared to him in a dream, and suggested a course of treatment by which Pericles quickly healed the workmen. In consequence of this, he set up the brazen statue of Athene the healer, near the old altar in the Acropolis. The golden statue of the goddess was made by Phaedias, and his name appears upon the basement in the inscription. Almost everything was in his hands, and he gave his orders to all the workmen, as has been said before, because of his friendship with Pericles. When the speakers of Thucydides' party complained that Pericles had wasted the public money and destroyed the revenue, he asked the people in the assembly whether they thought he had spent much. When they answered, very much indeed, he said in reply, do not then put it down to the public account, but to mine, and I will inscribe my name upon all the public buildings. 
When Pericles said this, the people, either in admiration of his magnificence of manner, or being eager to bear their share in the glory of the new buildings, shouted to him with one accord to take what money he pleased from the treasury and spend it as he pleased, without stint. And finally he underwent the trial of ostracism with Thucydides, and not only succeeded in driving him into exile, but broke up his party. As now there was no opposition to encounter in the city, and all parties had been blended into one, Pericles undertook the sole administration of the home and foreign affairs of Athens, dealing with the public revenue, the army, the navy, the islands, and maritime affairs, and the great sources of strength which Athens derived from her alliances, as well as with Greek as with foreign princes and states. Henceforth he became quite a different man. He no longer gave way to the people, and ceased to watch the breath of the popular favor, but he changed the loose and licentious democracy which had hitherto existed, into a stricter aristocratic, or rather monarchical, form of government. This he used honorably and unswervingly for the public benefit, finding the people, as a rule, willing to second the measures which he explained to them to be necessary, into which he asked their consent, but occasionally having to use violence and to force them much against their will to do what was expedient. Like a physician dealing with some complicated disorder, who at one time allows his patient innocent recreation and at another inflicts upon him sharp pains and bitter though salutary draughts, every possible kind of disorder was to be found among a people possessing so great an empire as the Athenians, and he alone was able to bring them into harmony by playing alternately upon their hopes and fears, checking them when overconfident and raising their spirits when they were cast down and disheartened. Thus, as Plato says, he was able to prove that oratory is the art of influencing men's minds, and to use it in its highest application when it deals with men's passions and characters, which, like certain strings of a musical instrument, require a skillful and delicate touch. The secret of his power is to be found, however, as Thucydides says, not so much in his mere oratory as in his pure and blameless life, because he was so well known to be incorruptible and indifferent to money, for though he made the city, which was a great one, into the greatest and richest city of Greece, and though he himself became more powerful than many independent sovereigns, who were able to leave their kingdoms to their sons, yet Pericles did not increase by one single drachma the estate which he received from his father. For forty years he held the first place among such men as Ephialtes, Leocrates, Meronides, Simon, Tormides and Thucydides, and, after the fall and banishment of Thucydides by ostracism, he united in himself for five and twenty years all the various offices of state, which were supposed to last only for one year, and yet during the whole of that period proved himself incorruptible by bribes. End of section two. Section three of The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 3. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 2. As the Lacedaemonians began to be jealous of the prosperity of the Athenians, Pericles, wishing to raise the spirit of the people, and to make them feel capable of immense operations, passed a decree inviting all the Greeks, whether inhabiting Europe or Asia, whether living in large cities or small ones, to send representatives to a meeting at Athens to deliberate about the restoration of the Greek temples which had been burned by the barbarians, about the sacrifices which were due in consequence of the vows which they had made to the gods on behalf of Greece before before joining the battle, and about the sea that all men might be able to sail upon it in peace and without fear. To carry out this decree, twenty men, selected from the citizens over fifty years of age, were sent out, five of whom invited the Ionian and Dorian Greeks in Asia, and the islands as far as Lesbos and Rhodes, five went to the inhabitants of the Hellespont and Thrace as far as Byzantium, and five more proceeded to Boeotia, Phocis, and Peloponnesus passing from thence through Locris to the neighboring continent as far as, as far as Arcanania in Ambracia, while the remainder journeyed through Euboea to the Oetaeans and the Malayan Gulf and to the Achaeans of Phytia and the Thessalians, 
urging them to join the assembly and take part in the deliberations concerning the peace and well-being of Greece. However, nothing was effected, and the cities never assembled, in consequence it is said of the covert hostility of the Lacedaemonians, and because the attempt was first made in Peloponnesus and failed there. Yet I have inserted an account of it in order to show the lofty spirit and magnificent designs of Pericles. In his campaigns he was chiefly remarkable for caution, for he would not, if he could not help it, begin a battle of which the issue was doubtful, nor did he wish to emulate those generals who have won themselves a great reputation by running risks and trusting to good luck, but he ever used to say to his countrymen that none of them should come by their deaths through any act of his, observing that Tolmides, the son of Tolnaeus, elated by previous successes and by the credit which he had gained as a general, was about to invade Boeotia in a reckless manner, and had persuaded a thousand young men to follow him without any support whatever, he endeavored to stop him, and made that memorable saying in the public assembly that if Tolmides would not take the advice of Pericles, he would at any rate do well to consult that of best advisers, time, this speech had but little success at the time, but when a few days afterward the news came that Tolmides had fallen in action at Coronea, and many noble citizens with him, Pericles was greatly respected and admired as a wise and patriotic man. His most successful campaign was that in the Chersoneasus, which proved the salvation of the Greeks residing there, for he had not only settled a thousand colonists there and thus increased the available force of the cities, but built a continuous line of fortifications reaching across the isthmus from one sea to the other, by which he shut off the Thracians, who had previously ravaged the peninsula, and put an end to a constant and harassing border warfare to which the settlers were exposed, as they had for neighbors tribes of wild plundering barbarians. But that by which he obtained most glory and renown was when he started from Pegai to the Megarian territory, and sailed round the Peloponnesus with a fleet of hundred triremes, for he not only laid waste much of the country near the coast, as Tolmides had previously done, but he proceeded far inland, away from his ships, leading the troops who were on board, and terrified the inhabitants so much that they shut themselves up in their strongholds. The men of Sicyon alone ventured to meet him at Nemea, and them he overthrew it in a pitched battle and erected a trophy. Next he took on board troops from the friendly district of Achaia, and crossing over to the opposite side of the Corinthian Gulf, coasted along past the mouth of the river Achelus, overran Acarnania, drove the people of Oenidae to the shelter of their city walls, and after ravaging the country returned home, having made himself a terror to his enemies, and done good service to Athens. But not the least casualty, even by accident, befell the troops under his command. When he sailed into the Black Sea with a great and splendidly equipped fleet, he assisted the Greek cities there and treated them with consideration, and showed the neighboring savage tribes and their chiefs the greatness of his force and his confidence in his power, by sailing where he pleased and taking complete control over that sea. He left at Sinope thirteen ships and a land force under the command of Lamachus to act against Temesilian, who had made himself despot of that city. When he and his party were driven out, Pericles passed a decree that six hundred Athenian volunteers should sail to Sinope and become citizens there, receiving the houses and lands which had formerly been in the possession of the despot and his party. But in other cases he would not agree to the impulsive proposals of the Athenians, and he opposed them when, elated by their power and good fortune, they talked of recovering Egypt and attacking the seaboard of the Persian Empire. Many, too, were inflamed with that ill-starred notion of an attempt on Sicily, which was afterward blown into a flame by Alcabiades and other orators. Some even dreamed of the conquest of Etruria and Carthage, in consequence of the greatness which the Athenian Empire had already reached and the full tide of success which seemed to attend it. Pericles, however, restrained these outbursts and would not allow the people to meddle with foreign states, but used the power of Athens chiefly to preserve and guard her already existing empire, thinking it to be of paramount importance to oppose the Lacedaemonians, a task to which he bent all his energies, as it proved by many of his acts, especially in connection with the sacred war. And this war the Lacedaemonians sent a force to Delphi, and made the Phocians, who held it, give it up to the people of Delphi, but as soon as they were gone, Pericles made an expedition into the country and restored the temple to the Phocians, and as the Lacedaemonians had scratched the oracle which the Delphians had given them, 
On the forehead of the brazen wolf there, Pericles got a response from the oracle for the Athenians, and carved it on the right side of the same wolf. Events proved that Pericles was right in confining the Athenian empire to Greece. First of all, Euboea revolted, and he was obliged to lead an army to subdue that island. Shortly after this news came that the Megareans had become hostile, and that an army, under the command of Plistoanax, king of the Lacedaemonians, was menacing the frontier of Attica. Pericles, now in all haste, withdrew his troops from Euboea to meet the invader. He did not venture on engagement with the numerous and warlike forces of the enemy, although repeatedly invited by them to fight. But observing that Plistoanax was a very young man, and entirely under the influence of Clenindrides, whom the Ephors had sent to act as his tutor and counselor because of his tender years, he opened secret negotiations with the latter, who at once, for a bribe, agreed to withdraw the Peloponnesians from Attica. When their army returned and dispersed, the Lacedaemonians were so incensed that they imposed a fine on their king and condemned Cleandrides, who fled the country to be put to death. This Cleandrides was the father of Gylippus, who caused the ruin of the Athenian expedition in Sicily. Avarice seems to have been hereditary in the city, for Gylippus himself, after brilliant exploits in war, was convicted of taking bribes and banished from Sparta in disgrace. When Pericles submitted the accounts of the campaign to the people, there was an item of ten talents, for a necessary purpose, which the people passed without any questioning or any curiosity to learn the secret. Some historians, among whom is Theophrastus, the philosopher, say that Pericles sent ten talents annually to Sparta, by means of which he bribed the chief magistrates to defer the war, thus not buying peace, but time to make preparations for a better defense. He immediately turned his attention to the insurgents in Euboea, and proceeded thither with a fleet of fifty sail and five thousand heavy armed troops. He reduced their cities to submission. He banished from Chalcis the equestrian order, as it was called, consisting of men of wealth and station, and he drove all the inhabitants of Hestiaia out of their country, replacing them by Athenian settlers. He treated these people with this pitiless severity because they had captured an Athenian ship and put its crew to the sword. After this, as the Athenians and Lacedaemonians made a truce for thirty years, Pericles decreed the expedition against Samos on the pretext that they had disregarded the commands of the Athenians to cease from their war with the Milicians. Pericles is accused of going to war with Samos to save the Milicians. These states were at war about the possession of the city of Pirene, and the Samians, who were victorious, would not lay down their arms and allow the Athenians to settle the matter by arbitration, as they ordered them to do. For this reason, Pericles proceeded to Samos, put an end to the oligarchical form of government there, and sent fifty hostages and as many children to Lemnos to ensure the good behavior of the leading men. It is said that each of these hostages offered him a talent for his own freedom, and that much more was offered by that party which was loath to see a democracy established in the city. Besides all this, Pesuthenes, the Persian, who had a liking for the Samians, sent and offered him ten thousand pieces of gold if he would spare the city. Pericles, however, took none of these bribes, but dealt with Samos as he had previously determined, and returned to Athens. The Samians now at once revolted as Pesuthenes managed to get them back their hostages and furnished them with the means of carrying on the war. Pericles now made a second expedition against them, and found them in no mind to submit quietly, but determined to dispute the empire of the seas with the Athenians. Pericles gained a signal victory over them in a sea fight off the Goat's Island, beating a fleet of seventy ships with only forty-four, twenty of which were transports. Simultaneously with his victory and the flight of the enemy, he obtained command of the harbor of Samos, and besieged the Samians in their city. They, in spite of their defeat, still possessed courage enough to sally out and fight a battle under the walls, but soon a larger force arrived from Athens, and the Samians were completely blockaded. Pericles, now with sixty ships, sailed out of the archipelago into the Mediterranean, according to the most current report intending to meet the Phoenician fleet which was coming to help the Samians, but according to Hestes and Brotus, with the intent of attacking Cyprus, which seems improbable. Whatever his intention may have been, his expedition was a failure, for Melissus, the son of Iphigenes, a man of culture who was then in command of the Samian forces, conceiving a contempt for the small force of the Athenians and the want of experience of their leaders after Pericles' departure, persuaded his countrymen to attack them. 
and the battle of the Samians proved victorious, taking many Athenians prisoner and destroying many of their ships. By this victory they obtained command of the sea and were able to supply themselves with more warlike stores than they had possessed before. Aristotle even says that Pericles himself was before this beaten by Melissus in a sea fight. The Samians branded the figure of an owl on the foreheads of their Athenian prisoners to revenge themselves for the branding of their own prisoners by the Athenians with the figure of a Samina. This is a ship having a beak turned up like a swine's snout, but with a roomy hull so as both to carry a large cargo and sail fast. This class of vessel was called a Samina because it was first built at Samos by Polocrates, the despot of that island. When Pericles heard of the disaster which had befallen his army, he returned in all haste to assist them. He beat Melissus, who came out to meet him, and after putting the enemy to rout and at once built a wall round their city, preferring to reduce it by blockade to risking the lives of his countrymen in an assault. In the ninth month of the siege, the Samians surrendered. Pericles demolished their walls, confiscated their fleet, and imposed a heavy fine upon them, some part of which was paid at once by the Samians, who gave hostages for the payment of the remainder at fixed periods. Pericles, after the reduction of Samos, returned to Athens, where he buried those who had fallen in the war in a magnificent manner, and was much admired for the funeral oration which, as is customary, was spoken by him over the graves of his countrymen. Ion says that his victory of the Samians wonderfully flattered his vanity. Agamemnon, he was wont to say, took ten years to take a barbarian city, but he in nine months had made himself master of the first and most powerful city in Ionia. And the comparison was not an unjust one, for truly the war was a very great undertaking, and its issue quite uncertain, since, as Thucydides tells us, the Samians came very near to wresting the empire of the sea from the Athenians. After these events, as the clouds were gathering for the Peloponnesian War, Pericles persuaded the Athenians to send assistance to the people of Corsaira, who were at war with the Corinthians, and thus to attach on their own side an island with a powerful naval force, at a moment when the Peloponnesians had all but declared war against them. When the people passed this decree, Pericles sent only ten ships under the command of Lacedaemonius, the son of Simon, as if he designed a deliberate insult, for the house of Simon was on peculiarly friendly terms with the Lacedaemonians. His design in sending Lacedaemonius out, against his will and with so few ships, was that if he performed nothing brilliant he might be accused, even more than he was already, of leaning to the side of the Spartans. Indeed, by all means in his power he always threw obstacles in the way of the advancement of Simon's family, representing that by their very names they were aliens, one son being named Lacedaemonius, another Thessalus, another Elias. Moreover, the mother of all three was an Arcadian. Now Pericles was much reproached for sending these ten ships, which were of little value to the Chorasirians, and gave a great handle to his enemies to use against him, and in consequence sent a larger force after them to Corsaira, which arrived there after the battle. The Corinthians, enraged at this, complained in the Congress of Sparta of the conduct of the Athenians, as did also the Megarinians, who said that they were excluded from every market and every harbor which were in the Athenian hands, contrary to the ancient rights and common privileges of the Hellenic race. The people of Aegina also considered themselves to be oppressed and ill-treated, and secretly bemoaned their grievances in the ears of the Spartans, for they dared not openly bring any charges against the Athenians. At this time, too, Potidaea, a city subject to Athens, but a colony of Corinth, revolted, and its siege materially hastened the outbreak of the war. Archidamus, indeed, the king of the Lacedaemonians, sent ambassadors to Athens, was willing to submit all disputed points to arbitration, and endeavored to moderate the excitement of his allies, so that war probably would not have broken out if the Athenians could have been persuaded to rescind their decree of exclusion against the Megarians, and to come to terms with them. And for this reason, Pericles, who was particularly opposed to this, and urged the people not to give way to the Megarians, alone bore the blame of having begun the war. Pericles passed a decree for a herald to be sent to the Megarians, and then to go on to the Lacedaemonians to complain of their conduct. This decree of Pericles is worded in a candid and reasonable manner, but the herald, Anthemocritus, was thought to have met his death at the hands of the Megarians and Charnus, 
passed a decree to the effect that Athenians should wage war against them to the death, without truce or armistice, that any Megarian found in Attica would be punished with death, and that the generals, when taking the usual oath for each year, should swear in addition that they would invade the Megarian territory twice every year, and that Anthemocritus should be buried near the city gate leading into the Thracian plain, which is now called the Double Gate. How the dispute originated, it is hard to say, but all writers agree in throwing on Pericles the blame of refusing to reverse the decree. Now, as the Lacedaemonians knew that if he could be removed from power, they would find the Athenians much more easy to deal with, they bade them drive forth the accursed thing, alluding to Pericles' descent from the Alcamionidae by his mother's side, as we are told by Thucydides the historian. But this attempt had just the contrary effect to that which they intended, for instead of suspicion and dislike, Pericles met with much greater honor and respect from his countrymen than before, because they saw that he was an object of especial dislike to the enemy. For this reason, before the Peloponnesians under Archidamus invaded Attica, he warned the Athenians that if Archidamus, when he laid waste everything else, spared his own private estate because of the friendly private relations existing between them, or in order to give his personal enemies a ground for impeaching him, he should give both the land and the farm buildings upon it to the state. The Lacedaemonians invaded Attica with a great host of their own troops, and those of their allies, led by Archidamus, their king. They proceeded, ravaging the country as they went as far as Acarnae, close to Athens, where they encamped, imagining that the Athenians would never endure to see them there, but would be driven by pride and shame to come out and fight them. However, Pericles thought that it would be a very serious matter to fight for the very existence of Athens against 60,000 Peloponnesian and Boeotian heavy-armed troops, and so he pacified those who were dissatisfied at his inactivity by pointing out that trees, when cut down, quickly grow again, but that when the men of a state are lost, it is hard to raise up others to take their place. He would not call an assembly of the people because he feared that they would force him to act against his better judgment. But just as the captain of a ship, when a storm comes on at sea, places everything in the best trim to meet it, and trusting to his own skill and seamanship, disregarding the tears and entreaties of the seasick and terrified passengers, so did Pericles shut the gates of Athens, place sufficient forces to ensure the safety of the city at all points, and calmly carry out his policy, taking little heed of the noisy grumblings of the discontented. Many of his friends besought him to attack, many of his enemies threatened him and abused him, and many songs and offensive jests were written about him, speaking of him as a coward, and one who was betraying the city to his enemies. Cleon, too, attacked him, using the anger which the citizens felt against him to advance his own personal popularity. Pericles was unmoved by any of these attacks, but quietly endured all this storm of obloquy. He sent a fleet of a hundred ships to attack Peloponnesus, but did not sail with it himself, remaining at home to keep a tight hand over Athens until the Peloponnesians drew off their forces. He regained his popularity with the common people, who suffered much from the war, by giving them allowances of money from the public revenue and grants of land, for he drove out the entire population of the island of Agina and divided the land by lot among the Athenians. A certain amount of relief also was experienced by reflecting upon the injuries which they were inflicting on the enemy, for the fleet as it sailed round Peloponnesus destroyed many small villages and cities, and ravaged a great extent of country, while Pericles himself led an expedition into the territory of Megara and laid it all waste. By this it is clear that the allies, although they did much damage to the Athenians, yet suffered equally themselves, and never could have protracted the war for such a length of time as it really lasted, but as Pericles foretold, must soon have desisted had not providence interfered and confounded human counsels. For now the pestilence fell among the Athenians and cut off the flower of their youth. Suffering both in body and mind, they raved against Pericles, just as people when delirious with disease attacked their fathers or their physicians. They endeavored to ruin him, urged on his personal enemies, who assured them that he was the author of the plague, because he had brought all the country people into the city, where they were compelled to live during the heat of the summer, crowded together in small rooms and stifling tents, living an idle life too, and breathing foul air instead of the pure country breeze to which they were accustomed. The cause of this, they said, was the man who, when the war began, admitted the masses of the country people into the city, and then made no use of them, but allowed them to be penned up together like cattle, and transmit the contagion from one to another, without devising any remedy or alleviation of their sufferings. 
Hoping to relieve them somewhat and also to annoy the enemy, Pericles manned a hundred and fifty ships, placed on board, besides the sailors, many brave infantry and cavalry soldiers, and was about to put to sea. The Athenians conceived great hopes, and the enemy no less terror from so large an armament. When all was ready, and Pericles himself had just embarked in his own trireme, an eclipse of the sun took place producing total darkness, and all men were terrified at so great a portent. Pericles sailed with the fleet, but did nothing worthy of so great a force. He besieged the sacred city of Epidaurus, but, although he had great hopes of taking it, he failed on account of the plague, which destroyed not only his own men, but every one who came in contact with them. After this, he again endeavored to encourage the Athenians, to whom he had become an object of dislike. However, he did not succeed in pacifying them, but they condemned him by a public vote to be general no more, and to pay a fine which is stated at the lowest estimate to have been fifteen talents, and at the highest, fifty. This was carried, according to Idomeneus, by Cleon, but according to Theophrastus, by Simeas, while Heraclides of Pontus says that it was effected by Lacertides. He soon regained his public position, for the people's outburst of anger was quenched by the blow they had dealt him, just as a bee leaves its sting in the wound. But his private affairs were in great distress and disorder, as he had lost many of his relatives during the plague, while others were estranged from him on political grounds. Yet he would not yield nor abate his firmness and constancy of spirit because of these afflictions, but was not observed to weep or to moan, or to attend the funeral of any of his relations until he lost Paralus, the last of his legitimate offspring. Crushed by this blow, he tried in vain to keep up his grand air of indifference, and when carrying a garland to lay upon the corpse, he was overwhelmed by his feelings, so as to burst into a passion of tears and sobs, which he had never done before in his whole life. Athens made trial of her other generals and public men to conduct her affairs, but none appeared to be of sufficient weight or reputation to have such a charge entrusted to him. The city longed for Pericles and invited him again to lead its councils and direct its armies, and he, although dejected in spirits and living in seclusion in his own house, was yet persuaded by Alcibiades and his other friends to resume the direction of affairs. After this, it appears that Pericles was attacked by the plague, not acutely or continuously as in most cases, but in a slow, wasting fashion, exhibiting many varieties of symptoms and gradually undermining his strength. As he was now on his deathbed, the most distinguished of the citizens and his surviving friends collected round him and spoke admiringly of his nobleness and immense power, enumerating also the number of his exploits and the trophies which he had set up for victories gained. For while in chief command, he had won no less than nine victories for Athens. Events soon made the loss of Pericles felt and regretted by the Athenians. Those who during his lifetime had complained that his power completely threw them into the shade, when after his death they made trial for other orators and statesmen, were obliged to confess that with all his arrogance no man ever was really more moderate, and that his real mildness in dealing with people was as remarkable as his apparent pride and assumption. His power, which had been so grudged and envied and called monarchy and despotism, now was proved to have been the saving of the state. Such an amount of corrupt dealing and wickedness suddenly broke out in public affairs, which he before had crushed and forced to hide itself, and so prevented its becoming incurable through impunity and license. End of section 3《Section 4 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Great Plague at Athens, B.C. 430. Almost at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, when the prosperity of Athens had placed her at the height of her power and given her unquestioned supremacy among the Grecian states, her strength was greatly impaired by a visitation against which there was nothing in military prowess or patriotic pride and devotion that could prevail. It is one of the tragic contrasts of history, the picture of Athens in her full triumph and glory, smitten at a moment when she needed to put forth her full strength, by a deadly foe against whose might mortal arms were vain. Her citizens were rejoicing in her social, no less than her military preeminence, and they had already been trained in the hardships necessary to have endured in defense of an invaded country. 
Again, they were prepared to undergo whatever service might be laid upon them in her behalf. They could foresee the arduous tasks and inevitable sufferings of a great war, but had no warning of an impending calamity far worse than those which even war, though always attended with horrors, usually entails. Pericles had lately delivered his great funeral oration at the public internment of soldiers who had fallen for Athens. The bright colors and tone of cheerful confidence, says Grote, whose account of the plague follows, which pervaded the discourse of Pericles, appear the more striking for being an immediate antecedent to the awful description of this distemper. The death of Pericles himself, who directly or indirectly fell a victim to the prevailing pestilence, marked a grievous crisis for Athens in what was already become a measureless public woe. During the autumn of the year B.C. 427, the epidemic again broke out, after a considerable intermission, and for one year continued, to the sad ruin both of the strength and the comfort of the city. At the close of one year after the attempted surprise of Plataea by the Thebans, the belligerent parties in Greece remained in an unaltered position as to relative strength. Nothing decisive had been accomplished on either side, either by the invasion of Attica or by the flying descents round the coast of Peloponnesus. In spite of mutual damage inflicted, doubtless in the greatest measure upon Attica, no progress was yet made toward the fulfillment of those objects which had induced the Peloponnesians to go to war. Especially the most pressing among all their wishes, the relief of Potidaea, was in no way advanced, for the Athenians had not found it necessary to relax the blockade of that city. The result of the first year's operations had thus been to disappoint the hopes of the Corinthians and the other ardent instigators of war, while it justified the anticipations both of Pericles and of Archidamus. A second devastation of Attica was resolved upon for the commencement of spring, and measures were taken for carrying it all over that territory, since the settled policy of Athens, not to hazard a battle with the invaders, was now ascertained. About the end of March, or beginning of April, the entire Peloponnesian force, two-thirds from each confederate city as before, was assembled under the command of Archidamus and marched into Attica. This time they carried the work of systematic destruction not merely over the Thriasian plain and the plain immediately near to Athens as before, but also to the more southerly portions of Attica, down even as far as the mines of Laurium. They traversed and ravaged both the eastern and western coast, remaining not less than forty days in the country. They found the territory deserted as before, all the population having retired within the walls. In regard to the second invasion, Pericles recommended the same defensive policy as he had applied to the first, and apparently the citizens had now come to acquiesce in it, if not willingly, at least with a full conviction of its necessity. But a new visitation had now occurred, diverting their attention from the invader, though enormously aggravating their sufferings. A few days after Archidamus entered Attica, a pestilence or epidemic sickness broke out unexpectedly at Athens. It appears that this terrific disorder had been raging for some time throughout the region round the Mediterranean, having begun, as was believed, in Ethiopia, thence passing into Egypt and Libya, and overrunning a considerable portion of Asia under the Persian government. About sixteen years before, there had been a similar calamity in Rome and in various parts of Italy. Recently had been felt in Lemnos and some other islands of the Aegean yet seemingly not with such intensity as to excite much notice generally in the Grecian world. At length it passed to Athens and first showed itself in the Piraeus. The progress of the disease was as rapid and destructive as its appearance had been sudden. While the extraordinary accumulation of people within the city and long walls, in consequence of the presence of the invaders in the country, was but too favorable to every form of contagion, families crowded together in close cabins in places of temporary shelter, throughout a city constructed like most of those in greece with little regard to the conditions of salubrity and in a state of mental chagrin from the forced abandonment and sacrifice of their properties in the country transmitted the disorder with fatal facility from one to the other beginning as it did about the middle of april the increasing heat of summer further aided the disorder the symptoms of which alike violent and sudden made themselves the more remarked because the year was particularly exempt from maladies of every other description of this plague, or more properly, eruptive typhoid fever, distinctive from, yet analogous to, the smallpox, a description no less clear than impressive has been left by the historian Thucydides himself, not only a spectator, but a sufferer. It is not one of the least of his merits that his notice of the symptoms given at so early a stage of medical science and observation, 
is such as to instruct the medical reader of the present age, and to enable the malady to be understood and identified. The observations with which that notice is ushered in deserve particular attention. In respect to this distemper, he says, let every man, physician or not, say what he thinks respecting the source from whence it may probably have arisen, and respecting the causes which he deems sufficiently powerful to have produced so great a revolution. But I, having myself had the distemper and having seen others suffering under it, will state what it actually was, and will indicate in addition such other matters as will furnish any man who lays them to heart with knowledge and the means of calculation beforehand in case of the same misfortune should ever occur again. To record past facts as a basis for rational provision in regard to the future, the same sentiment which Thucydides mentions in his preface, as having animated him to the composition of his history, was at that time a duty so little understood that we have reason to admire not less the manner in which he performs it in practice than the distinctness with which he conceives it in theory. We infer from his language that speculation in his day was active respecting the causes of this plague according to the vague and fanciful physics and scanty stock of ascertained facts, which was all that could then be consulted. By resisting the itch of theorizing from one of these loose hypotheses, which then appeared plausibly to explain everything, he probably renounced the point of view from which most credit and interest would be derivable at the time, but his simple and precise summary of observed facts carries with it an imperishable value, and even affords grounds for imagining that he was no stranger to the habits and training of his contemporary Hippocrates and the other Asclepiads of Cos. It is hardly within the province of a historian of Greece to repeat after Thucydides the painful enumeration of symptoms, violent in the extreme and pervading every portion of the bodily system, which marked this fearful disorder. Beginning in Piraeus, it quickly passed into the city, and both the one and the other was speedily filled with sickness and suffering, the like of which had never before been known. The seizures were sudden, and a large proportion of the sufferers perished after deplorable agonies on the seventh or on the ninth day. Others, whose strength of constitution carried them over this period, found themselves the victims of exhausting and incurable diarrhea afterward. With others, again, after traversing both these stages, the distemper fixed itself in some particular member, the eyes, the genitals, the hands, or the feet, which were rendered permanently useless, or in some cases amputated, even where the patient himself recovered. There were also some whose recovery was attended with a total loss of memory, so that they no more knew themselves or recognized their friends, no treatment or remedy appearing except in accidental cases, to produce any beneficial effect, the physicians or surgeon whose aid was invoked became completely at fault. While trying their accustomed means without avail, they soon ended by catching the malady themselves and perishing. The charms and incantations to which the unhappy patient resorted were not likely to be more efficacious. While some asserted that the Peloponnesians had poisoned the cisterns of water, others referred the visitation to the wrath of the gods, and especially to Apollo, known by hearers of the Iliad as author of pestilence in the Greek host before Troy. It was remembered that this Delphian god had promised the Lacedaemonians, in reply to their application immediately before the war, that he would assist them whether invoked or uninvoked, and the disorder now raging was ascribed to the intervention of their irresistible ally, while the elderly men further called to mind an oracular voice sung in the time of their youth. The Dorian War will come, and pestilence along with it. Under the distress which suggested and was reciprocally aggravated by these gloomy ideas, prophets were consulted, and supplications with solemn procession were held at the temples to appease the divine wrath. When it was found that neither the priest nor the physician could retard the spread or mitigate the intensity of the disorder, Athenians abandoned themselves to despair, and the space within the walls became a scene of desolating misery. Every man attacked with the malady at once lost his courage, a state of depression itself among the worst features of the case, which made him lie down and die without any attempt to seek for preservatives. And although at first friends and relatives lent their aid to tend the sick with the usual family sympathies, yet so terrible was the number of these attendants who perished, like sheep, from such contact, that at length no man would thus expose himself, while the most generous spirits who persisted longest in the discharge of their duty were carried off in the greatest numbers. 
the patient was thus left to die alone and unheeded. Sometimes all the inmates of a house were swept away one after the other, no man being willing to go near it. Desertion on the one hand, attendance on the other, both tended to aggravate the calamity. There remained only those who, having had the disorder and recovered, were willing to tend the sufferers. These men formed the single exception to the all-pervading misery of the time, for the disorder seldom attacked anyone twice, and when it did, the second attack was never fatal. Elate with their own escape, they deemed themselves out of the reach of all disease, and were full of compassionate kindness for those whose sufferings were just beginning. It was from them, too, that the principal attention to the bodies of deceased victims proceeded, for such was the state of dismay and sorrow that even the nearest relatives neglected the sepulchral duties, sacred beyond all others in the eyes of a Greek. Nor is there any circumstance which conveys to us so vivid an idea of the prevalent agony and despair as when we read, in the words of an eyewitness, that the deaths took place among this close-packed crowd without the smallest decencies of attention, that the dead and dying lay piled upon one another, not merely in the public roads, but even in the temples, in spite of the understood defilement of the sacred building, that half-dead sufferers were seen lying round all the springs from insupportable thirst, that the numerous corpses thus unburied and exposed were in such a condition that the dogs which meddled with them died in consequence, while no vultures or other birds of the like habits ever came near. Those bodies which escaped entire neglect were burnt or buried without the customary mourning, and with unseemly carelessness, in some cases, the bearers of a body, passing by a funeral pyre on which another body was burning, would put their own there to be burnt also, or perhaps if the pile was prepared ready for a body not yet arrived, would deposit their own upon it, set fire to the pile, and then depart. Such indecent confusion would have been intolerable to the feelings of the Athenians in any ordinary time. To all these scenes of physical suffering, death, and reckless despair was superadded another evil, which affected those who were fortunate enough to escape the rest. The bonds both of law and morality became relaxed amid such total uncertainty of every man both for his own life and that of others. Men cared not to abstain themselves from wrong, under circumstances in which punishment was not likely to overtake them, nor to put a check upon their passions, and endure privations in obedience even to their strongest conviction. When the chance was so small of their living to reap reward or enjoy any future esteem, an interval, short and sweet, before their doom was realized, before they became plunged in the widespread misery which they witnessed around and which affected indiscriminately the virtuous and the profligate, was all that they looked to enjoy, embracing with avidity the immediate pleasures of sense, as well as such positive gains, however ill-gotten, as could be made the means of procuring them and throwing aside all thought both of honor and of long-sighted advantage. Life and property being alike ephemeral, there was no hope left but to snatch a moment of enjoyment before the outstretched hand of destiny should fall upon its victims. The picture of a society under the pressure of a murderous epidemic, with its train of physical torments, wretchedness, and demoralization, has been drawn by more than one eminent author, but by none with more impressive fidelity and conciseness than by Thucydides, who had no predecessor, nor anything but the reality to copy from. We may remark that amid all the melancholy accompaniments of the time, there are no human sacrifices, such as those offered up at Carthage during pestilence to appease the anger of the gods. There are no cruel persecutions against imaginary authors of the disease, such as those against the Unturi, anointers of doors, in the plague of Milan in 1630. Three years altogether did this calamity desolate Athens continuously during the entire second and third years of the war, after which followed a period of marked abatement for a year and a half, but it then revived again and lasted for another year with the same fury as at first. The public loss over and above the private misery which this unexpected enemy inflicted upon Athens was incalculable. Out of 1,200 horsemen, all among the rich men of the state, 300 died of the epidemic, besides 4,400 hoplites out of the roll formerly kept, and a number of the poorer population so great as to defy computation. No efforts of the Peloponnesians could have done so much to ruin Athens, or to bring the war to a termination such as they desired, 
and the distemper told the more in their favor, as it never spread at all into Peloponnesus, though it passed from Athens to some of the more populous islands. The Lacedaemonian army was withdrawn from Attica somewhat earlier than it would have otherwise been, for fear of taking the contagion. But it was while the Lacedaemonians were yet in Attica, and during the first freshness of the terrible malady, that Pericles equipped and conducted from Piraeus an armament of 100 triremes and 4,000 hoplites to attack the coasts of Peloponnesus. 300 horsemen were also carried in some horse transports, prepared for the occasion out of old triremes. To diminish the crowd accumulated in the city was doubtless a beneficial tendency, and perhaps those who went aboard might consider it as a chance of escape to quit an infected home. But unhappily they carried the infection along with them, which desolated the fleet not less than the city, and crippled all its efforts. Reinforced by fifty ships of war from Chios and Lesbos, the Athenians first landed near Epidaurus in Peloponnesus, ravaging the territory and making an unavailing attempt upon the city. Next they made like incursions on the most southerly portions of the Argolic Peninsula, Troizen, Haliasus, and Hermione and lastly attacked and captured Prasiae on the eastern coast of Laconia. On returning to Athens, the same armament was immediately conducted under Agnon and Cleopompus to press the siege of Patadaia, the blockade of which still continued without any visible progress. On arriving there, an attack was made on the walls by battering engines and by the other aggressive methods then practiced. But nothing whatever was achieved. In fact, the armament became incompetent for all serious effort, for the aggravated character which the distemper here assumed, communicated by the soldiers fresh from Athens, even to those who had before been free from it at Potidaea. So frightful was the mortality that out of the 40,000 hoplites under Agnon, no fewer than 1,050 died in the short space of 40 days. The armament was brought back in this distressed condition to Athens, while the reduction of Potidaea was left as before to the slow course of blockade. On returning from the expedition against Peloponnesus, Pericles found his countrymen almost distracted with their manifold sufferings. Over and above the raging epidemic, they had just gone over Attica and ascertained the devastations committed by the invaders throughout all the territory except the Marathonian Tetropolis and Decliclea, districts spared, as we are told, through indulgence founded on an ancient legendary sympathy, during their long stay of forty days. The rich had found their comfortable mansions and farms, the poor their modest cottages and the various deems, torn down and ruined. Death, sickness, loss of property, and despair of the future now rendered the Athenians angry and intractable to the last degree. They vented their feelings against Pericles as the cause not merely of the war, but also of all that they were now enduring. Either with or without his consent, they sent envoys to Sparta to open negotiations for peace, but the Spartans turned a deaf ear to the proposition. This new disappointment rendered them still more furious against Pericles, whose long-standing political enemies now doubtless found strong sympathy in their denunciations of his character and policy. That unshaken and majestic firmness, which ranked first among his many eminent qualities, was never more imperiously required and never more effectively manifested. In his capacity of strategus, or general, Pericles convoked a formal assembly of the people for the purpose of vindicating himself publicly against the prevailing sentiment and recommending perseverance in his line of policy. The speeches made by his opponents, assuredly very bitter, are not given by Thucydides, but that of Pericles himself is set down at considerable length, and a memorable discourse it is. It strikingly brings into relief both the character of the man and the impress of actual circumstances, an impregnable mind conscious not only of right purposes, but of just and reasonable anticipations, and bearing up with manliness, or even defiance, against the natural difficulty of the case, heightened by an extreme of incalculable misfortune. He had foreseen, while advising the war originally, the probable impatience of his countrymen under its first hardships, but he could not foresee the epidemic by which that impatience had been exasperated into madness, and he now addressed them not merely with unabated adherence to his own deliberate convictions, but also in a tone of reproachful remonstrance against their unmerited case of sentiment toward him, seeking at the same time to combat that uncontrolled despair which for the moment overlaid both their pride and their patriotism. 
far from humbling himself before the present sentiment it is at this time that he sets forth his titles to their esteem in the most direct and unqualified manner and claims the continuance of that which they had so long accorded as something belonging to him by acquired right his main object through this discourse is to fill the minds of his audience with patriotic sympathy for the weal of the entire city so as to counterbalance the absorbing sense of private woe if the collective city flourishes he argues private misfortunes may at least be borne but no amount of private prosperity will avail if the collective city falls a proposition literally true in ancient times and under the circumstances of ancient warfare though less true at present distracted by domestic calamity ye are now angry both with me who advised you to go to war and with yourselves who followed the advice ye listen to me considering me superior to others in judgment and speech and patriotism and incorruptible probity nor ought i now to be treated as culpable for giving such advice when in point of fact the war was unavoidable and there would have been still greater danger in shrinking from it i am the same man still unchanged but ye and your misfortunes cannot stand to the convictions which ye adopted when yet unhurt extreme and unforeseen indeed are the sorrows which have fallen upon you yet inhabiting as ye do a great city and brought up in dispositions suitable to it ye must also resolve to bear up against the utmost pressure of adversity and never to surrender your dignity i have often explained to you that ye have no reason to doubt of eventual success in the war but i will now remind you more emphatically than before and even with a degree of ostentation suitable as a stimulus to your present unnatural depression that your naval force makes you masters not only of your allies but of the entire sea one half of the visible field for action and employment compared with so vast a power as this the temporary use of your houses and territory is a mere trifle an ornamental accessory not worth considering and this, too, if ye preserve your freedom, ye will quickly recover. It was your fathers who first gained this empire, without any of the advantages which ye now enjoy. Ye must not disgrace yourselves by losing what they acquired. Delighting as ye all do in the honor and empire enjoyed by the city, ye must not shrink from the toils whereby alone that honor is sustained. Moreover, ye now fight not merely for freedom instead of slavery, but for empire against loss of empire with all the perils arising out of imperial unpopularity it is not safe for you now to abdicate even if ye choose to do so for ye hold your empire like a despotism unjust perhaps in the original acquisition but ruinous to part with when once acquired be not angry with me whose advice ye followed in going to war because the enemy have done such damage as might be expected from them still less on account of this unforeseen distemper I know that this makes me an object of your special present hatred, though very unjustly, unless ye will consent to give me credit also for any unexpected good luck which may occur. Our city derives its particular glory from unshaken bearing up against misfortune. Her power, her name, her empire of Greeks over Greeks, are such as have never before been seen, and if we choose to be great, we must take the consequence of that temporary envy and hatred which is the necessary price of permanent renown behave ye now in a manner worthy of that glory display that courage which is essential to protect you against disgrace at present as well as to guarantee your honour for the future send no further embassy to sparta and bear your misfortunes without showing symptoms of distress the irresistible reason as well as the proud and resolute bearing of this discourse set forth with an eloquence which was not possible for thucydides to reproduce together with the age and character of pericles carried the assent of the assembled people who went in the pnyx and engaged according to the habit on public matters would for a moment forget their private sufferings in considerations of the safety and grandeur of athens possibly indeed those suffering though still continuing might become somewhat alleviated when the invaders quitted attica and when it was no longer indispensable for all the population to confine itself within the walls accordingly the assembly resolved that no further propositions should be made for peace and that the war should be prosecuted with vigour but though the public resolution thus adopted shows the ancient habit of deference to the authority of pericles the sentiments of individuals taken separately were still those of anger against him as the author of that system which had brought them into so much distress his political opponents cleon simus or lacratidas perhaps all three in conjunction 
took care to provide an opportunity for this prevalent irritation to manifest itself in act by bringing an accusation against him before the dicastery. The accusation is said to have been preferred on the ground of pecuniary malversation and ended by his being sentenced to pay a considerable fine, the amount of which is differently reported, 15, 50, or 80 talents by different authors. The accusing party thus appeared to have carried their point, and to have disgraced as well as excluded from re-election the veteran statesman. The event, however, disappointed their expectations. The imposition of the fine not only satiated all the irritation of the people against him, but even occasioned a serious reaction in his favor, and brought back as strongly as ever the ancient sentiment of esteem and admiration. It was quickly found that those who had succeeded Pericles' generals neither possessed nor deserved in any equal degree the public confidence. He was accordingly soon re-elected with as much power and influence as he had ever in his life enjoyed. But that life, long, honorable, and useful, had already been prolonged considerably beyond the sixtieth year, and there were but too many circumstances, besides the recent fine, which tended to hasten as well as to embitter its close. At the very moment when Pericles was preaching to his countrymen in a tone almost reproachful, the necessity of manful and unabated devotion to the common country in the midst of private suffering, he was himself among the greatest of sufferers, and most hardly pressed to set the example of observing his own precepts. The epidemic carried off not merely his two sons, the only two legitimate, Xanthippus and Perilus, but also his sister, several other relatives, and his best and most useful political friends. Amid this train of domestic calamities, and in the funeral obsequies of so many of his dearest friends, he remained master of his grief, and maintain his habitual self-command until the last misfortune, the death of his favorite son, Perilous, which left his house without any legitimate representative to maintain the family and the hereditary sacred rights. On this final blow, though he strove to command himself as before, yet at the obsequies of the young man, when it became his duty to place a wreath on the dead body, his grief became uncontrollable, and he burst out for the first time in his life into profuse tears and sobbing, in the midst of these several personal trials, he received the intimation, through Alcibiades and some other friends, of the restored confidence of the people toward him and of his re-election to the office of Strategus. But it was not without difficulty that he was persuaded to present himself again at the public assembly and resume the direction of affairs. The regret of the people was formally expressed to him for the recent sentence. Perhaps, indeed, the fine may have been repaid to him, or some evasion of it permitted saving the forms of law, and the present temper of the city, which was further displayed toward him by the grant of a remarkable exemption from the law of his own original proposition. He had himself, some years before, been the author of that law whereby citizenship of Athens was restricted to persons born both of Athenian fathers and Athenian mothers, under which restriction several thousand persons, illegitimate on the mother's side, are said to have been deprived of the citizenship on occasion of a public distribution of corn. Invidious as it appeared to grant, to Pericles singly, an exemption from a law which had been strictly enforced against so many others, the people were now moved not less by compassion than by anxiety to redress their own previous severity. Without a legitimate heir, the house of Pericles, one branch of the great Alcimonid gens by his mother's side, would be left deserted, and the continuity of the family's sacred rights would be broken, a misfortune painfully felt by every Athenian family, as calculated to wrong all the deceased members and provoke their posthumous displeasure toward the city. Accordingly, permission was granted to Pericles to legitimize and to inscribe in his own gens and fatri his natural son by Aspasia, who bore his own name. It was thus that Pericles was reinstated in his post of strategus as well as in his ascendancy over the public councils, seemingly about August or September B.C. 430. He lived about one year longer and seems to have maintained his influence as long as his health permitted. Yet we hear nothing of him after this moment, and he fell a victim, not to the violent symptoms of the epidemic, but to a slow and wearing fever, which undermined his strength as well as his capacity. To a friend who came to ask after him when in this disease, Pericles replied by showing a charm or amulet which his female relations had hung about his neck, a proof how low he was reduced, and how completely he had become a passive subject in the hands of others. And according to another anecdote which we read, yet more interesting and equally illustrative of his character, 
It was during his last moments, when he was lying apparently unconscious and insensible, that the friends around his bed were passing in review the acts of his life, and the nine trophies which he had erected at different times for so many victories. He heard what they said, though they fancied that he was past hearing, and interrupted them by remarking, "'What you praise in my life belongs partly to good fortune, and is, at best, common to me with many other generals. But the peculiarity of which I am most proud, you have not noticed. No Athenian has ever put on mourning through any action of mine.'" End of section 4. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Section 5 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez, June 2019. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Athenians at Syracuse, B.C. 413. By Sir Edward S. Creasy. Part 1. That great writer of the history of the Romans, Thomas Arnold, says of the defeat of Athenian fleet at Syracuse, the Romans knew not and could not know how deeply the greatness of their own posterity and the fate of the whole Western world were involved in the destruction of the fleet of Athens in the harbor of Syracuse. Had that great expedition proved victorious, the energies of Greece during the next eventful century would have found their field in the West no less than in the East. Greece, and not Rome, might have conquered Carthage. Greek instead of Latin might have been at this day the principal element of the language of Spain, of France, and of Italy. And the laws of Athens, rather than of Rome, might be the foundation of the law of the civilized world. The foregoing, the author's own selection, really sums up all that needs be said as to the importance of the great event so finely treated by Creasy. Few cities have undergone more memorable sieges during ancient and medieval times than has the city of Syracuse. Athenian, Carthaginian, Roman, Vandal, Byzantine, Saracen, and Norman have in turns beleaguered her walls, and the resistance which she successfully opposed to some of her early assailants was of the deepest importance, not only to the fortunes of the generations then in being, but to all the subsequent current of human events. To adopt the eloquent expressions of Arnold respecting the check which she gave to the Carthaginian arms. Syracuse was a breakwater which God's providence raised up to protect the yet immature strength of Rome. In her triumphant repulse of the great Athenian expedition against her was of even more widespread and enduring importance. It forms a decisive epoch in the strife for universal empire in which all the great states of antiquity successfully engaged and failed. The present city of Syracuse is a place of little or no military strength, as the fire of artillery from the neighboring heights would almost completely command it. But in ancient warfare its position and the care bestowed on its walls rendered it formidably strong against the means of offense which were employed by besieging armies. The ancient city, in its most prosperous times, was chiefly built on the knob of land which projects into the sea on the eastern coast of Sicily, between two bays. 
one of which to the north was called the Bay of Thapsus, while the southern one formed the great harbor of the city of Syracuse itself, a small island or peninsula, for such it soon was rendered lies at the southeastern extremity of this knob of land, stretching almost entirely across the mouth of the great harbor, and rendering it nearly landlocked. This island comprised the original settlement of the first Greek colonists from Corinth, who founded Syracuse 2,500 years ago, and the modern city has shrunk again into these primary limits. But in the 5th century before our era, the growing wealth and population of the Syracusans had led them to occupy and include within their city walls portion after portion of the mainland, lying next to the little isle, so that at the time of the Athenian expedition, the seaward part of the land between the two bays already spoken of was built over and fortified from bay to bay, and constituted the larger part of Syracuse. The landward wall, therefore, of this district of the city, traversed this knob of land which continues to slope upward from the sea, and which, to the west of the old fortifications, that is, toward the interior of Sicily, rises rapidly for a mile or two, but diminishes in width and finally terminates in a long narrow ridge between which and Mount Hibla a succession of chasms and uneven low ground extends. On each flank of this ridge the descent is steep and precipitous, from its summits to the strips of level land that lie immediately below it, both to the southwest and northwest. The usual mode of assailing fortified towns in the time of the Peloponnesian War was to build a double wall round them sufficiently strong to check any sally of the garrison from within or any attack of a relieving force from without. The interval within the two walls of the circumvallation was roofed over and formed barracks in which the besiegers posted themselves and awaited the effects of wanton treachery among the besieged in producing a surrender. And in every Greek city of those days, as in every Italian Republic of the Middle Ages, the rage of domestic sedition between aristocrats and democrats ran high. Rancorous refugees swarmed in the camp of every invading enemy, and every blockaded city was sure to contain within its walls a body of intriguing malcontents who were eager to purchase a party triumph at the expense of a national disaster. Famine and faction were the allies on whom besiegers relied. The generals of that time trusted to the operation of these sure confederates as soon as they could establish a complete blockade. They rarely ventured on the attempt to storm any fortified post, for the military engines of antiquity were feeble in breaching masonry, which the first Dionysius effected in the mechanics of destruction, and the lives of spearmen, the boldest and most high-trained would, of course, have been idly spent in charges against unshattered walls. The city built close to the sea, like Syracuse, was impregnable, save by the combined operations of a superior hostile fleet and a superior hostile army. And Syracuse, from her size, her population and her military and naval resources, not unnaturally thought herself secure from finding in another Greek city a foe capable of sending a sufficient armament to menace her with capture and subjection. But in the spring of B.C. 414, the Athenian navy was mistress of her harbor and the adjacent seas. An Athenian army had defeated her troops and cooped them within the town. And from bay to bay, 
a blockading wall was being rapidly carried across the strips of level ground and the high ridge outside the city, then termed Epipole, which, if completed, would have cut the Syracusans off from all succor from the interior of Sicily and have left them at the mercy of the Athenian generals. The besiegers' work were indeed unfinished, but every day the unfortified interval in their lines grew narrower, and with it diminished all apparent hope of safety for the beleaguered town. Athens was now staking the flower of her forces and the accumulated fruits of seventy years of glory on one bold throw for the dominion of the Western world. As Napoleon from Mont Coeur de Lyon pointed to Saint Jean d'Acre and told his staff that the capture of that town would decide his destiny and would change the face of the world. So the Athenian officers from the heights of Epistole must have looked on Syracuse and felt that with its fall all the known powers of the earth would fall beneath them. They must have felt also that Athens, if repulsed there, must pause forever from her career of conquest and sink from an imperial republic into a ruined and subservient community. At Marathon, the first in date of the great battles of the world, we beheld Athens struggling for self-preservation against the invading armies of the East. At Syracuse, she appears as the ambitious and oppressive invader of others. In her, as in other republics of old and of modern times, the same energy that had inspired the most heroic efforts in defense of the national independence soon learned to employ itself in daring and unscrupulous schemes of self-aggrandizement at the expense of neighboring nations. In the interval between the Persian and the Peloponnesian wars, she had rapidly grown into a conquering and dominant state, the chief of a thousand tributary cities and the mistress of the largest and best manned navy that the Mediterranean had yet beheld. The occupation of her territory by Xerxes and Mardonius in the Second Persian War had forced their whole population to become marines, and the glorious results of that struggle confirmed them in their zeal for their country's service at sea. The voluntary suffrage of the Greek cities of the coasts and islands of the Aegean first placed Athens at the head of the confederation, formed for the further prosecution of the war against Persia. But this titular ascendancy was soon converted by her into practical and arbitrary dominion. She protected them from piracy and the Persian power, which soon fell into decrepitude and decay. But she exacted in return implicit obedience to herself. She claimed and enforced a prerogative of taxing them at her discretion and proudly refused to be accountable for her mode of expanding their supplies. Remonstrance against her assessments was treated as factious disloyalty and refusal to pay was promptly punished as revolt permitting and encouraging her subject allies to furnish all their contingents in money, instead of part consisting of ships and men, the sovereign republic gained the double object of training her own citizens by a constant and well-paid service in her fleets, and of seeing her confederates lose their skill and discipline by inaction and become more and more passive and powerless under her yoke. Their towns were generally dismantled, while the imperial city herself was fortified with the greatest care and sumptuousness, the accumulated revenues from her tributaries serving to strengthen and adorn to the utmost 
her havens, her docks, her arsenals, her theatres, and her shrines, and to array her in that plenitude of architectural magnificence, the ruins of which still attest the intellectual grandeur of the age, and people which produced a Pericles to plan and a Phidias to execute. All republics that acquire supremacy over other nations rule them selfishly and oppressively. There is no exception to this in either ancient or modern times. Carthage, Rome, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Pisa, Holland, and Republican France, all tyrannized over every province and subject state where they gained authority. But none of them openly avowed their system of doing so upon principle, with a candor which the Athenian Republicans displayed when any remonstrance was made against the severe exactions which they imposed upon their vassal allies. They avowed that their empire was a tyranny, and frankly stated that they solely trusted to force and terror to uphold it. They appealed to what they called the eternal law of nature, that the weak should be coerced by the strong. Sometimes they stated, and not without some truth, that the unjust hatred of Sparta against themselves force them to be unjust to others in self-defense. To be safe, they must be powerful, and to be powerful, they must plunder and coerce their neighbors. They never dreamed of communicating any franchise or share in office to their dependents, but jealously monopolized every post of command and all political and judicial power, exposing themselves to every risk with unflinching gallantry, embarking readily in every ambitious scheme, and never suffering difficulty or disaster to shake their tenacity of purpose in the hope of acquiring unbounded empire for their country and the means of maintaining each of the 30,000 citizens who made up the sovereign republic in exclusive devotion to military occupations and to those brilliant sciences and arts in which Athens already had reached the meridian of intellectual splendor. Her great political dramatist speaks of the Athenian Empire as comprehending a thousand states. The language of the stage must not be taken too literally, but the number of dependencies of Athens at the time when the Peloponnesian Confederacy attacked her, was undoubtedly very great. With a few trifling exceptions, all the islands of the Aegean and all the Greek cities which in that age fringed the coast of Asia Minor, the Hellespont and Thrace paid tribute to Athens and implicitly obeyed her orders. The Aegean Sea was an Attic lake. Westward of Greece, her influence, though strong, was not equally predominant. She had colonies and allies among the wealthy and populous Greek settlements in Sicily and South Italy, but she had no organized system of confederates in those regions, and her galleys brought her no tribute from the western seas. The extension of her empire over Sicily was the favorite project of her ambitious orators and generals. While her great statesman Pericles lived, his commanding genius kept his countrymen under control and forbade them to risk the fortunes of Athens in distant enterprises, while they had unsubdued and powerful enemies at their own doors. He taught Athens this maxim, but he also taught her to know and to use her own strength. And when Pericles had departed, the bold spirit which he had fostered overleaped the salutary limits which he had prescribed. When her bitter enemies, the Corinthians, succeeded, 
BC 431 in inducing Sparta to attack her, and a confederacy was formed of five-sixths of the continental Greeks, all animated by anxious jealousy and bitter hatred of Athens. When armies far superior in numbers and equipment to those which had marched against the Persians were poured into the Athenian territory and laid it to waste to the city walls, the general opinion was that Athens would be reduced in two or three years at the furthest to submit to the requisitions of her invaders. But her strong fortifications, by which she was girt and linked to her principal haven, gave her, in those ages, almost all the advantages of an insular position. Pericles had made her trust to her empire of the seas. Every Athenian in those days was a practiced seaman, a state, indeed, whose members of an age fit for service at no time exceeded 30,000, could only have acquired such a naval dominion as Athens once held by devoting and zealously training all its sons to service in its fleets. In order to man the numerous galleys which she sent out, she necessarily employed large numbers of hired mariners and slaves at the oar. But the staple of her crews was Athenian, and all posts of command were held by native citizens. It was by reminding them of this, of their long practice in seamanship, and the certain superiority which their discipline gave them over the enemy's marine, that their great minister mainly encouraged them to resist the combined power of Lacedaemon and her allies. He taught them that Athens might thus reap the fruit of her zealous devotion to maritime affairs ever since the invasion of the Medes. She had not, indeed, perfected herself, but the reward of her superior training was the rule of the sea, a mighty dominion, for it gave her the rule of much fair land beyond its waves, safe from the idle ravages with which the Lacedaemonians might harass Attica, but never could subdue Athens. Athens accepted the war with which her enemies threatened her, rather than descend from her pride of place. And though the awful visitation of the plague came upon her and swept away more of her citizens than the Dorian spear laid low, she held her own gallantly against her enemies. If the Peloponnesian armies, in irresistible strength, wasted every spring of her cornlands, her vineyards, and her olive groves with fire and sword, she retaliated on their coasts with her fleets, which, if resisted, were only resisted to display the preeminent skill and bravery of her seamen. Some of her subject allies revolted, but the revolts were in general sternly and promptly quelled. The genius of one enemy had indeed inflicted blows on her power in Thrace, which she was unable to remedy, but he fell in battle in the tenth year of the war, and with the loss of Brasidas the Lacedaemonians seemed to have lost all energy and judgment. Both sides, at length, grew weary of the war, and in 421 a truce for fifty years was concluded, which, though ill-kept, and though many of the confederates of Sparta refused to recognize it, and hostilities still continued in many parts of Greece, protected the Athenian territory from the ravages of enemies, and enabled Athens to accumulate large sums out of the proceeds of her annual revenues. So also, as a few years passed by, the havoc which the pestilence and the sword had made in her population was repaired, and in 415 Athens was full of bold and restless spirits, who longed for some field of distant enterprise 
wherein they might signalize themselves and aggrandize the state, and who looked to the alarm of Spartan hostility as a mere old woman's tale. When Sparta had wasted their territory, she had done her worst, and the fact of its always being in her power to do so seemed a strong reason for seeking to increase the transmarine dominion of Athens. The West was now the quarter toward which the thoughts of every aspiring Athenian were directed. From the very beginning of the war, Athens had kept up an interest in Sicily, and her squadron had, from time to time, appeared on its coasts and taken part in the dissensions in which the Sicilian Greeks were universally engaged, one against the other. There were plausible grounds for a direct quarrel, and an open attack by the Athenians upon Syracuse. With the capture of Syracuse, all Sicily, it was hoped, would be secured. Carthage and Italy were next to be attacked. With large levies of Iberian mercenaries, she then meant to overwhelm her Peloponnesian enemies. The Persian monarchy lay in hopeless imbecility, inviting Greek invasion, nor did the known world contain the power that seemed capable of checking the growing might of Athens if Syracuse once should be hers. The national historian of Rome has left us an episode of his great work, a disquisition on the probable effects that would have followed if Alexander the Great had invaded Italy. Posterity has generally regarded that disquisition as proving Livy's patriotism more strongly than his impartiality or acuteness. Yet, right or wrong, the speculations of the Roman writer were directed to the consideration of a very remote possibility. To whatever age Alexander's life might have been prolonged, the East would have furnished full occupation for his martial ambition, as well as for those schemes of commercial grandeur and imperial amalgamation of nations, in which the truly great qualities of his mind loved to display themselves. With his death, the dismemberment of his empire among his generals was certain, even as the dismemberment of Napoleon's empire among his marshals would certainly have ensued if he had been cut off in the zenith of his power. Rome also was far weaker when the Athenians were in Sicily than she was a century afterward in Alexander's time. There can be little doubt but that Rome would have been bloated out from the independent powers of the West had she been attacked at the end of the 5th century BC by an Athenian army, largely aided by Spanish mercenaries and flushed with triumphs over Sicily and Africa instead of the collision between her and Greece having been deferred until the latter had sunk into decrepitude and the Roman Mars had grown into full vigor. The armament which the Athenians equipped against Syracuse was in every way worthy of the state which formed such projects of universal empire, and it has been truly termed the noblest that ever yet had been sent forth by a free and civilized commonwealth. The fleet consisted of 134 war galleys, with a multitude of store ships. A powerful force of the best heavy armed infantry that Athens and her allies could furnish was sent on board it, together with a smaller number of slingers and bowmen. The quality of the forces was even more remarkable than the number. The zeal of individuals vied with that of the Republic in giving every galley the best possible crew and every troop the most perfect accoutrements. 
and with private as well as public wealth eagerly lavished on all that could give splendor as well as efficiency to the expedition the fated fleet began its voyage for the sicilian shores in the summer of 415 the syracusans themselves at the time of the peloponnesian war were a bold and turbulent democracy tyrannizing over the weaker greek cities in sicily and trying to gain in that island the same arbitrary supremacy which athens maintained along the eastern coast of the mediterranean in numbers and in spirit they were fully equal to the athenians but far inferior to them in military and naval discipline when the probability of an athenian invasion was first publicly discussed at syracuse and efforts were made by some of the wiser citizens to improve the state of the national defenses and prepare for the impeding danger the rumors of coming war and the proposal for preparation were received by the mass of the syracusans with scornful incredulity the speech of one of their popular orators is preserved to us in thucydides the syracusan orator told his countrymen to dismiss with scorn the visionary terrors which a set of designing men among themselves strove to excite in order to get power and influence thrown into their own hands he told them that athens knew her own interest too well to think of wantonly provoking their hostility even if the enemies were to come said he so distant from their resources and opposed to such a power as ours their destruction would be easy and inevitable their ships will have enough to do to get to our island at all and to carry such stores of all sorts as will be needed they cannot therefore carry besides an army large enough to cope with such a population as ours they will have no fortified place from which to commence their operations but must rest them on no better base than a set of wretched tents and such means as the necessities of the moment will allow them but in truth i do not believe that they would even be able to effect a disembarkation let us therefore set at naught these reports as altogether of home manufacture and be sure that if any enemy does come the state will know how to defend itself in a manner worthy of national honor such assertions pleased the syracusan assembly but the invaders of syracuse came made good their landing in sicily and if they had promptly attacked the city itself instead of wasting nearly a year in desultory operations in other parts of sicily the syracusans must have paid the penalty of their self-sufficient carelessness in submission to the athenian yoke but of the three generals who led the athenian expedition two only were men of ability and one was most weak and incompetent fortunately for syracuse alcibiades the most skillful of the three was soon deposed from his command by a factious and fanatic vote of his fellow countrymen and the other competent one lamachus fell early in a skirmish while more fortunately still for her the feeble and vacillating nicias remained unrecalled and unheard to assume the undivided leadership of the athenian army and fleet and to mar by alternate overcaution and overcarelessness every chance of success which the early part of the operations offered still even under him the athenians nearly won the town they defeated the raw levies of the syracusans cooped them within the walls and 
as before mentioned, almost effected a continuous fortification from bay to bay over Epipole, the completion of which would certainly have been followed by a capitulation. End of section 5. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 6 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez, June 2019. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Athenians at Syracuse, B.C. 413, by Sir Edward S. Creasy. Part 2. Alcibiades, the most complete example of genius without principle that history produces, the Bolingbroke of antiquity but with high military talents superadded to diplomatic and oratorical powers. On being summoned home from his command in Sicily to take his trial before the Athenian tribunal, had escaped to Sparta and had exerted himself there with all the selfish rancor of a renegade to renew the war with Athens and to send instant assistance to Syracuse. When we read his words in the pages of Thucydides, who was himself an exile from Athens at this period, and may probably have been at Sparta, and heard Alcibiades speak, we are at a loss whether most to admire or abhor his subtle counsels. After an artful exordium, in which he tried to disarm the suspicions which he felt must be entertained of him and to point out to the Spartans how completely his interests and theirs were identified through hatred of the Athenian democracy, he thus proceeded. Hear me, at any rate, on the matters which require your grave attention and which I, from the personal knowledge that I have of them, can and ought to bring before you. We Athenians sailed to Sicily with the design of subduing first the Greek cities there and next those in Italy. Then we intended to make an attempt on the dominions of Carthage and on Carthage itself. If all these projects succeeded, nor did we limit ourselves to them, in these quarters, we intended to increase our fleet with the inexhaustible supplies of ship timber which Italy affords, to put in requisition the whole military force of the conquered Greek states, and also to hire large armies of the barbarians, of the Iberians, and others in those regions, who are allowed to make the best possible soldiers. Then, when we had done all this, we intended to assail Peloponnesus with our collected force. Our fleets would blockade you by sea and desolate your coasts. Our armies would be landed at different points and assail your cities. Some of these we expected to storm, and others we meant to take by surrounding them with fortified lines. We thought that it would thus be an easier matter thoroughly to wear you down, and then we should become the masters of the whole Greek race. As for expense, we reckoned that each conquered state would give us supplies of money and provisions sufficient to pay for its own conquest and furnish the means for the conquest of its neighbors. 
Such are the designs of the present Athenian expedition to Sicily, and you have heard them from the lips of the man who, of all men living, is most accurately acquainted with them. The other Athenian generals who remain with the expedition will endeavor to carry out these plans. And be sure that without your speedy interference they will all be accomplished. The Sicilian Greeks are deficient in military training, but still, if they could at once be brought to combine in an organized resistance to Athens, they might even now be saved. But as for the Syracusans resisting Athens by themselves, they have already, with the whole strength of their population, fought a battle and been beaten. They cannot face the Athenians at sea, and it is quite impossible for them to hold out against the force of their invaders. And if this city falls into the hands of the Athenians, all Sicily is theirs, and presently Italy also. And the danger which I warned you of from that quarter will soon fall upon yourselves. You must, therefore, in Sicily, fight for the safety of Peloponnesus. Send some galleys thither instantly. Put men on board who can work their own way over, and who, as soon as they land, can do duty as regular troops. But, above all, let one of yourselves, let a man of Sparta, go over to take the chief command, to bring into order and effective discipline the forces that are in Syracuse, and urge those who at present hang back to come forward and aid the Syracusans. The presence of a Spartan general at this crisis will do more to save the city than a whole army. The renegade then proceeded to urge on them the necessity of encouraging their friends in Sicily by showing that they themselves were in earnest in hostility to Athens. He exhorted them not only to march their armies into Attica again, but to take up permanent fortified position in the country, and he gave them in detail information of all that the Athenians most dreaded, and how his country might receive the most distressing and enduring injury at their hands. The Spartans resolved to act on his advice, and appointed Gylippus to the Sicilian command. Gylippus was a man who, to the national bravery and military skill, of a Spartan united political sagacity that was worthy of his great fellow countryman Brasidas, but his merits were debased by mean and sordid vices, and his is one of the cases in which history has been austerely just, and where little or no fame has been accorded to the successful but venal soldier. But for the purpose for which he was required in Sicily, an abler man could not have been found in Lacedaemon. His country gave him neither men nor money, but she gave him her authority, and the influence of her name and of his own talents was speedily seen in the zeal with which the Corinthians and other Peloponnesian Greeks began to equip a squadron to act under him for the rescue of Sicily. As soon as four galleys were ready, he hurried over with them to the southern coast of Italy, and there, though he received such evil tidings of the state of Syracuse that he abandoned all hope of saving that city, he determined to remain on the coast and do what he could in preserving the Italian cities from the Athenians. So nearly, indeed, had Nicias completed his beleaguering lines, and so utterly desperate had the state of Syracuse seemingly become, 
that an assembly of the Syracusans was actually convened, and they were discussing the terms on which they should offer to capitulate, when a galley was seen dashing into the great harbor, and making her way toward the town, with all the speed which her rowers could supply. From her shunning the part of the harbor where the Athenian fleet lay, and making straight for the Syracusan side, it was clear that she was a friend. The enemy's cruisers, careless through confidence of success, made no attempt to cut her off. She touched the beach and a Corinthian captain, springing on shore from her, was eagerly conducted to the assembly of the Syracusan people, just in time to prevent the fatal vote being put for a surrender. Providentially for Syracuse, Gongylus, the commander of the galley, had been prevented by an Athenian squadron from following Gylippus to South Italy, and he had been obliged to push direct for Syracuse from Greece. The sight of actual succor and the promise of more revived the drooping spirits of the Syracusans. They felt that they were not left desolate to perish, and the tidings that a Spartan was coming to command them confirmed their resolution to continue their resistance. Gylippus was already near the city. He had learned at Locri that the first report which had reached him of the state of Syracuse was exaggerated, and that there was unfinished space in the besiegers' lines through which it was barely possible to introduce reinforcements into the town. Crossing the Straits of Messina, which the culpable negligence of Nicias had left unguarded, Gylippus landed on the northern coast of Sicily, and there began to collect from the Greek cities an army, of which the regular troops that he brought from Peloponnesus formed the nucleus. Such was the influence of the name of Sparta, and such were his own abilities and activity, that he succeeded in raising a force of about 2,000 fully armed infantry with a larger number of irregular troops. Nicias, as if infatuated, made no attempt to counteract his operation, nor, when Gylippus marched his little army toward Syracuse, did the Athenian commander endeavor to check him. The Syracusans marched out to meet him, and while the Athenians were solely intent on completing their fortifications on the southern side toward the harbor, Gylippus turned their position by occupying the high ground in the extreme rear of Epipole. He then marched through the unfortified interval of Nicaea's lines into the besieged town, and joining his troops with the Syracusan forces, after some engagements with varying success, gained the mastery over Nicias, drove the Athenians from Epipole, and hemmed them into a disadvantageous position in the low grounds near the great harbor. The attention of all Greece was now fixed on Syracuse, and every enemy of Athens felt the importance of the opportunity now offered of checking her ambition, and perhaps of striking a deadly blow at her power. Larger reinforcements from Corinth, Thebes and other cities now reached the Syracusans, while the baffled and dispirited Athenian general earnestly besought his countrymen to recall him, and represented the further prosecution of the siege as hopeless. But Athens had made it a maxim never to let difficulty or disaster drive her back from any enterprise once undertaken, so long as she possessed the means of making any effort, however desperate, for its accomplishment. With indomitable pertinacity, she now decreed, instead of recalling her first armament from before Syracuse, to send out a second. 
though her enemies near home had now renewed open warfare against her, and by occupying a permanent fortification in her territory, had severely distressed her population, and were pressing her with almost all the hardship of an actual siege. She still was the mistress of the sea, and she sent forth another fleet of seventy galleys, and another army, which seemed to drain almost the last reserves of her military population, to try if Syracuse could not yet be won, and the honor of the Athenian arms be preserved from the stigma of a retreat. Here was, indeed, a spirit that might be broken, but never would bend. At the head of this second expedition, she wisely placed her best general, Demosthenes, one of the most distinguished officers that the long Peloponnesian war had produced, and who, if he had originally held the Sicilian command, would soon have brought Syracuse to submission. The fame of Demosthenes the general has been dimmed by the superior luster of his great countryman, Demosthenes the orator. When the name Demosthenes is mentioned, it is the latter alone that is thought of. The soldier has found no biographer. Yet out of the long list of great men whom the Athenian Republic produced, there are few that deserve to stand higher than this brave, though finally unsuccessful leader of her fleets and armies in the first half of the Peloponnesian War. In his first campaign in Aetolia, he had shown some of the rashness of youth, and had received a lesson of caution by which he profited throughout the rest of his career. But without losing any of his natural energy in enterprise or in execution, he had performed the distinguished service of rescuing Naupactus from a powerful hostile armament in the seventh year of the war. He had then, at the request of the Acarnanian republics, taken on himself the office of commander-in-chief of all their forces, and at their head he had gained some important advantages over the enemies of Athens in western Greece. His most celebrated exploits had been the occupation of Pylos on the Messenian coast, the successful defense of that place against the fleet and armies of Lacedaemon, and the subsequent capture of the Spartan forces on the Isle of Sphacteria, which was the severest blow dealt to Sparta throughout the war, and which had mainly caused her to humble herself to make the truce with Athens. Demosthenes was as honorably unknown in the war of party politics at Athens as he was eminent in the war against the foreign enemy. We read of no intrigues of his on either the aristocratic or democratic side. He was neither in the interest of Nicias nor of Cleon. His private character was free from any of the stains which polluted that of Alcibiades. On all these points, the silence of the comic dramatist is decisive evidence in his favor. He had also the moral courage, not always combined with physical, of seeking to do his duty to his country, irrespective of any odium that he himself might incur and unhampered by any petty jealousy of those who were associated with him in command. There are a few men named in ancient history of whom posterity would gladly know more, or whom we sympathize with more deeply in the calamities that befell them than Demosthenes, the son of Alcisthenes who, in the spring of the year 413, left Piraeus at the head of the second Athenian expedition against Sicily. 
His arrival was critically timed, for Gylippus had encouraged the Syracusans to attack the Athenians under Nicias by sea, as well as by land. And by one able stratagem of Ariston, one of the admirals of the Corinthian auxiliary squadron, the Syracusans and their confederates had inflicted on the fleet of Nicias the first defeat that the Athenian navy had ever sustained from a numerically inferior enemy. Gylippus was preparing to follow up his advantage by fresh attacks on the Athenians on both elements, when the arrival of the Mosthenes completely changed the aspect of affairs and restored the superiority to the invaders. With 73 war galleys in the highest state of efficiency and brilliantly equipped with a force of 5,000 picked men of the regular infantry of Athens and her allies and a still larger number of bowmen, javelin men and slingers on board, the Mosthenes rode round the great harbor with loud cheers and martial music as if in defiance of the Syracusans and their confederates. His arrival had indeed changed their newly born hopes into the deepest consternation. The resources of Athens seemed inexhaustible and resistance to her hopeless. They had been told that she was reduced to the last extremities and that her territory was occupied by an enemy and yet here they saw her sending forth as if in prodigality of power. A second armament to make foreign conquests not inferior to that with which Nicias had first landed on the Sicilian shores. With the intuitive decision of a great commander, Demosthenes at once saw that the possession of Epipole was the key to the possession of Syracuse, and he resolved to make a prompt and vigorous attempt to recover that position while his force was unimpaired and the consternation which its arrival had produced among the besieged remained unabated. The Syracusans and their allies had run out an outwork along the Epipole from the city walls intersecting the fortified lines of circumvallation which Nicias had commenced, but from which he had been driven by Gylippus. Could Demosthenes succeed in storming this outwork and re-establishing the Athenian troops on the high ground, he might fairly hope to be able to resume the circumvallation of the city and become the conqueror of Syracuse. For, when once the besiegers' lines were completed, the number of the troops with which Gylippus had garrisoned the place would only tend to exhaust the stores of provisions and accelerate its downfall. An easily repelled attack was first made on the outwork in the daytime, probably more with a view of blinding the besieged to the nature of the operations than with any expectations of succeeding in an open assault, with every disadvantage of the ground to contend against. But when the darkness had set in, Demosthenes formed his men in columns, each soldier taking with him five days' provisions, and the engineers and workmen of the camp, following the troops with their tools and all portable implements of fortification so as at once to secure any advantage of ground that the army might gain. Thus equipped and prepared, he led his men along by the foot of the southern flank of Epibole, in a direction toward the interior of the island, till he came immediately below the narrow ridge that forms the extremity of the high ground, looking westward. He then wheeled his vanguard to the right, send them rapidly up the paths that wind along the face of the cliff, and succeeded in completely surprising the Syracusan outposts. 
and in placing his troops fairly on the extreme summit of the all-important Epipole. Thence the Athenians marched eagerly down the slope toward the town, routing some Syracusan detachments that were quartered in their way and vigorously assailing the unprotected side of the outwork. All at first favored them. The outwork was abandoned by its garrison and the Athenian engineers began to dismantle it. In vain, Gylippus brought up fresh troops to check the assault. The Athenians broke and drove them back and continued to press hotly forward in the full confidence of victory. But amid the general consternation of the Syracusans and their confederates, one body of infantry stood firm. This was a brigade of their Boeotian allies, which was posted low down the slope of Epipole, outside the city walls. Coolly and steadily, the Boeotian infantry formed their line, and undismayed by the current of flight around them, advanced against the advancing Athenians. This was the crisis of the battle. But the Athenian van was disorganized by its own previous successes, and yielding to the unexpected charge thus made on it by the troops in perfect order and of the most obstinate courage, it was driven back in confusion upon the other divisions of the army that still continued to press forward. When once the tide was thus turned, the Syracusan passed rapidly from the extreme of panic to the extreme of vengeful daring, and with all their forces they now fiercely assailed the embarrassed and receding Athenians. In vain did the officers of the latter strive to reform their line. Amid the din and the shouting of the fight, and the confusion inseparable upon a night engagement, especially one where many thousand combatants were pent and whirled together in a narrow and uneven area, the necessary maneuvers were impracticable, and though many companies still fought on desperately, wherever the moonlight showed them the semblance of a foe, they fought without concert or subordination, and not infrequently, amid the deadly chaos, Athenian troops assailed each other. Keeping their ranks close, the Syracusans and their allies pressed on against the disorganized masses of the besiegers, and at length drove them with heavy slaughter over the cliffs which an hour or two before they had scaled full of hope and apparently certain of success. This defeat was decisive of the event of the siege. The Athenians afterwards struggled only to protect themselves from the vengeance which the Syracusans sought to wreak in the complete destruction of their invaders. Never, however, was vengeance more complete and terrible. A series of sea fights followed, in which the Athenian galleys were utterly destroyed or captured. The mariners and soldiers who escaped death in disastrous engagements and a vain attempt to force a retreat into the interior of the island became prisoners of war. Nicias and Demosthenes were put to death in cold blood, and their men either perished miserably in the Syracusan dungeons or were sold into slavery to the very persons whom, in their pride of power, they had crossed the seas to enslave. All dangers from Athens to the independent nations of the West was now forever at an end. She, indeed, continued to struggle against her combined enemies and revolted allies with unparalleled gallantry, and many more years of varying warfare passed away before she surrendered to their arms. But no success in subsequent contests could
could ever have restored her to the preeminence in enterprise, resources and maritime skill which she had acquired before her fatal reverses in Sicily, nor among the rival Greek republics whom her own rashness aided to crush her, was there any capable of reorganizing her empire or resuming her schemes of conquest. The dominion of Western Europe was left for Rome and Carthage to dispute two centuries later in conflicts still more terrible and with even higher displays of military daring and genius than Athens had witnessed either in her rise, her meridian or her fall. End of section 6 Recording by Mike Botez Section 7 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rod. Retreat of the 10,000 Greeks. 401-399 BC, Xenophon. The expedition of the Greeks, generally known as the Retreat of the Ten Thousand, was conducted by Xenophon, a Greek historian, essayist, and military commander. Xenophon was a pupil of Socrates, of whom he left a famous memoir. In 401 BC, he accepted the invitation of his friend Roxenis of Boetia a general of Greek mercenaries, to take service under Cyrus the Younger, brother of Artaxerxes, Menemen, king of Persia. Cyrus had considered himself as deeply wronged by his older brother, who had thrown him into prison on the death of their father, Darius. Escaping from prison, he formed a design to wrest the throne from Artaxerxes. For this purpose, he engaged the forces of Proxenus, and to this army Xenophon attached himself. The rendezvous was Sardis, from which the army marched east under the pretext of chastising the revolting mountaineers of Sidia. Instead of attacking the Sidians, the followers of Cyrus proceeded east through Asia and Babylonia till they met the forces of Antaxerxes at Cunexa. A furious battle took place, and the rout of the king's army had begun when Cyrus, elated with a victory that seemed just within his grasp, challenged his brother to single combat. In the duel that ensued, Cyrus was slain. Roxenes had already fallen, and the virtual command of the Greek army soon devolved upon Xenophon, who thereupon began the famous retreat. A vivid account of battles, and of hardships endured from the cold in the struggle through mountain snows, through almost impassable forests, and across bridgeless rivers, is given in Xenophon's Anabasis, the celebrated work in seven books, which forms the classical narrative of the campaign and the retreat. Soon after the death of Cyrus, in September BC 401, the seizure and the murder of the leading Greek generals by the treacherous Persian satrap, Tisafernes, placed the Greek army in great peril. Xenophon, who now took practical command, counseled and exhorted the surviving leaders, and on the next day the Greeks formed in a hollow square, the baggage in the center, and began their retreat, which led them along the Tigris to the territory of the Kardachi, Kurds, through Armenia, and across Georgia, the enemy often harassing them. At the point where the climax of the story, which is presented here, may be said to begin, the Greeks have entered Armenia, passed the sources of the Tigris, and reached the Telebas, having made a treaty with Tiribazis, governor of the province, and discovered his insincerity and that he was ready to attack them in their passage over the mountains, they resolved upon a quick resumption of their march. When in the fifth month of the retreat, the Greeks at last from the hilltop beheld the Oixin, they set up a cry, the sea, the sea, which has echoed through succeeding ages as one of the great historic jubilations of humanity. 
At the end of the retreat, their numbers were reduced to about 6,000, and from the starting point at Kunaksa to the middle of the southern coasts of the Black Sea, they had traveled as much as 2,000 miles. From Ephesus to Kunaksa and thence to the Black Sea region, they had marched in 15 months, February 401 BC to June 400, and nine months more passed before they joined the Spartan army in Asia Minor, and their task was fully accomplished. Their great performance is regarded as having prepared the bay for Alexander's triumphant advances in the east. The young conqueror on the eve of the Battle of Isis declared that he owed inspiration to the feet of the Ten Thousand. It was thought necessary to march away as fast as possible before the enemy's force should be reassembled and get possession of the pass. Collecting their baggage at once, therefore, they set forward through a deep snow, taking with them several guides, and having the same day passed the height on which Tiribatius had intended to attack them, they encamped. Hence they proceeded three days' journey through a desert tract of country, a distance of fifteen parasangs, to the river Euphrates, and passed it without being wet higher than the middle. The sources of the river were said not to be far off. From hence they advanced three days' march through much snow and a level plain, a distance of fifteen parasangs. The third day's march was extremely troublesome, as the north wind blew full in their faces, completely parching up everything and benumbing the men. One of the ogres, in consequence, advised that they should sacrifice to the wind, and a sacrifice was accordingly offered when the vehemence of the wind appeared to everyone manifestly to abate. The depth of the snow was a fathom, so that many of the baggage cattle and the slaves perished with about thirty of the soldiers. They continued to burn fires through the whole night, for there was plenty of wood at the place of encampment, but those who came up late could get no wood. Those, therefore, who had arrived before and had kindled fires, would not admit the late comers to the fire unless they gave them a share of the corn or other provisions that they had brought. Thus they shared with each other what they respectively had. In the places where the fires were made, as the snow melted, there were formed large pits that reached down to the ground, and here there was accordingly opportunity to measure the depth of the snow. From hence they marched through snow, the whole of the following day, and many of the men contracted the bulimia. Xenophon, who commanded in the rear, finding in his way such of the men as had fallen down with it, knew not what disease it was. But as one of these acquainted with it told him that they were evidently affected with bulimia, and that they would get up if they had something to eat, he went round among the baggage, and wherever he saw anything eatable he gave it out, and sent such as were able to run to distribute it among those diseased, who as soon as they had eaten, rose up and continued their march. As they proceeded, Chrysophis came, just as it grew dark, to a village, and found at a spring in front of the rampart some women and girls belonging to the place fetching water. The women asked them who they were, and the interpreter answered in the Persian language that they were people going from the king to the satrap. They replied that he was not there, but about a parasang off. However, as it was late, they went with the water carriers within the rampart to the headman of the village, and here Chrysophis, and as many of the troops as could come up encamped, but of the rest such as were unable to get to the end of the journey, spent the night on the way without food or fire, and some of the soldiers lost their lives on that occasion. Some of the enemy, too, who had collected themselves into a body, pursued our rear, and seized any of the baggage cattle that were unable to proceed, fighting with one another for the possession of them. Such of the soldiers also, as had lost their sight from the effect of the snow, or had their toes modified by the cold, were left behind. It was found to be a relief to the eyes against the snow, if the soldiers kept something black before them on the march, and to the feet if they kept constantly in motion, and allowed themselves no rest, and if they took off their shoes in the night, but as to such as slept, with their shoes on, 
the straps worked into their feet, and the soles were frozen about them, for when their old shoes had failed them, shoes of raw hides had been made by the men themselves from the newly skinned oxen. From such unavoidable sufferings, some of the soldiers were left behind, who, seeing a piece of ground of a black appearance, from the snow having disappeared there, conjectured that it must have melted, and it had in fact melted in a spot from the effect of the fountain which was sending up vapor in a wooded hollow close at hand. Turning aside thither, they sat down and refused to proceed farther. Xenophil who was with the rear guard, as soon as he heard this, tried to prevail on them by every art and means not to be left behind, telling them at the same time that the enemy were collected and pursuing them in great numbers. At last he grew angry, and they told him to kill them as they were quite unable to go forward. He then thought it the best course to strike a terror, if possible into the enemy that were behind, lest they should fall upon the exhausted soldiers. It was now dark, and the enemy were advancing with a great noise, quarreling about the booty that they had taken, when such of the rear guard as were not disabled started up and rushed toward them, while the tired men, shouting as loud as they could, clashed their spears against their shield. The enemy, struck with alarm, threw themselves among the snow into the hollow, and no one of them afterward made himself heard from any quarter. Xenophon and those with him, telling the sick men that the party should come to their relief next day, proceeded on their march, but before they had gone from Astadia, they found other soldiers, resting by the way in the snow, and covered up with it, no guard being stationed over them. They roused them up, but they said that the head of the army was not moving forward. Xenophon, going past them and sending on some of the ablest of the peltasts, ordered them to ascertain what it was that hindered their progress. They brought word that the whole army was in that manner taking rest. Xenophon and his men, therefore, stationing such a guard as they could, took up their quarters there without fire or supper. When it was near day, he sent the youngest of his men to the sick, telling them to rouse them and oblige them to proceed. At this juncture, Christopher sent some of his people from the village to see how the rear were faring. The young men were rejoiced to see them, and gave them the sick to conduct to the camp, while they themselves went forward, and before they had gone twenty stadia, found themselves at the village in which Christophus was quartered. When they came together, it was thought safe enough to lodge the troops up and down in the village. Christophus accordingly remained where he was, and the other officers, appropriating by lots the several villages that they had in sight, went to their respective quarters with their men. Here Polycrates, an Athenian captain, requested leave of absence, and taking with him the most active of his men, and hastening to the village to which Xenophon had been allotted, surprised all the villagers and their headmen in their houses, together with seventeen cults that were bred as a tribute for the king, and the headman's daughter, who had been but nine days married, her husband was gone out to hunt hares, and was not found in any of the villages. Their houses were underground, the entrance like a mouth of a well, but spacious below. There were passages dug into them for the cattle, but the people descended by ladders. In the houses were goats, sheep, cows and fowls with their young, all the cattle were kept on fodder within the walls. There were also wheat, barley, leguminous, vegetables, and barley wine in large bowels, the grains of barley floated in it even with the brim of the vessels, and reeds also lay in it, some large and some smaller. Without joints and these, when any one was thirsty, he was to take in his mouth and suck. The liquor was very strong, unless one mixed water with it, and a very pleasant drink to those accustomed to it. Xenophon made the chief man of his village sup with him, and told him to be of good courage, assuring him that he should not be deprived of his children, and that they would not go away without filling his house with provisions in return for what they took, if he would but prove himself the author of some service to the army till they should reach another tribe. This he promised, and to show his goodwill, pointed out where some wine was buried. 
This night, therefore, the soldiers rested in their several quarters, in the midst of great abundance, setting a guard over the chief, and keeping his children at the same time under their eye. The following day Xenophon took the headman and went with him to Chrysophus, and wherever he passed by a village he turned aside to visit those who were quartered in it, and found them in all parts feasting and enjoying themselves, nor would they anywhere let them go till they had set refreshment before them. And they placed everywhere upon the same table lamb, kid, pork, veal, and fowl, with plenty of bread, both of wheat and barley. Whenever any person, to pay a compliment, wished to drink to another, he took him to the large bowl where he had to stoop down and drink, sucking like an ox. The chief they allowed to take whatever he pleased, but he accepted nothing from them. Where he found any of his relatives, however, he took them with him. When they came to Chrysophus, they found his men also feasting in their quarters, crowned with wreaths made of hay, and Armenian boys in their barbarian dress, waiting upon them, to whom they made signs what they were to do as if they had been deaf and dumb. When Chrysophus and Xenophon had saluted one another, they both asked the chief man, through the interpreter who spoke the Persian language, what country it was. He replied that it was Armenia. They then asked him for whom the horses were bred, and he said that they were a tribute for the king and added that the neighboring country was that of Calibes, and told them in what direction the road lay. Xenophon then went away, conducting the chief back to his family, giving him the horse that he had taken, which was rather old, to fatten and offer in sacrifice, for he had heard that it had been consecrated to the sun, being afraid indeed that it might die, as it had been injured by the journey. He then took some of the young horses, and gave one of them to each of the other generals and captains. The horses in this country were smaller than those of Persia, but far more spirited. The chief instructed the men to tie little bags round the feet of the horses and other cattle when they drove them through the snow, for without such bags they sunk up to their bellies. When the eighth day was come, Xenophon committed the guy to Chrysophus. He left the chief, all the members of his family, except his son, a youth just coming to mature age. Him he gave in charge to Episthenes of Amphipolis, in order that if the father should conduct them properly, he might return home with him. At the same time they carried to his house as many provisions as they could, and then broke up their camp and resumed their march. The chief conducted them through the snow, walking at liberty. When he came to the end of the third day's march, Christophus was angry at him for not guiding them to some villages. He said that there was none in the part of the country. Christophus then struck him but did not confine him, and in consequence he ran off in the night, leaving his son behind him. This affair, the ill-treatment and neglect of the guide, was the only cause of dissension between Christophus and Xenophon during the march. Episthenes conceived an affection for the youth, and taking him home found him extremely attached to him. After this occurrence they proceeded seven days' journey, five parasangs each day, till they came to the river Phasis, the breast of which is a plethrum. Hence they advanced two days' journey, ten parasangs, when on the pass that led over the mountains into the plain, the Chalabis, Tauki, and Phishans were drawn up to oppose their progress. Chrysophis, seeing these enemies in possession of the height, came to a halt, at a distance of about thirty stadia, that he might not approach them while leading the army in a column. He accordingly ordered the other officers to bring up their companies, that the whole force might be formed in line. End of section 7、Sections、8 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn.
Rosita Johnson, and John Rod. When the rear guard was come up, he called together the generals and captains and spoke to them as follows. The enemy, as you see, is in possession of the pass over the mountains, and it is proper for us to consider how we may encounter them to the best advantage. It is my opinion, therefore, that we should direct the troops to get their dinner and that we ourselves should hold the council in the meantime whether it is advisable to cross the mountain today or tomorrow. It seems best to me, exclaimed Cleaner, to march at once as soon as we have dined and resumed our arms against the enemy, for if we waste the present day in inaction, the enemy, who are now looking down upon us, will grow bolder, and it is likely that as their confidence is increased, others will join them in greater numbers. After him Xenophon said, I am of opinion that if it be necessary to fight, we ought to make our arrangements so as to fight with the greatest advantage, but that if we propose to pass the mountains as easily as possible, we ought to consider how we may incur the fewest wounds and lose the fewest men. The range of fields, as far as we see, extends more than sixty stadia in length, but the people nowhere seem to be watching us except along the line of road and it is therefore better, I think, to endeavour to try to seize unobserved some parts of the unguarded range, and to get possession of it, if we can beforehand, than to attack a strong post, and men prepare to resist us, for it is far less difficult to march up a steep ascent without fighting then a longer level road with enemies on each side, and in the night if men are not obliged to fight, they can see better what is before them than by day if engaged with enemies. While a rough road is easier to defeat to those who are marching without molestation than a smooth one to those who are pelted on the head with missiles. Nor do I think it at all impracticable for us to steal away for ourselves, as we can march by night so as not to be seen, and can keep at such a distance from the enemy as to allow no possibility of being heard. We seem likely to, in my opinion, if we make a pretended attack on this point, to find the rest of the range still escorted, for the enemy will so much the more probably stay where they are. But why should I speak doubtfully about stealing? For I hear that you Lacedaemonians, O Christophus, such of you at least as are of the better class, practice stealing from your boyhood. And it is not a disgrace but an honor to steal whatever the law does not forbid. While in order that you may steal with the utmost dexterity and strive to escape discovery, it is appointed by law that if you are caught stealing, you are scourged. It is now high time for you, therefore, to give proof of your education, and to take care that we may not receive many stripes. But I hear that you Athenians also, rejoined Christophus, are very clever at stealing the public money, though great danger threatens him that steals it, and that your best men steal it most, if indeed your best men are thought worthy to be your magistrates, so that it is time for you likewise to give proof of your education. I am then ready, exclaimed Xenophon, to march with the rear guard as soon as we have supped to take possession of the hills. I have guides too, for our light-armed men captured some of the marauders, following us by lying in ambush, and from them I learned that the mountains are not impassable, but are grazed over by goats and oxen, so that if we once gain possession of any part of the range, there will be tracks also for our baggage cattle. I expect also that the enemy will no longer keep their ground when they see us upon a level with them on the heights, for they will not now come down to be upon a level with us. Christophus then said, But why should you go and leave the charge of the rear, rather say and others, unless some volunteers present themselves? Upon this, Aristonemis of Methodria came forward with his heavy armed men, and Aristias of Chios and Nicomachus of Oetia with their light arms. And they made an arrangement that as soon as they should reach the top they should light a number of fires. 
Having settled these points, they went to dinner, and after dinner, Chrysippus led forward the whole army, ten stadia towards the enemy, that he might appear to be fully resolved to march against them on that quarter. When they had taken their supper, and night came on, those appointed for the service went forward and got possession of the hills. The other troops rested where they were. The enemy, when they saw the heights occupied, kept watching burns a number of fires all night. As soon as it was day, Chrysophus, after having offered sacrifice, marched forward along the road, while those who had gained the height advanced by the ridge. Most of the enemy, meanwhile, stayed at the pass, but a part went to meet the troops coming along the heights. But before the main bodies came together, those on the ridge closed with one another, and the Greeks had the advantage, and put the enemy to flight. At the same time, the Grecian Peltus ran up from the plain to attack the enemy, drawn up to receive them, and Christophus followed at a quick pace with the heavy armed men. The enemy at the pass, however, when they saw those above defeated, took to flight. Not many of them were killed. But a great number of shields were taken, which the Greeks, by hacking them with their swords, rendered useless. As soon as they had gained the ascent, and had sacrificed and erected a trophy, they went down into the plain before them, and arrived at a number of villages stored with abundance of excellent provisions. From hence they marched five days' journey, thirty parasangs, to the country of the Toki, where provisions began to fail them, for the Toki inhabited the strong fastnesses, in which they had laid up all their supplies. Having at length, however, arrived at one place, which had no city or houses attached to it, but in which men and women and a great number of cattle were assembled, Christophus, as soon as he came before it, made it the object of an attack. And when the first division that assailed it began to be tired, another succeeded, and then another, for it was not possible for them to surround it in a body, as there was a river about it. When Xenophon came up with his rear-guard poultists and heavy-armed men, Christophus exclaimed, You come seasonably, for we must take this place, as there are no provisions for the army unless we take it. They then deliberated together, and Xenophon asking what hindered them from taking the place, Christophus replied, The only approach to it is the one which you see, but when any of our men attempt to pass along it, the enemy roll down stones over yonder impending rock, and whoever is struck is treated as you behold, and he pointed at the same moment to some of the men who had had their legs and ribs broken. But if they expand all their stones, rejoined Xenophon, is there anything else to prevent us from advancing? For we see in front of us only a few men, and but two or three of them armed. The space, too, through which we have to pass under exposure to the stones is, as you see, only about a hundred and fifty feet in length, and of this about a hundred feet is covered with large pine trees in groups against which, if the men place themselves, what would they suffer either from the flying stones or the rolling ones? The remaining part of the space is not above fifty feet over which when the stones cease we must pass at a running pace. But, said Christophus, the instant we offer to go to the part covered with trees, the stones fly in great numbers. That, cried Xenophon, would be the very thing we want, for thus they will exhaust their stones the sooner. Let us then advance, if we can, to the point whence we shall have but a short way to run, and from which we may, if we please, easily retreat. Christophus and Xenophon, with Callimachus of Parhesia, one of the captains who had that day the lead of all the other captains of the rear guard, then went forward, all the rest of the captains remaining out of danger. Next, about seventy of the men advanced under the trees, not in a body, but one by one, each sheltering himself as he could. Agagius of Stymphalus and Aristonymus of Methydria, who were also captains of the rear guard, with some others were at the same time standing behind, without the trees, for it was not safe for more than one company to stand under them. Callimachus then adopted the following stratagem. He ran forward two or three paces from the tree under which he was sheltered, 
and when the stones began to be hurled hastily drew back and at each of his sallies more than ten cartloads of stones were spent Agassius, observing what Callimachus was doing, and that the eyes of the whole army were upon him, and fearing that he himself might not be the first to enter the place, began to advance alone, neither calling to Aristonomus, who was next him, nor to Aurelicus of Lugia, both of whom were his intimate friends, nor to any other person, and passed by all the rest. Callimachus, seeing him rushing by, caught hold of the rim of his shield, and at that moment Aristonomus of Methydria ran past them both, and after him Eurylochus of Lucia. For all these sought distinction for valor, and were rivals to one another. And thus, in mutual emulation, they got possession of the place, for when they had once rushed in, not a stone was hurled from above. But a dreadful spectacle was then to be seen, for the women flinging their children over the precipices threw themselves after them, and the men followed their example. Aeneas of Stymphalus, a captain, seeing one of them who had on a rich garment running to throw himself over, caught hold of it with intent to stop him. But the man dragged him forward, and they both went rolling down the rocks together and were killed. Thus very few prisoners were taken, but a great number of oxen, asses, and sheep. Hence they advanced seven days' journey, a distance of fifty parasangs, through the country of the Calabes. These were the most warlike people of all that they passed through, and came to close combat with them. They had linen cuirasses, reaching down to the groin, and instead of a skirt, thick cords twisted. They had also greaves and helmets, and at their girdles a short falchion, as large as a Spartan crooked dagger, with which they cut the throats of all whom they could master, and then cutting off their heads, carried them away with them. They sang and danced when the enemy were likely to see them. They carried also a spear of about fifteen cubits in length. Having one spike, they stayed in their villages till the Greeks had passed by, when they pursued and perpetually harassed them. They had their dwellings in strong places, in which they had also laid up their provisions, so that the Greeks could get nothing from that country, but lived upon the cattle which they had taken from the Taoki. The Greeks next arrived at the river Harpasus, the breadth of which was four plethra. Hence they proceeded through the territory of the Scythini, four days' journey making twenty parasangs over a level tract, until they came to some villages in which they halted three days and collected provisions. From this place they advanced four days' journey, twenty parasangs, to a large, rich, and populous city called Gymnias, from which the governor of the country sent the Greeks a guide to conduct them through a region at war with his own people. The guide, when he came, said that he would take them in five days to a place whence they should see the sea. If not, he would consent to be put to death. When, as he proceeded, he entered the country of their enemy, he exhorted them to burn and lay west the land, whence it was evident that he had come for this very purpose, and not from any good will to the Greeks. On the fifth day they came to the mountain and the name of it was Teikis. When the men who were in the front had mounted the height, and looked down upon the sea, a great shout proceeded from them, and Xenophon and the rear guard, on hearing it, thought that some new enemies were assailing the front, for in the rear, two, the people from the country that they had burnt, were following them, and the rear guard, by placing an ambuscade, had killed some and taken other prisoners, and had captured about twenty shields made of raw ox hides, with the hair on. But the noise still increased, and drew nearer, and as those who came up from time to time kept running at full speed to join those who were continually shouting, the cries becoming louder as the men became more numerous, it appeared to Xenophon that it must be something of very great moment. Mounting his horse, therefore, and taking with him Lysias and the cavalry, he hastened forward to give aid. When presently they heard the soldiers shouting, The sea, the sea, and cheering on one another, they then all began to run. 
The rear guard as well as the rest and the baggage cattle and horses were put to their speed and when they had all arrived at the top, the men embraced one another and their generals and captains with tears in their eyes. Suddenly, whoever it was that suggested it, the soldiers brought a stone and raised a large mound on which they laid a number of raw oxides, staves and shields taken from the enemy. The shields the guide himself hacked in pieces and exhorted the rest to do the same. Soon after, the Greeks sent away the guide, giving him presents from the common stock, a horse, a silver cup, a Persian robe, and then and ten darics. But he showed most desire for the rings on their fingers and obtained many of them from the soldiers, having then pointed out to them a village where they might take up their quarters and the road by which they were to proceed to the Macrons when the evening came on the departed, pursuing his way during the night. Hence the Greeks advanced three days' journey, a distance of ten parasangs, through the country of the Macrons. On the first day, they came to a river which divides the territories of the Macronis from those of the Scythini. On their right, they had an eminence extremely difficult of access, and on their left, another river into which the boundary river which they had to cross empties itself. This stream was thicker. This stream was thickly edged with trees, not indeed large, but growing closely together. These the Greeks, as soon as they came to the spot, cut down, being in haste to get out of the country as soon as possible. The Macronis, however, equipped with wicker shields and spears and hair tunics, were drawn up on the opposite side of the crossing place. They were animating one another and throwing stones into the river. They did not hit our men or cause them any inconvenience. At this juncture, one of the Peltos came up to Xenophon, saying that he had been a slave of Athens, and adding that he knew the language of these men. I think indeed, said he, that this is my country, and if there is nothing to prevent, I should wish to speak to the people. There is nothing to prevent, replied Xenophon, so speak to them, and first to certain what people they are. When he asked them, they said that they were the Macronies. Inquire them, said Xenophon, why they are drawn up to oppose us and wish to be our enemies. They replied, because you come against our country. The generals then told him to acquaint them that we were not come with any wish to do them injury, but that we were returning to Greece after having been engaged in war with the king, and that we were desirous to reach the sea. They asked if the Greeks would give pledges to this effect and the Greeks replied that they were willing both to give and receive them. The Macronis accordingly presented the Greeks with a barbarian lance, and the Greeks gave them a Grecian one, for they said that such were their usual pledges. Both parties called the gods to witness. After these mutual assurances, the Macronis immediately assisted them in cutting away the trees and made a passage for them as if to bring them over. Mingling freely among the Greeks, they also gave such facilities as they could for buying provisions and conducted them through their country for three days until they brought them to the confines of the Colchians. Here was a range of hills, high but accessible, and upon them the Colchians were drawn up in array. The Greeks at first drew up against them in a line, with the intention of marching up the hill in this disposition, but afterward the generals thought proper to assemble and deliberate how they might engage with the best effect. Xenophon then said it appeared to him that they ought to relinquish the arrangement in line and to dispose the troops in column. For a line, pursued he, will be broken at once, as we shall find the hills in some parts impassable though in others easy of access, and this disruption will immediately produce despondency in the man, when after being ranged in a regular line, they find it dispersed. Again, if we advance drawn up very many deep, the enemy will stretch beyond us on both sides, and will employ the parts that outreach us in any way they may think proper. And if we advance only a few deep, it would not be at all surprising if our line be broken through by showers of missiles and men falling upon us in large bodies. If this happen in any part, it will be ill for the whole extent of the line. I think then that having formed our companies in columns, 
we should keep them so far apart from each other as that the last companies on each side may be beyond the enemy's wings thus our extreme companies will both outflank the line of the enemy and as we march in file the bravest of our men will close with the enemy first and wherever the ascent is easiest there each division will direct its course nor will it be easy for the enemy to penetrate into the intervening spaces when there are companies on each side nor will it be easy to break through the column as it advances while if any one of the companies be hard pressed the neighboring one will support it and if but one of the companies can be can by any path attain the summit, the enemy will no longer stand their ground. This plan was approved, and they threw the companies into columns. Xenophon, riding along from the right wing to the left, said, Soldiers, the enemy whom you see before you is now the only obstacle to hinder us from being where we have long been eager to be. These, if we can, we must eat up alive. When the men were all in their places and they had formed the companies into columns, there were about eighty companies of heavy armed men, and each company consisted of about eighty men. The peltasts and archers they divided into three bodies, each about six hundred men, one of which they placed beyond the left wing, another beyond the right, and the third in the center. The generals then desired the soldiers to make their vows to the gods, and having made them and sung the paean, they moved forward. Chrysophus and Xenophon and the Peltasts that they had with them, who were beyond the enemy's flanks, pushed on, and the enemy, observing their motions and hurrying forward to receive them, was drawn off, some to the right and others to the left, and left a great void in the center of the line, when the Peltasts in the Arcadian division, whom Ascenes the Acarnanian commanded, seeing the Colchian separate ran forward in all haste thinking that they were taking to flight and these were the first that reached the summit the arcadian heavy armed troop of which clerner the archimenian was captain followed them but the enemy when once the greeks began to run no longer stood his ground but went off in flight some one way and some another having passed the summit the greeks encamped in a number of villages containing abundance of provisions. As to other things here, there was nothing at which they were, they were surprised. But the number of beehives was extraordinary, and, and all the soldiers that ate of the combs lost their senses, vomited, and were affected with purging. And not any of them was able to stand upright, such as had eaten a little were like men greatly intoxicated, and such as had eaten much were like madmen, and some like persons at the point of death. They lay upon the ground in consequence in great numbers as if there had been a defeat, and there was general dejection. The next day no one of them was found dead, and they recovered their senses about the same hour that they had lost them on the preceding day. And on the third and fourth days, they got up as if after having taken physic. From hence they proceeded two days' march, seven parasangs, and arrived at Terapizond, a Greek city of large population, on the Oxine Sea, a colony of Sinope, but lying in the territory of the Colchians. Here they stayed about thirty days, encamping in the villages of the Colchians, whence they made excursions and plundered the country of Colchis. The people of Terapizond provided a market for the Greeks in the camp, and entertained them in the city, and made them presents of oxen, barley meal, and wine. They negotiated with them also on behalf of the neighboring Colchians, those especially who dwelt in the plain, and from them too were brought presents of oxen. Soon after, they prepared to perform the sacrifice which they had vowed. Oxen enough had been brought them to offer to Jupiter the Preserver and to Hercules for their safe conduct, and whatever they had vowed to the other gods, they also celebrated gymnastic games upon the hill where they were encamped, and chose Dracontius, a Spartan who had become an exile from his country when quite a boy, for having involuntarily killed a child by striking him with a dagger, to prepare the course and preside the contests. When the sacrifice was ended, they gave the hides to Dracontius, 
and desired him to conduct them to the place where he had made the course. Dracontius, pointing to the place where they were standing, said, This hill is an excellent place for running, in whatever direction the man may wish. But how will they be able, said they, to wrestle on ground so rough and bushy? He that falls, said he, will suffer the more. Boys, most of them from among the prisoners, contented in the short course, and in the long course above sixty cretans ran, while others were mashed in wrestling, boxing, and to pancratium. It was a fine sight, for many entered the lists, and as their friends were spectators, there was great emulation. Horses also ran, and they had to gallop down the steep, and turning round in the sea, to come up against to the altar. In the descent many rolled down, but in the ascent against exceedingly steep ground the horses could scarcely get up at a walking pace. There was consequently great shouting and laughter and cheering from the people. End of section 8 Section 9 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botes. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Condemnation and Death of Socrates. B.C. 399 by Plato Part 1 The death of Socrates was brought about under the restored democracy by three of his enemies, Lycon, Meletus, and Anitus, the last a man of high rank and reputation in the state. Socrates was accused by them of despising the ancient gods of the state introducing new divinities and corrupting the youth of Athens. He was charged with having taught his followers, young men of the first Athenian families, to despise the established government, to be turbulent and seditious, and his accusers pointed to Alcibiades and Critias, notorious for their lawlessness, as examples of the fruits of his teaching. It is quite certain that Socrates disliked the Athenian government and considered democracy as tyrannical as despotism. But there was no law at Athens by which he could be put to death for his words and actions, and the vague charge could never have been made unless the whole trial of the philosopher had been a party movement headed by men like Lycon and Anitus, whose support of the unjust measure made the condemnation of Socrates a foregone conclusion. Xenophon, the pupil and admirer of the philosopher, expresses in his memorabilia of Socrates his surprise that the Athenians should have condemned to death a man of such exalted character and transparent innocence. But the influence of the teacher with his pupils, most of them sons of the wealthiest citizens, might well have been dreaded by those in office and engaged in the conduct of public business. By them, the common politicians of the day, Socrates, with his keen and witty criticism of political corruption and demagogism, must have been considered a formidable adversary. Accordingly, by the decision of the Athenian court, the philosopher was sentenced to death by drinking a cup of hemlock. Although it was usual for criminals to be executed the day following their condemnation, he enjoyed a respite of thirty days, during which time his friends had access to his prison cell. It was the time when the ceremonial galley was crowned and sent on her pilgrimage to the holy isle of Delos, and no criminal could be executed until her return. 
Socrates exhibited heroic constancy and cheerfulness during this interval, and repudiated the offers of his friends to aid in his escape, though they had chartered the ship to carry him to Thessaly. With calm composure, he reasoned on the immortality of the soul, and cheered his visitors with words of hope. The literary portraits of Socrates, furnished by himself, and the writings of Plato, are among the most precious monuments of antiquity, and the life and death of such a man form a memorable era in the moral and intellectual history of mankind. Plato, in his Phaedo, or The Immortality of the Soul, gives the following dialogue between Echecrates and Phaedo. Two friends and disciples of the late philosopher, evidently with no other purpose in view, than to lend to the account of the great teacher's last hours, and the last words his followers were to hear from his lips, the additional force and dramatic value of a personal narrative in the mouth of a loving pupil and an actual eyewitness of his death. Echecrates, were you personally present, Phaedo, with Socrates on that day when he drank the poison in prison, or did you hear an account of it from someone else? Phaedo, I was there myself, Echecrates. Echecrates, what then did he say before his death, and how did he die? For I should be glad to hear, for scarcely any citizen of Phlius ever visits Athens now, nor has any stranger for a long time come from thence, who was able to give us a clear account of the particulars, except that he died from drinking poison but he was unable to tell us anything more. Phaedo. And did you not hear about the trial, how it went off? Echecrates. Yes, someone told me this, and I wondered that it took place so long ago, he appears to have died long afterward. What was the reason of this, Phaedo? Phaedo. An accidental circumstance happened in his favor, Echecrates. For the poop of the ship, which the Athenians sent to Delos, chanced to be crowned on the day before the trial. Echecrates. But what is this ship? Phaedo. It is the ship, as the Athenians say, in which Theseus formerly conveyed the fourteen boys and girls to Crete, and saved both them and himself. They, therefore, made a vow to Apollo on that occasion, as it is said, that if they were saved, they would every year dispatch a solemn embassy to Delos, which from that time to the present they send yearly to the god. When they begin the preparations for this solemn embassy, they have a law, that the city shall be purified during this period, and that no public executions shall take place until the ship has reached Delos and returned to Athens. And this occasionally takes a long time, when the winds happen to impede their passage. The commencement of the embassy is when the priest of Apollo has crowned the poop of the ship, and this was done, as I said, on the day before the trial. On this account, Socrates had a long interval in prison between the trial and his death. Echecrates. And what, Phaedo, were the circumstances of his death, what was said and done, and who of his friends were with him, or would not the magistrates allow them to be present? But did he die destitute of friends? Phaedo. By no means, but some, indeed several, were present. Echecrates. Take the trouble, then, to relate to me all the particulars, as clearly as you can, unless you have any pressing business. Phaedo. I am at leisure, 
and will endeavor to give you a full account. For to call Socrates to mind, whether speaking myself or listening to someone else, is always most delightful to me. Echecrates, and indeed, Phaedo, you have others to listen to you who are of the same mind. However, endeavor to relate everything as accurately as you can. Phaedo, I was indeed wonderfully affected by being present, for I was not impressed with a feeling of pity, like one present at the death of a friend. For the man appeared to me to be happy, Echecrates, both from his manner and discourse, so fearlessly and nobly did he meet his death, so much so that it occurred to me that in going to Hades he was not going without a divine destiny, but that when he arrived there he would be happy, if anyone ever was. For this reason I was entirely uninfluenced by any feeling of pity, as would seem likely to be the case with one present on so mournful an occasion. Nor was I affected by pleasure from being engaged in philosophical discussions, as was our custom, for our conversation was of that kind. But an altogether unaccountable feeling possessed me, a kind of unusual mixture compounded of pleasure and pain together, when I considered that he was immediately about to die. And all of us who were present were affected in much the same manner, at one time laughing, at another weeping, one of us especially, Apollodorus, for you know the man and his manner. Echecrates, how should I not? Phaedo, he then was entirely overcome by these emotions, and I too was troubled, as well as the others. Echecrates, but who were present, Phaedo? Phaedo, of his fellow countrymen, this Apollodorus was present, and Critobulus and his father Crito. Moreover, Hermogenes, Epigenes, Eschines, and Antisthenes, Ctesippus the Pianian, Menexenus, and some other of his countrymen were also there. Plato, I think, was sick. Echecrates, were any strangers present? Phaedo, yes, Simias the Theban, Sebes, and Phedondes and from Megara, Euclides, and Terpsion. Echecrates, but what, were not Aristippus and Cleombrotus present? Phaedo, no, for they were said to be at Aegina. Echecrates, was anyone else there? Phaedo, I think that these were nearly all who were present. Echecrates, well now, what do you say was the subject of conversation? Phaedo, I will endeavor to relate the whole to you from the beginning. On the preceding days, I and the others were constantly in the habit of visiting Socrates, meeting early in the morning at the courthouse where the trial took place, for it was near the prison. Here, then, we waited every day till the prison was opened, conversing with each other, for it was not opened very early. But as soon as it was opened, we went in to Socrates, and usually spent a day with him. On that occasion, however, we met earlier than usual, for on the preceding day, when we left the prison in the evening, we heard that the ship had arrived from Delos. We therefore urged each other to come as early as possible to the accustomed place. Accordingly we came, and the porter, who used to admit us coming out, told us to wait, and not to enter until he called us. For he said, The eleven are now free in Socrates from his bonds, and announcing to him that he must die today. 
but in no long time he returned and bade us enter. When we entered, we found Socrates just freed from his bonds, and Santipe, you know her, holding his little boy and sitting by him. As soon as Santipe saw us, she wept aloud and said such things as women usually do on such occasions, as, Socrates, your friends will now converse with you for the last time, and you with them. But Socrates, looking toward Crito, said, Crito, let someone take her home. Upon which some of Crito's attendants led her away, wailing and beating herself. But Socrates, sitting up in bed, drew up his leg and rubbed it with his hand, and as he rubbed it said, What an unaccountable thing, my friends, that seems to be which men call pleasure. And how wonderfully is it related toward that which appears to be its contrary, pain, in that they will not both be present to a man at the same time. Yet, if anyone pursues and attains the one, he is almost always compelled to receive the other, as if they were both united together from one head. And it seems to me, he said, that if Aesop had observed this, he would have made a fable from it, how the deity, wishing to reconcile these warring principles, when he could not do so, united their heads together, and from hence whomsoever the one visits, the other attends immediately after, as appears to be the case with me, since I suffered pain in my leg before from the chain, but now pleasure seems to have succeeded. Hereupon Sebes, interrupting him, said, By Jupiter, Socrates, you have done well in reminding me. With respect to the poems which you made, by putting into meter those fables of Aesop and the hymn to Apollo, several other persons asked me, and especially Avenus recently, with what design you made them after you came here, whereas before you had never made any. If, therefore, you care at all that I should be able to answer Evanus when he asks me again, for I am sure he will do so, tell me what I must say to him. Tell him the truth, then, Sebes, he replied, that I did not make them from a wish to compete with him or his poems, for I knew that this would be no easy matter, but that I might discover the meaning of certain dreams and discharge my conscience. If this should happen to be the music which they have often ordered me to apply myself to, for they were to the following purport. Often in my past life the same dream visited me, appearing at different times in different forms, yet always saying the same thing. Socrates, it said, apply yourself to and practice music. And I formerly supposed that it exhorted and encouraged me to continue the pursuit I was engaged in, as those who cheer on racers, so that the dream encouraged me to continue the pursuit I was engaged in, namely to apply myself to music, since philosophy is the highest music, and I was devoted to it. But now, since my trial took place, and the festival of God retarded my death, it appeared to me that, if by any chance the dream so frequently enjoined me to apply myself to popular music, I ought not to disobey it, but do so for that it would be safer for me not to depart hence before I had discharged my conscience by making some poems in obedience to the dream. Thus, then I first of all composed a hymn to the God whose festival was present, and after the God, considering that a poet, if he means to be a poet, ought to make fables and not discourses, and knowing that I was not skilled in making fables, 
I therefore put into verse those fables of Aesop, which were at hand and were known to me, and which first occurred to me. Tell this then to Evanus, Sebes, and bid him farewell, and, if he is wise, to follow me as soon as he can. But I depart as it seems today, for so the Athenians order. To this Simeas said, What is this, Socrates, which you exhort Evanus to do? For I often meet with him, and from what I know of him, I am pretty certain that he will not at all be willing to comply with your advice. What then, said he, is not Evanus a philosopher? To me he seems to be so, said Simeas. Then he will be willing, rejoined Socrates, and so will every one who worthily engages in this study. Perhaps, indeed, he will not commit violence on himself, for that, they say, is not allowable. And as he said this, he let down his leg from the bed on the ground, and in this posture continued during the remainder of the discussion. Sebes then asked him, What do you mean, Socrates, by saying that it is not lawful to commit violence on one's self, but that a philosopher should be willing to follow one who is dying? What, Sebes, have not you and Simeas, who have conversed familiarly with Philolaus on this subject, heard? Nothing very clearly, Socrates. I, however, speak only from hearsay. What then I have heard, I have no scruple in telling. And perhaps it is most becoming for one who is about to travel there, to inquire and speculate about the journey thither, what kind we think it is. What else can one do in the interval before sunset? Why, then, Socrates, do they say that it is not allowable to kill oneself? For I, as you asked just now, have heard both Philolaus, when he lived with us, and several others say that it was not right to do this. But I never heard anything clear upon the subject from anyone. Then you should consider it attentively, said Socrates. For perhaps you may hear. Probably, however, it will appear wonderful to you, if this alone, of all other things, is an universal truth, and it never happens to a man, as is the case in all other things, that at some times, and to some persons only, it is better to die than to live. Yet that these men for whom it is better to die, this probably will appear wonderful to you, may not without impiety do this good to themselves, but must await another benefactor. Then Sebes, gently smiling, said, speaking in his own dialect, Jove be witness. And indeed, said Socrates, it would appear to be unreasonable, yet still perhaps it has some reason on its side. The maxim, indeed, given on this subject in the mystical doctrines, that we, men, are in a kind of prison, and that we ought not to free ourselves from it and escape, appears to me difficult to be understood, and not easy to penetrate. This, however, appears to me, Sebes, to be well said, that the gods take care of us, and that we, men, are one of their possessions. Does it not seem so to you? It does, replied Sebes. Therefore, said he, if one of your slaves were to kill himself without your having intimated that you wished him to die, should you not be angry with him, and should you not punish him if you could? Certainly, he replied. Perhaps then, in this point of view, it is not unreasonable to assert that a man ought not to kill himself 
before the deity lays him under a necessity of doing so, such as that now laid on me. This, indeed, said Sebes, appears to be probable. But what you said just now, Socrates, that philosophers should be very willing to die, appears to be an absurdity, if what we said just now is agreeable to reason, that it is God who takes care of us, and that we are his property. For that the wisest man should not be grieved at leaving that service in which they govern them, who are the best of all masters, namely the gods, is not consistent with reason. For surely he cannot think that he will take better care of himself when he has become free, but a foolish man might perhaps think thus, that he should fly from his master, and would not reflect that he ought not to fly from a good one, but should cling to him as much as possible, therefore he would fly against all reason. But a man of sense would desire to be constantly with one better than himself. Thus, Socrates, the contrary of what you just now said is likely to be the case. For it becomes the wise to be grieved at dying, but the foolish to rejoice. Socrates, on hearing this, appeared to me to be pleased with the pertinacity of Sebes, and looking toward us, said, Sebes, you see, always searches out arguments, and is not at all willing to admit at once anything one has said. Whereupon Simias replied, But indeed, Socrates, Sebes appears to me now to say something to the purpose. For with what design should men really wise fly from masters who are better than themselves and so readily leave them? And Sebes appears to me to direct his argument against you because you so easily endure to abandon both us and those good rulers, as you yourself confess, the gods. You speak justly, said Socrates, for I think you mean that I ought to make my defense to this charge, as if I were in a court of justice. Certainly, replied Simeas. Come then, said he. I will endeavor to defend myself more successfully before you than before the judges. For, he proceeded, Simeas and Sebes, if I did not think that I should go first of all among other deities who are both wise and good, and next among men who have departed this life better than any here, I should be wrong in not grieving at death. But now be assured, I hope to go among good men, though I would not positively assert it, that, however, I shall go among gods who are perfectly good masters. Be assured, I can positively assert this, if I can, anything of this kind. So that, on this account, I am not so much troubled, but I entertain a good hope that something awaits those who die, and that, as was said long since, it will be far better for the good than the evil. What then, Socrates, said Simeas, would you go away keeping this persuasion to yourself, or would you impart it with us? For this good appears to me to be also common to us, and at the same time it will be an apology for you if he can persuade us to believe what you say. I will endeavor to do so, he said. But first, let us attend to Crito here, and see what it is he seems to have for some time wished to say. What else, Socrates, said Crito, but what he who is to give you the poison told me some time ago, that I should tell you to speak as little as possible, for he says that men become too much heated by speaking, 
and that nothing of this kind ought to interfere with the poison, and that, otherwise, those who did so were sometimes compelled to drink two or three times. To which Socrates replied, Let him alone, and let him attend to his own business, and prepare to give it me twice, or, if occasion requires, even thrice. I was almost certain what you would say, answered Crito, but he has been some time pestering me. Never mind him, he rejoined. But now I wish to render an account to you, my judges, of the reason why a man who has really devoted his life to philosophy, when he is about to die, appears to me, on good grounds, to have confidence and to entertain a firm hope that the greatest good will befall him in the other world when he has departed this life. How, then, this comes to pass, Simias and Sebes, I will endeavor to explain. For as many as rightly apply themselves to philosophy seem to have left all others in ignorance, that they aim at nothing else than to die and be dead. If this, then, is true, it would surely be absurd to be anxious about nothing else than this during their whole life. But when it arrives, to be grieved at what they have been long anxious about and aimed at. End of section 9 Recording by Mike Botez Section 10 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. The Condemnation and Death of Socrates, B.C. 399, by Plato. Part 2. Upon this, Simia, smiling, said, By Jupiter, Socrates, though I am not now at all inclined to smile, you have made me do so, for I think that the multitude, if they heard this, would think it was very well said in reference to philosophers, and that our countrymen particularly would agree with you, that true philosophers do desire death, and that they are by no means ignorant that they deserve to suffer it. And indeed, Simias, they would speak the truth, except in asserting that they are not ignorant, for they are ignorant of the sense in which true philosophers desire to die, and in what sense they deserve death, and what kind of death. But, he said, let us take leave of them, and speak to one another. Do we think that death is anything? Certainly, replied Simeas. Is it anything else than the separation of the soul from the body? And is not this to die, for the body to be a part by itself, separated from the soul, and for the soul to subsist a part by itself, separated from the body? Is death anything else than this? No, but this, he replied. Consider then, my good friend, whether you are of the same opinion as me. For thus I think we shall understand better the subject we are considering. Does it appear to you to be becoming in a philosopher to be anxious about pleasures, as they are called, such as meats and drinks? By no means, Socrates, said Simias. But what about the pleasure of love? Not at all. What, then, does such a man appear to you to think other bodily indulgences of value. For instance, does he seem to you to value or despise 
the possession of magnificent garments and sandals and other ornaments of the body except so far as necessity compels him to use them the true philosopher he answered appears to me to despise them does not then he continued the whole employment of such a man appear to you to be not about the body but to separate himself from it as much as possible and be occupied about his soul it does first of all then in such matters does not the philosopher above all other men evidently free his soul as much as he can from communion with the body it appears so and it appears simias to the generality of man that he who takes no pleasure in such things and who does not use them does not deserve to live but that he nearly approaches to death who cares nothing for the pleasures that subsist through the body you speak very truly but what with respect to the acquisition of wisdom is the body an impediment or not if any one takes it with him as a partner in the search what i mean is this do sight and hearing convey any truth in men or are they such as the poets constantly sing who say that we neither hear nor see anything with accuracy if however these bodily senses are neither accurate nor clear much less can the others be so for they are all far inferior to these do they not seem so to you certainly he replied when then said he does the soul light on the truth for when it attempts to consider anything in conjunction with the body it is plain that it is then led astray by it you say truly must it not then be by reasoning if at all that any of the things that really are become known to it yes and surely the soul then reasons best when none of these things disturbs it neither hearing nor sight nor pain nor pleasure of any kind but it retires as much as possible within itself taking leave of the body and as far as it can not communicating or being in contact with it it aims at the discovery of that which is such is the case does not then the soul of the philosopher in these cases despise the body and flee from it and seek to retire within itself it appears so but what as to such things as this simias do we say that justice itself is something or nothing we say it is something by jupiter and that beauty and goodness are something how not now then have you ever seen anything of this kind with your eyes by no means he replied did you ever lay hold of them by any other bodily sense but i speak generally as of magnitude health strength and in a word of the essence of everything that is to say what each is is then the exact truth of these perceived by means of the body or is it thus whoever among us habituates himself to reflect most deeply and accurately on each several thing about which he is considering he will make the nearest approach to the knowledge of it certainly would not he then do this with the utmost purity who should in the highest degree approach each subject by means of the mere mental faculties neither employing the sight 
in conjunction with the reflective faculty, nor introducing any other sense together with reasoning, but who, using pure reflection by itself, should attempt to search out each essence purely by itself, freed as much as possible from the eyes and ears, and, in a word, from the whole body, as disturbing the soul and not suffering it to acquire truth and wisdom when it is in communion with it. Is not he the person, Simeas, if any one can, who will arrive at the knowledge of that which is? You speak with wonderful truth, Socrates, replied Simeas. Wherefore, he said, it necessarily follows from all this that some such opinion as this should be entertained by genuine philosophers, so that they should speak among themselves as follows. A bypath, as it were, seems to lead us on in our researches undertaken by reason, because as long as we are encumbered with the body, and our soul is contaminated with such an evil, we can never fully attain to what we desire. And this, we say, is truth. For the body subjects us to innumerable hindrances on account of its necessary support. And, moreover, if any diseases befall us, they impede us in our search after that which is. And it fills us with longings, desires, fears, all kinds of fancies, and a multitude of absurdities, so that, as it is said in real truth, by reason of the body it is never possible for us to make any advances in wisdom. For nothing else but the body and its desires occasions wars, seditions, and contests, for all wars among us arise on account of our desire to acquire wealth, and we are compelled to acquire wealth on account of the body, being enslaved to its service, and consequently on all these accounts we are hindered in the pursuit of philosophy. But the worst of all is that if it leaves us any leisure, and we apply ourselves to the consideration of any subject, it constantly obtrudes itself in the midst of our researches and occasions trouble and disturbance, and confounds us so that we are not able by reason of it to discern the truth. It has then in reality been demonstrated to us that if we are ever to know anything purely, we must be separated from the body and contemplate the things themselves by the mere soul. And then, as it seems, we shall obtain that which we desire, and which we profess ourselves to be the lovers of wisdom, when we are dead, as reason shows, but not while we are alive. For, if it is not possible to know anything purely in conjunction with a body, one of these two things must follow. Either that we can never acquire knowledge, or only after we are dead. For then the soul will subsist apart by itself, separate from the body, but not before. And while we live, we shall thus, as it seems, approach nearest to knowledge if we hold no intercourse or communion at all with the body, except what absolute necessity requires, nor suffer ourselves to be polluted by its nature, but purify ourselves from it until God himself shall release us. And thus being pure and freed from the folly of body, we shall in all likelihood be with others like ourselves and shall of ourselves know the whole real essence, and that, probably, is truth. For it is not allowable 
for the impure to attain to the pure. Such things, I think, Simeas, all true lovers of wisdom must both think and say to one another, does it not seem so to you? Most assuredly, Socrates. If this, then, said Socrates, is true, my friend, there is great hope for one who arrives where I am going, there, if anywhere, to acquire that perfection for the sake of which we have taken so much pains during our past life, so that the journey now appointed me is set out upon with good hope, and will be so by any other man who thinks that his mind has been, as it were, purified. This earth and the whole region here are decayed and corroded, as things in the sea by the saltness, for nothing of any value grows in the sea, nor, in a word, does it contain anything perfect, but there are caverns and sand and mud in abundance and filth in whatever parts of the sea there is earth, nor are they at all worthy to be compared with the beautiful things with us. But, on the other hand, those things in the upper regions of the earth would appear far more to excel the things with us. For, if we may tell a beautiful fable, it is well worth hearing, Simeas, what kind the things are on the earth beneath the heavens. Indeed, Socrates, said Simeas, we should be very glad to hear that fable. First of all, then, my friend, he continued, this earth, if anyone should survey it from above, is said to have the appearance of balls covered with twelve different pieces of leather, variegated and distinguished with colors, of which the colors found here and which painters use are, as it were, copies. But there the whole earth is composed of such, and far more brilliant and pure than these. For one part of it is purple, and of wonderful beauty, part of a golden color and part of white, more white than chalk or snow, and in like manner composed of other colors, and those more in number and more beautiful than any we have ever beheld. And those very hollow parts of the earth, though filled with water and air, exhibit a certain species of color, shining among the variety of other colors, so that one continually variegated aspect presents itself to the view. In this earth, being such, all things that grow, grow in a manner proportioned to its nature, trees, flowers, and fruits. And again, in like manner, its mountains and stones possesses, in the same proportion, smoothness and transparency, and more beautiful colors, of which the well-known stones here, that are so highly prized, are but fragments, such as sardine stones, jaspers, and emeralds, and all of that kind. But there, there is nothing subsists that is not of this character, and even more beautiful than these. But the reason of this is because the stones there are pure, and not eaten up and decayed, like those here, by rottenness and saltness, which flow down hither together, and which produce deformity and disease in the stones and the earth, and in other things, even animals and plants. But that earth is adorned with all these, and moreover with gold and silver, and other things of the kind, for they are naturally conspicuous, being numerous and large, and in all parts of the earth, so that to behold it 
is a site for the blessed. There are also many animals and men upon it, some dwelling in mid-earth, others about the air, as we do about the sea, and others in islands which the air flows round, and which are near the continent, and in one word, what water and the sea are to us for our necessities, the air is to them, and what air is to us, that ether is to them. But their seasons are of such a temperament that they are free from disease, and live for a much longer time than those here, and surpass us in sight, hearing, and smelling, and everything of this kind, as much as air excels water, and ether air in purity. Moreover, they have abodes and temples of the gods, in which gods really dwell, and voices and oracles, and sensible visions of the gods, and such like intercourse with them. The sun, too, and moon and stars are seen by them, such as they really are and their felicity in other respects is correspondent with these things. And such, indeed, is the nature of the whole earth and the parts about the earth. But there are many places all round it throughout its cavities, some deeper and more open than that in which we dwell, but others that are deeper have less chasm than in our region, and other are shallower in depth than they are here, and broader. But all these are in many places perforated, one into another, under the earth, some with narrower and some with wider channels, and have passages through, by which a great quantity of water flows from one into another, as into basins and there are immense bulks of ever-flowing rivers under the earth, both of hot and cold water, and a great quantity of fire, and mighty rivers of fire, and many of liquid mire, some purer and some more miry. As in Sicily, there are rivers of mud that flow before the lava, and the lava itself, and from these the several places are filled, according as the overflow from time to time happens to come to each of them. But all these move up and down, as it were by a certain oscillation existing in the earth. And this oscillation proceeds from such natural cause as this. One of the cousins of the earth is exceedingly large, and perforated through the entire earth, and is that which Homer speaks of, very far off, where is the most profound abyss beneath the earth, which elsewhere both he and many other poets have called Tartarus. For into this chasm all rivers flow together, and from it flow out again, but they severally derive their character from the earth through which they flow and the reason why all streams flow out from thence and flow into it is because this liquid has neither bottom nor base. Therefore it oscillates and fluctuates up and down, and the air and the wind around it do the same, for they accompany it both when it rushes to those parts of the earth and when to these and as in respiration the flowing breath is continually breathed out and drawn in. So there the wind, oscillating with the liquid, causes certain vehement and irresistible winds, both as it enters and goes out. When, therefore, the water rushing in descends to the place which we call the lower region, it flows through the earth into the streams there and fills them just as men pump up water. But when again it leaves those regions and rushes hither, 
it again fills the rivers here, and these, when filled, flow through channels and through the earth, and having severally reached the several places to which they are journeying, they make seas, lakes, rivers and fountains, then sinking again from thence beneath the earth, some of them having gone round longer and more numerous places, and others round fewer and shorter, they again discharge themselves into Tartarus, some much lower than they were drawn up, others only a little so, but all of them flow in again beneath the point at which they flowed out, and some issue out directly opposite the place by which they flow in, others on the same side. There are also some which having gone round altogether in a circle, fold in themselves once or several times round the earth like serpents, when they had descended as low as possible, discharge themselves again. And it is possible for them to descend on either side as far as the middle, but not beyond. For in each direction there is an acclivity to the streams both ways. Now, there are many other large and various streams, and among this great number there are four certain streams, of which the largest, and that which flows most outwardly round the earth, is called ocean, but directly opposite this, and flowing in a contrary direction, is Acheron, which flows through other desert places, and, moreover, passing under the earth, reaches the Acherusian lake, where the souls of most who die arrive, and having remained there for certain destined periods, some longer and some shorter, are again sent forth into the generations of animals. A third river issues midway between these, and near its source falls into a vast region burning with abundance of fire, and forms a lake larger than our sea, boiling with water and mud. From hence it proceeds in a circle, turbulent and muddy, and folding itself round it, reaches both, other places, and the extremity of the Acherusian lake, but does not mingle with its water, but folding itself oftentimes beneath the earth, it discharges itself into the lower parts of Tartarus, and this is the river which they call Pariflegaton, whose burning streams emit dissevered fragments in whatever part of the earth they happen to be. Opposite to this, again, the fourth river first falls into a place dreadful and savage, as it is said, having its whole color like cyanus. This they call Stygian, and the lake, which the river forms by its discharge, Styx. This river, having fallen in here, and received awful power in the water, sinking beneath the earth, proceeds folding itself round, in an opposite course, to Pariflegathon, and meets it in the Acherusian lake from a contrary direction. Neither does the water of this river mingle with any other, but it, too, having gone round in a circle, discharges itself into Tartarus, opposite to Pyriflegathon. Its name, as the poets say, is Cossetus. These things, being thus constituted, when the dead arrive at the place to which their demon leads them severally, First of all, they are judged, as well those who have lived well and piously, as those who have not. And those who appear to have passed a middle kind of life, proceeding to Acheron, and embarking in the vessels they have, on these arrive at the lake, and there dwell. And when they are purified, and have suffered punishment for the iniquities, they may have committed, they are set free, and each receives the reward of his good deeds according to his deserts. 
but those who appear to be incurable through the magnitude of their offenses, either from having committed many and great sacrileges, or many unjust and lawless murders, or other similar crimes, these a suitable destiny hurls into Tartarus, whence they never come forth. But those who appear to have been guilty of curable yet great offenses, such as those who through anger have committed any violence against father or mother, and have lived the remainder of their life in a state of penitence, or they who have committed homicides in a similar manner, these must of necessity fall into Tartarus. But after they have fallen, and have been there for a year, the wave casts them forth, the homicides into Cossitus, but the patricides and matricides into Pariflegethon. But when, being borne along, they arrive at the Acherusian lake, there they cry out to and invoke, some those whom they slew, others those whom they injured, and invoking them, they entreat and implore them to suffer them, to go out into the lake and to receive them, and if they persuade them, they go out and are freed from their suffering, but if not, they are borne back to Tartarus, and thence again to the rivers, and they do not cease from suffering this until they have persuaded those whom they have injured, for this sentence was imposed on them by the judges. But those who are found to have lived an eminently holy life, these are they who, being freed and set at large from these regions in the earth, as from a prison, arrive at the pure abode above, and dwell on the upper parts of the earth. And among these, they who have sufficiently purified themselves by philosophy, shall live without bodies, throughout all future time, and shall arrive at habitations yet more beautiful than these, which it is neither easy to describe, nor at present is there sufficient time for the purpose. But for the sake of these things which we have described, we should use every endeavor, Simias, so as to acquire virtue and wisdom in this life, for the reward is noble and the hope great. To affirm positively, indeed, that these things are exactly as I have described them, does not become a man of sense. That, however, either this or something of the kind takes place with respect to our souls and their habitations, since our soul is certainly immortal. This appears to me most fitting to be believed, and worthy the hazard for one who trusts in its reality. For the hazard is noble, and it is right to allure ourselves with such things as with enchantments, for which reason I have prolonged my story to such a length. On account of these things, then, a man ought to be confident about his soul, who during this life has disregarded all the pleasures and ornaments of the body as foreign from his nature, and who, having thought that they do more harm than good, has zealously applied himself to the acquirement of knowledge, and who, having adorned his soul, not with a foreign, but its own proper ornament, temperance, justice, fortitude, freedom, and truth, thus waits for his passage to Hades, as one who is ready to depart whenever destiny shall summon him. You then, he continued, Simeas and Sebes, and the rest, will each of you depart at some future time, but now destiny summons me, as a tragic writer would say, and it is nearly time for me 
to betake myself to the bath, for it appears to me to be better to drink the poison after I have bathed myself, and not to trouble the women with washing my dead body. End of section 10 Recording by Mike Botez Section 11 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. The Condemnation and Death of Socrates, B.C. 399, by Plato. Part 3. When he had thus spoken, Crito said, So be it, Socrates, but what commands have you to give to these or to me, either respecting your children or any other matter? in attending to which we can most oblige you. What I always say, Crito, he replied, nothing new, that by taking care of yourselves you will oblige both me and mine and yourselves. Whatever you do, though, you should not now promise it. But if you neglect yourselves and will not live as it were, in the footsteps of what has been now and formerly said, even though you should promise much at present, and that earnestly, you will do no good at all. We will endeavor then so to do, he said. But how shall we bury you? Just as you please, he said, if only you can catch me, and I do not escape from you and at the same time smiling gently and looking round on us, he said, I cannot persuade Crito, my friends, that I am that Socrates who is now conversing with you, and who methodizes each part of the discourse, but he thinks that I am he whom he will shortly behold dead, and asks how he should bury me, but that which I sometimes since argued at length, that when I have drunk the poison I shall no longer remain with you, but shall depart to some happy state of the blessed. This I have seemed to have urged to him in vain, though I meant at the same time to console both you and myself. Be ye then my sureties to Crito, he said in an obligation contrary to that which he made to the judges, for he undertook that I should remain. But do you be sure it is that when I die I shall not remain, but shall depart, that Crito may more easily bear it, and when he sees my body either burnt or buried, may not be afflicted for me, nor say at my interment that Socrates is laid out, or is carried out, or is buried. For be well assured, he said, most excellent Crito, that to speak improperly is not only culpable as to the thing itself, but likewise occasions some injury to our souls. You must have a good courage, then, and say that you bury my body and bury it in such a manner as is pleasing to you, and as you think is most agreeable to our laws. When he had said thus, he rose, and went into a chamber to bathe, and Crito followed him, but he directed us to wait for him. We waited, therefore, conversing among ourselves about what had been said, and considering it again, and sometimes speaking about our calamity, how severe it would be to us, sincerely thinking that, like those who are deprived of a father, we should pass the rest of our life as orphans. 
when he had bathed and his children were brought to him, for he had two little sons and one grown up, and the women belonging to his family were come, having conversed with them in the presence of Crito, and given them such injunctions as he wished, he directed the women and children to go away, and then returned to us. And it was now near sunset, for he spent a considerable time within. But when he came from bathing, he sat down, and did not speak much afterward. Then the officer of the eleven came in, and standing near him said, Socrates, I shall not have to find that fault with you that I do with others, that they are angry with me and curse me, when, by order of the archons, I bid them drink the poison. But you, on all other occasions during the time you have been here, I have found to be the most noble, meek, and excellent man of all that ever came into this place. And therefore I am now well convinced that you will not be angry with me, for you know who are to blame, but with them. Now then, for you know what I came to announce to you, farewell, and endeavor to bear what is inevitable as easy as possible. And at the same time, bursting into tears, he turned away and withdrew. And Socrates, looking after him, said, And though too, farewell, we will do as you direct. At the same time, turning to us, he said, How courteous the man is! During the whole time I have been here, he has visited me and conversed with me sometimes, and proved the worthiest of men. And now how generously he weeps for me. But come, Crito, let us obey him, and let someone bring the poison, if it is ready pounded. But if not, let the man pound it. Then Crito said, But I think, Socrates, that the sun is still on the mountains and has not yet set. Besides, I know that others have drunk the poison very late, after it had been announced to them, and have supped and drunk freely and some even have enjoyed the object of their love. Do not hasten, then, for there is yet time. Upon this Socrates replied, These men whom you mention, Crito, do these things with good reason, for they think they shall gain by so doing, and I too, with good reason, shall not do so, for I think I shall gain nothing by drinking a little later except to become ridiculous to myself, in being so fond of life and sparing of it when none any longer remains. Go then, he said, obey, and do not resist. Crito, having heard this, nodded to the boy that stood near, and the boy, having gone out and stayed for some time, came bringing with him the man that was to administer the poison who brought it ready-pounded in a cup. And Socrates, on seeing the man, said, Well, my good friend, as you are skilled in these matters, what must I do? Nothing else, he replied. Then, when you have drunk it, walk about until there is a heaviness in your legs, then lie down. Thus it will do its purpose and at the same time he held out the cup to Socrates. And he, having received it very cheerfully, Echecrates, neither trembling nor changing at all in color or countenance, but, as he was wont, looking steadfastly at the man, said, What say you of this potion, with respect to making libation to any one? Is it lawful or not? We only pound so much, Socrates, he said, as we think sufficient to drink. I understand you, he said, but it is certainly both lawful and right to pray to the gods that my departure hence thither may be happy, which therefore I pray, and so may it be.
and as he said this, he drank it off readily and calmly. Thus far, most of us were with difficulty able to restrain ourselves from weeping. But when we saw him drinking, and having finished the draft, we could do so no longer. But in spite of myself, the tears came in full torrent, so that, covering my face, I wept for myself. For I did not weep for him, but for my own fortune, in being deprived of such a friend. But Crito, even before me, when he could not restrain his tears, had risen up. But Apollodorus, even before this, had not ceased weeping, and, then bursting into an agony of grief, weeping and lamenting, he pierced the heart of everyone present, except Socrates himself. But he said, What are you doing, my admirable friends? I indeed, for this reason chiefly, sent away the women, that they might not commit any folly of this kind. For I have heard that it is right to die with good omens. Be quiet, therefore, and bear up. When we have heard this, we were ashamed and restrained our tears. But he, having walked about, when he said that his legs were growing heavy, lay down on his back, for the man so directed him. And at the same time, he who gave him the poison, taking hold of him after a short interval, examined his feet and legs, and then, having pressed his foot hard, he asked if he felt it. He said that he did not. And after this he pressed his thighs, and thus going higher, he showed us that he was growing cold and stiff. Then Socrates touched himself and said that when the poison reached his heart, he should then depart. But now the parts around the lower belly were almost cold. When uncovering himself, for he had been covered over, he said, and they were his last words, Crito, we owe cock to Esculapius, pay it, therefore, and do not neglect it. It shall be done, said Crito, but consider whether you have anything else to say. To this question he gave no reply, but shortly after he gave a convulsive movement, and the man covered him, and his eyes were fixed, and Crito, perceiving it, closed his mouth and eyes. This, Echecrates, was the end of our friend, a man, as we may say, the best of all his time that we have known, and, moreover, the most wise and just. End of section 11 Recording by Mike Botez Section 12 Of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Botez The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 Edited by Charles F. Horn Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd Brennus Burns Rome B.C. 388 Bartold Georg Nibur Part 1 Julius Caesar is the first writer who gives us an authentic and enlightening account on the Gauls, whom he divided in three groups. The Gauls were the chief branch of the great original stock of Celts, they were nomadic people, and from their home in Western Europe, they spread to Britain, invaded Spain, and swarmed over the Alps into Italy. And it is from the latter event that this tall, fair, and fighting nation first came into the region of history. Before the Gauls had come within the borders of Italy, Camillus, the dictator, 
had dealt the death blow to the Etruscan League. Through his capture and destruction of his stronghold, Vei. But at the very summit of his triumph, he lost the grace of his countrymen by demanding a tenth of their spoil taken at Vei, and which he claimed to have vowed to Apollo. It was popularly considered a ruse to increase his private fortune. Furthermore, a counterclaim was brought against him for appropriating bronze gates, which in Rome at that time were nothing less than actual money, bronze being the medium of currency. Camillus went into exile in consequence of the accusation. His parting prayer was that his country might feel his need and call him back. His desire was fulfilled, for soon after the goal was at the gates under the leadership of the haughty Brennus, who had come upon the Romans at a most opportune moment. This event of the overthrow of the Romans on the Aelia has been the occasion for the well-known tale of the cackling of the geese in the temple of Juno, which alarmed the garrison. The episode also gave rise to the saying of the conqueror, Brennus, who, when reproached by his antagonists with using false weights, cast his sword into the scale, crying, Woe to the conquered! At that time, no Roman foresaw the calamity which was threatening the empire. Rome had become great because the country which she had conquered was weak through its oligarchical institutions. The subjects of the other states gladly joined the Romans because under them their lot was more favorable, and probably because they were kindred nations. But matters went with the Romans as they did with Basilius, who subdued the Armenians when they were threatened by the Turks, and who soon after attacked the whole Greek Empire and took away far more than had been gained before. The expedition of the Gauls into Italy must be regarded as a migration, and not as an invasion for the purpose of conquest. As for the historical account of it, we must adhere to Polybius and Diodorus, who place it shortly before the taking of Rome by the Gauls. We can attach no importance to the statement of Livy, that they had come into Italy as early as the time of Tarquinius Priscus, having been driven from their country by a famine. It undoubtedly arose from the fact that some Greek writer, perhaps Timaeus, connected this migration with the settlement of the Phocians at Massilia. It is possible that Livy even here made use of Dionysius, and that the latter followed Timaeus. For, as Livy made use of Dionysius in the eighth book, why not also in the fifth? He himself knew very little of Greek history, but Justin's account is here evidently opposed to Livy. Trogus Pompeius was born in the neighborhood of Massilia, and in writing his 43rd book, he obviously made use of native chronicles, for from no other source could he derive the account of the Decreta Honorifica of the Romans to Massilians for the friendship which the latter has shown to the Romans during the Gallic War. And from the same source must he have obtained his information about the maritime wars of Massilia against Carthage. Trogus knows nothing of the story that the Gauls assisted the Phocians on their arrival, but according to him they met with a kind of reception among the Ligurians, who continued to inhabit those parts for a long time after. Even the story of the Lucumo, who is said to have invited the Gauls, is opposed to him, and if it were referred to Clusium alone, it would be absurd. Polybius places the passage of the Gauls across the Alps about 10 or 20 years before the taking of Rome, and Diodorus describes them as advancing toward Rome 
by an uninterrupted march. It is further stated that Melpum, in the country of the Ensubrians, was destroyed on the same day as Vei. Without admitting this coincidence, we have no reason to doubt that the statement is substantially true, and it is made by Cornelius Nepos, who, as a native of Gallia Transpadana, might possess accurate information, and whose chronological accounts were highly esteemed by the Romans. There was no other passage for the Gauls, except either across the little Saint Bernard, or across the Simplon. It is not probable that they took the former road, because their country extended only as far as the Ticinus, and if they had come across the little Saint Bernard, they would naturally have occupied also all the country between that mountain and the Ticinus. The Salasi may indeed have been a Gaelic people, but it is by no means certain. Moreover, between them and the Gauls who had come across the Alps, the Levi also lived, and there can be no doubt that at that time Ligurians still continued to dwell on the Ticinus. Melpum must have been situated in the district of Milan. The latter place has an uncommonly happy situation. Often as it has been destroyed, it has always been restored, so that it is not impossible that Melpum may have been situated on the very spot afterward occupied by Milan. The Gaelic migration undoubtedly passed by like a torrent, with irresistible rapidity. How, then, is it possible to suppose that Melpum resisted them for two centuries, or that they conquered it and yet did not disturb the Etruscans for two hundred years? It would be absurd to believe it, merely to save an uncritical expression of Livy. According to the common chronology, the Tribali, who in the time of Herodotus inhabited the plains and were afterward expelled by the Gauls, appeared in Thrace twelve years after the taking of Rome. According to a more correct chronology, it was only nine years after that event. It was the same movement, assuredly, which led the Gauls to the countries through which the middle course of the Danube extends, and to the Po. And could the people who came in a few days from Clusium to Rome, and afterward appeared in Apulia, have been sitting quiet in a corner of Italy for two hundred years? If they had remained there because they had not the power to advance, they would have been cut to pieces by the Etruscans. We must therefore look upon it as an established fact that the migration took place at the late period mentioned by Polybius and Diodorus. These Gauls were partly Celts and partly, indeed principally, Belge or Cymri, as may be perceived from the circumstance that their king, as well as the one who appeared before Delphi, is called Brennus. Brennin, according to Adelang, in his Mithridates, signifies in the language of Wales and Lower Brittany, a king. But what caused the whole emigration? The statement of Livy that the Gauls were compelled by famine to leave their country is quite in keeping with the nature of all traditions about migrations, such as we find them in Saxo Grammaticus, in Paul Wernefried, from the sagas of the Swedes, in the Tyrannian traditions of Lydia, and others. However, in the case of a people like the Celts, every specific statement of this kind, in which even the names of their leaders are mentioned, is of no more value than the traditions of other barbarous nations, which were unacquainted with the art of writing. It is indeed well known that the Celts in writing use the Greek alphabet, but they probably employed it only in the transactions of daily life, 
for we know that they were not allowed to commit their ancient songs to writing. During the Gaelic migration, we are again made aware how little we know of the history of Italy generally. Our knowledge is limited to Rome, so that we are in the same predicament there as if of all the historical authorities of the whole German Empire, we had nothing but the annals of a single imperial city. According to Livy's account, it would seem as if the only object of the Gauls had been to march to Rome, and yet this immigration changed the whole aspect of Italy. After the Gauls had once crossed the Apennines, there was no further obstacle to prevent their marching to the south of Italy by any road they pleased, and it is in fact mentioned that they did proceed farther south. The Umbrians still inhabited the country on the lower Po, in the modern Romania and Urbino, parts of which were occupied by Liburnians. Polybius says that many people there became tributary to the Gauls, and that this was the case of the Umbrians is quite certain. The first historical appearance of the Gauls is at Clusium, whither a noble Clusine is said to have invited them for the purpose of taking vengeance on his native city. Whether this account is true, however, must remain undecided. And if there is any truth in it, it is more probable that the offended Clusine went across the Apennines and fetched his avengers. Clusium has not been mentioned since the time of Porsena. The fact of the Clusines soliciting the aid of Rome is a proof how little that northern city of Etruria was concerned about the fate of the southern towns, and makes us even suspect that it was allied with Rome. However, the danger was so great that all jealousy must have been suppressed. The natural road for the Gauls would have been along the Adriatic, then through the country of Umbrians, who were tributary to them, and already quite broken down, and thence through the Romagna across the Apennines. But the Apennines which separate Tuscany from the Romagna are very difficult to cross, especially for sumpter horses, as therefore the Gauls could not enter Etruria on that side, which the Etruscans had intentionally allowed to grow wild. And as they had been convinced of this in an unsuccessful attempt, they crossed the Apennines in the neighborhood of Clusium and appeared before that city. Clusium was the great bulwark of the valley of the Tiber, and if it were taken, the roads along the Tiber and the Arno would be open, and the Gauls might reach Arezzo from the rear. The Romans, therefore, looked upon the fate of Clusium as decisive of their own. The Clusines sued for a treaty with the mighty city of Rome, and the Romans were wise enough readily to accept the offer. They sent ambassadors to the Gauls, ordering them to withdraw. According to a very probable account, the Gauls had demanded of the Clusines a division of their territory as the condition of peace, and not as was customary with the Romans as a tax upon a people already subdued. If this is correct, the Romans sent the embassy, confiding in their own strength, but the Gauls scorned the ambassadors, and the latter, allowing themselves to be carried away by their warlike disposition, joined the Etruscans in a fight against the Gauls. This was probably only an insignificant and isolated engagement. Such is the account of Livy, who goes on to say that the Gauls, as soon as they perceived this violation in the law of nations, gave the signal for a retreat, and, having called upon the gods to avenge the wrong, marched against Rome. This is evidently a mere fiction, for a barbarous nation 
like the Gauls, cannot possibly have had such ideas. Nor was there in reality any violation of the law of nations, as the Romans stood in no kind of connection with the Gauls. But it was a natural feeling with the Romans to look upon the fall of their city as the consequence of an ephas which no human power could resist. Roman vanity also is at work here, inasmuch as the Roman ambassadors are said to have so distinguished themselves that they were recognized by the barbarians among the hosts of Etruscans. Now, according to another tradition directly opposed to these statements, the Gauls sent to Rome to demand the surrender of those ambassadors. As the Senate was hesitating and left the decision to the people, the latter not only rejected the demand, but appointed the same ambassadors to the office of military tribunes, whereupon the Gauls with all their forces at once marched towards Rome. Livy here again speaks of the populace as the people to whom the Senate left the decision. This must have been the patricians only, for they alone had the right to decide upon the fate of the members of their own order. It is not fair to accuse the Romans on that occasion of dishonesty, but this account assuredly originated with later writers, who transferred to barbarians the right belonging to a nation standing in a legal relation to another. The statement that the three ambassadors, all of whom were Fabi, were appointed military tribunes, is not even the usual one, for there is another in Diodorus, who must here have used Roman authorities written in Greek, that is, Fabius, since he calls the Kerites Greek Keri and not Greek Agulei. He speaks of a single ambassador, who, being a son of a military tribune, fought against the Gauls. This is at least a sign how uncertain history yet is. The battle on the Alia was fought on the 16th of July. The military tribunes entered upon their office on the 1st of that month, and the distance between Clusium and Rome is only three good days' marches. It is impossible to restore the true history, but we can discern what is fabulous from what is really historical. An innumerable host of Gauls now march from Clusium toward Rome. For a long time the Gauls were most formidable to the Romans, as well as to all other nations with whom they came in contact even as far east as the Ukraine. As to Rome, we see this as late as the Cisalpine War of the Year, AU 527. Polybius and Diodorus are our best guides in seeking for information about the manners of the Gauls, for in the time of Caesar they had already become changed, in the description of their persons, we partly recognize the modern Gael, or the inhabitants of the highlands of Scotland. Huge bodies, blue eyes, bristly hair. Even their dress and armor are those of the highlanders, for they wore the checked and variegated tartans. Their arms consisted of the broad, unpointed battle sword, the same weapon as the claymore among the highlanders. They had a vast number of horns, which were used in the highlands for many centuries after, and threw themselves upon the enemy in immense irregular masses with terrible fury, those standing behind impelling those stationed in front whereby they became irresistible by the tactics of those times. The Romans ought to have used against them their phalanx and doubled it, until they were accustomed to this enemy, and were enabled by their greater skill to
to repel them. If the Romans had been able to withstand their first shock, the Gauls would have easily been thrown into disorder and put to flight. The Gauls, who were subsequently conquered by the Romans, were the descendants of such as were born in Italy and had lost much of their courage and strength. The Goths under Vitiges, not fifty years after the immigration of Theodoric in Italy, were cowards and unable to resist the twenty thousand men of Belisarius, showing how easily barbarians degenerate in such climates. The Gauls, moreover, were terrible on account of their inhuman cruelty, for wherever they settled, the original towns and their inhabitants completely disappeared from the face of the earth. In their own country, they had the feudal system and a priestly government. The Druids were their only rulers, who avenged the oppressed people on the lords, but in their turn became tyrants. All the people were in the condition of serfs, a proof that the Gauls, in their own country too, were the conquerors who had subdued an earlier population. We always find mention of the wealth of the Gauls in gold. And yet France has no rivers that carry gold sand, and the Pyrenees were then no longer in their possession. The gold must therefore have been obtained by barter. Much may be exaggeration, and the fact of some noble individuals wearing gold chains was probably transferred by ancient poets to the whole nation, since popular poetry takes great liberty, especially in such embellishments. End of section 12《セクション13 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. Brennus burns Rome, B.C. 388, by Bartold Georg Niebuhr, Part Two. Pliny states that previous to the Gallic calamity, the census amounted to 150,000 persons, which probably refers only to men entitled to vote in the assemblies. And does not comprise women, children, slaves, and strangers. If this be correct, the number of citizens was enormous, but it must not be supposed to include the inhabitants of the city only, the population of which was doubtless much smaller. The statement of Diodorus that all men were called to arms to resist the Gauls, and that the number amounted to forty thousand. Is by no means improbable, according to the testimony of Polybius. Latins and Hernicans also were enlisted. Another account makes the Romans take the field against the Gauls with twenty-four thousand men, that is, with four field legions and four civic legions. The field legions were formed only of plebeians. And served according to the order of the classes, probably in maniples. The civic legions contained all those who belonged neither to the patricians nor to the plebeians, that is, all the aerarii, proletarii, freedmen, and artisans, who had never before faced an enemy. They were certainly not armed with a pilum. Nor drawn up in maniples, but used pikes and were employed in phalanxes. Now, as for the field legions, each consisted half of Latins and half of Romans. 
there being in each maniple one century of Roman and one of Latins. There were at that time four legions, and as a legion, including the reserve troops, contained 3,000 men, the total is 12,000. Now, the account which mentions 24,000 men must have presumed that there were four field legions and four irregular civic ones. There would accordingly have been no more than 6,000 plebeians. And, even if the legions were all made up of Romans, only 12,000. If in addition to these we take 12,000 irregular troops and 16,000 allies, the number of 40,000 would be completed. In this case, the population of Rome would not have been as large as that of Athens in the Peloponnesian War, and this is indeed very probable. The cavalry is not included in this calculation, but 40,000 must be taken as the maximum of the whole army. There seems to be no exaggeration in this statement. And the battle on the Alia, speaking generally, is an historical event. It is surprising that the Romans did not appoint a dictator to command in the battle. It cannot be said, indeed, that they regarded this war as an ordinary one, for in that case they would not have raised so great a force. But they cannot have comprehended the danger in all its greatness. New swarms continue to come across the Alps. The Senons also now appear to seek habitations for themselves. They, like the Germans in after times, demanded land, as they found the Insubrians, Boyans and others already settled. The latter had taken up their abode in Umbria, but only until they should find a more extensive and suitable territory. The Romans committed the great mistake of fighting with their hurriedly collected troops a battle against an enemy who had hitherto been invincible. The hills along which the right wing is said to have been drawn up are no longer discernible, and they were probably nothing but little mounds of earth. At any rate, it was senseless to draw up a long line against the immense mass of enemies. The Gauls, on the other hand, were enabled without any difficulty to turn off to the left. They proceeded to a higher part of the river, where it was more easily fordable, and with great prudence threw themselves with all their force upon the right wing, consisting of the civic legions. The latter at first resisted, but not long and when they fled, the whole remaining line, which until then seems to have been useless and inactive, was seized with a panic. Terror preceded the Gauls as they laid waste everything on their way, and this paralyzed the courage of the Romans. Instead of rousing them to a desperate resistance, the Romans, therefore, were defeated on the Alia, in the most inglorious manner. The Gauls had taken them in their rear and cut off their return to Rome. A portion fled toward the Tiber, where some effected a retreat across the river, and others were drowned. Another part escaped into the forest. The loss of life must have been prodigious, and it is inconceivable how Livy could have attached so much importance to the mere disgrace. If the Roman army had not been almost annihilated, it would not have been necessary to give up the defense of the city, as was done, for the city was left undefeated and deserted by all. Many fled to Veii instead of returning to Rome. Only a few who had escaped along the high road entered the city by the Colin Gate. Rome was exhausted, her power shattered, her legions defenseless, and her warlike allies had partly been beaten in the same battle.
and were partly awaiting the fearful enemy in their own countries. At Rome it was believed that the whole army was destroyed, for nothing was known of those who had reached Vei. In the city itself there were only old men, women and children, so that there was no possibility of defending it. It is, however, inconceivable that the gates should have been left open, and that the Gauls, from the fear of a stratagem, should have encamped for several days outside the gates. A more probable account is that the gates were shut and barricaded. We may form a vivid conception of the condition of Rome after this battle, by comparing it with that of Moscow before the conflagration. The people were convinced that a long defense was impossible, since there was probably a want of provisions. Livy gives a false notion of the evacuation of the city, as if the defenseless citizens had remained immovable in their consternation, and only a few had been received into the capital. The determination, in fact, was to defend the capital, and the tribune Sulpicius had taken refuge there, with about one thousand men. There was on the capital an ancient well which still exists, and without which the garrison would soon have perished. This well remained unknown to all antiquaries, till I discovered it by means of information gathered from the people who lived there. Its depth in the rock descends to the level of the Tiber, but the water is now not fit to drink. The capital was a rock which had been hewn steep, and thereby made inaccessible, but a clevus closed by gates both below and above, led up from the Forum and the Sacred Way. The rock, indeed, was not so steep as in later times, as is clear from the account of the attempt to storm it, but the capital was nevertheless very strong. Whether some few remained in the city, as at Moscow, who in their stupefaction did not consider what kind of enemy they had before them, cannot be decided. The narrative is very beautiful and reminds us of the taking of the Acropolis of Athens by the Persians, where, likewise, the old men allowed themselves to be cut down by the Persians. Notwithstanding the improbability of the matter, I am inclined to believe that a number of aged patricians, their number may not be exactly historical, sat down in the forum, in their official robes, on their curule chairs, and that the chief pontiff devoted them to death. Such devotions are a well-known Roman custom. It is certainly not improbable that the Gauls were amazed when they found the city deserted and only those old men sitting immovable, that they took them for statues or supernatural visions, and did nothing to them, until one of them struck a goal who touched him, whereupon all were slaughtered. To commit suicide was repugnant to the customs of the Romans, who were guided in many things by feelings more correct and more resembling our own than many other ancient nations. The old men, indeed, had given up the hope of their country being saved, but the capital might be maintained, and the survivors preferred dying in the attempt of self-defense to taking refuge at Vei, where, after all, they could not have maintained themselves in the end. The sacred treasures were removed to Cere, and the hope of the Romans now was that the barbarians would be tired of the long siege. Provisions, for a time, had been conveyed to the capital, where a couple of thousand men may have been assembled, and where all buildings, temples, as well as public and private houses were used as habitations. 
the Gauls made fearful havoc at Rome, even more fearful than the Spaniards and Germans did in the year 1527. Soldiers plunder, and when they find no human beings, they engage in the work of destruction. And fires break out, as at Moscow, without the existence of any intention to cause a conflagration. The whole city was changed into a heap of ashes, with the exception of a few houses on the Palatine, which were occupied by the leaders of the Gauls. It is astonishing to find, nevertheless, that a few monuments of the preceding period, such as statues, situated at some distance from the capital, are mentioned as having been preserved. But we must remember that Travertino is tolerably fireproof. That Rome was burned down is certain, and when it was rebuilt, not even the ancient streets were restored. The Gauls were now encamped in the city. At first they attempted to storm the Clivus, but were repelled with great loss, which is surprising, since we know that at an earlier time the Romans succeeded in storming it against Appius Herdonius. Afterward they discovered the footsteps of a messenger who had been sent from Veii, in order that the state might be taken care of in due form. For the Romans in the capital were patricians, and represented the curies and the government, whereas those assembled at Veii represented the tribes but had no leaders. The latter had resolved to recall Camillus and raise him to the dictatorship. For this reason Pontius Comenius had been sent to Rome to obtain the sanction of the Senate and the Curies. This was quite in the spirit of the ancient times. If the Curies had interdicted him aqua et igni, they alone could recall him, if they previously obtained a resolution of the Senate authorizing them to do so. But if he had gone into voluntary exile, and had given up his Roman franchise by becoming a citizen of Ardea, before a sentence had been passed upon him by the centuries, it was again in the power of the curies alone, he being a patrician, to recall him as a citizen, and otherwise he could not have become a dictator, nor could he have regarded himself as such. It was the time of the dog days when the Gauls came to Rome, and as the summer at Rome is always pestilential, especially during the two months and a half before the 1st of September, the unavoidable consequence must have been, as Livy relates, that the barbarians, bivouacking on the ruins of the city in the open air, were attacked by disease and carried off like the army of Frederick Barbarossa when encamped before the castle of St. Angelo. The whole army of the Gauls, however, was not in the city, but only as many as were necessary to blockade the garrison of the capital. The rest were scattered far and wide over the face of the country and were ravaging all the unprotected places and isolated farms in Latium. Many an ancient town which is no longer mentioned after this time may have been destroyed by the Gauls. None but fortified places like Ostia, which could obtain supplies by sea, made a successful resistance, for the Gauls were unacquainted with the art of besieging. The Ardeatans, whose territory was likewise invaded by the Gauls, opposed them, under the command of Camillus. The Etruscans would seem to have endeavored to avail themselves of the opportunity of recovering Veii, for we are told that the Romans at Veii, commanded by Caditius, gained a battle against them, and that, encouraged by this success, 
they began to entertain a hope of regaining Rome, since by this victory they got possession of arms. A Roman of the name of Fabius Dorso is said to have offered up, in broad daylight, a gentilician sacrifice on the Quirinal, and the astonished Gauls are said to have done him no harm, a tradition which is not improbable. The provisions in the capital were exhausted, but the Gauls themselves, being seized with epidemic diseases, became tired of their conquests, and were not inclined to settle in a country so far away from their own home. They once more attempted to take the capital by storm, having observed that the messenger from Vei had ascended the rock, and came down again near the Porta Carmentalis, below Araceli. The ancient rock is now covered with rubbish and no longer discernible. The besieged did not think of a storm on that side. It may be that, formerly, there had in that part been a wall, which had become decayed, and in southern countries an abundant vegetation always springs up between the stones. And if this had actually been neglected, it cannot have been very difficult to climb up. The Gauls had already gained a firm footing. As there was no wall at the top, the rock which they stormed was not the Tarpeian, but the Arx. When Manlius, who lived there, was aroused by the screaming of the geese, he came to the spot and thrust down those who were climbing up. This rendered the Gauls still more inclined to commence negotiations. They were, moreover, called back by an inroad of some Alpine tribes into Lombardy, where they left their wives and children. They offered to depart if the Romans would pay them a ransom of a thousand pounds of gold, to be taken, no doubt, from the Capitoline treasury. Considering the value of money at that time, the sum was enormous. In the time of Theodosius, indeed, there were people at Rome who possessed several hundred weight of gold. Nay, one is said to have had an annual revenue of two hundred weight. There can be no doubt that the Gauls received the sum they demanded and quitted Rome. That in weighing it, they scornfully imposed upon the Romans is very possible, and the vae victis too may be true. We ourselves have seen similar things before the year 1813, but there can be no truth in the story told by Livy that while they were disputing, Camillus appeared with an army and stopped the proceedings. Because the military tribunes had had no right to conclude the treaty, he is there said to have driven the Gauls from the city, and afterward, in a twofold battle, to have so completely defeated them that not even a messenger escaped. Beaufort, inspired by Gaelic patriotism, has most excellently shown what a complete fable this story is. To attempt to disguise the misfortunes of our forefathers by substituting fables in their place is mere childishness. This charge does not affect Livy, indeed, for he copied only what others had written before him. But he did not allow his own conviction to appear as he generally does, for he treats the whole of the early history with a sort of irony, half believing, half disbelieving it. According to another account in Diodorus, the Gauls besieged the town allied with Rome. Its name seems to be miswritten, but is probably intended for Vulcini, and the Romans relieved it and took back from the Gauls the gold which they had paid them. But this siege of Vulcini is quite unknown to Livy. A third account in Strabo, and also mentioned by Diodorus, does not allow this honor to the Romans, but states that the Kerites pursued the Gauls, attacked them in the country of the Sabines, and completely annihilated them. 
In like manner, the Greeks endeavored to disguise the fact that the Gauls took the money from the Delphic treasury, and that, in a quite historical period, Olymp 120. The true explanation is undoubtedly the one found in Polybius, that the Gauls were induced to quit Rome by an insurrection of the Alpine tribes, after it had experienced the extremity of humiliation. Whatever the enemy had taken as booty was consumed. They had not made any conquests, but only indulged in plunder and devastation. They had been staying at Rome for seven or eight months, and could have gained nothing further than the capital, and the very money which they received without taking that fortress. The account of Polybius throws light upon many discrepant statements, and all of them, not even accepting Livy's fairy tale like embellishment, may be explained by means of it. The Romans attempted to prove that the Gauls had actually been defeated by relating that the gold afterward taken from the Gauls and buried in the capital was double the sum paid to them as ransom. But it is much more probable that the Romans paid their ransom out of the treasury of the temple of the Capitoline Jupiter and of other temples, and that afterward double this sum was made up by a tax, which agrees with a statement in the history of Manlius, that a tax was imposed for the purpose of raising the Gaelic ransom. Surely this could not have been done at the time of the siege, when the Romans were scattered in all parts of the country, but must have taken place afterward for the purpose of restoring the money that had been taken. Now, if at a later time there actually existed in the capital such a quantity of gold, it is clear that it was believed to be a proof that the Gauls had not kept the gold which was paid to them. Even as late as the time of Cicero and Caesar, the spot was shown at Rome in the Carine, where the Gauls had heaped up and burned their dead. It was called Busta Gallica, which was corrupted in the Middle Ages into Protogallo, whence the church which was built there was in reality called St. Andreas in Bustis Gallicis, or, according to the later Latinity, in Busta Gallica, Busta Gallica not being declined. The Gauls departed with their gold, which the Romans had been compelled to pay on account of the famine that prevailed in the capital, which was so great that they pulled the leather from their shields and cooked it, just as was done during the siege of Jerusalem. The Gauls were certainly not destroyed. Justin has preserved the remarkable statement that the same Gauls who sacked Rome went to Apulia, and there offered for money their assistance to the elder Dionysius of Syracuse. From this important statement, it is at any rate clear that they traversed all Italy, and then probably returned along the shore of the Adriatic. Their devastations extended over many parts of Italy, and there is no doubt that the Equians received their death blow at that time, for henceforth we hear no more of the hostilities of the Equians against Rome. Preneste, on the other hand, which must formerly have been subject to the Equians, now appears as an independent town. The Equians, who inhabited small and easily destructible towns, must have been annihilated during the progress of the Gauls. There is nothing so strange in the history of Livy as his view of the consequences of the Gallic calamity. He must have conceived it as a transitory storm by which Rome was humbled but not broken. The army, according to him, was only scattered, and the Romans appear afterward just as they had been before, 
as if the preceding period had only been an evil dream, and as if there had been nothing to do but to rebuild the city. But assuredly the devastation must have been tremendous throughout the Roman territory. For eight months the barbarians had been ravaging the country. Every trace of cultivation, every farmer's house, all the temples and public buildings were destroyed. The walls of the city had been purposely pulled down. A large number of its inhabitants were led into slavery. The rest were living in great misery at Vei, and what they had saved scarcely sufficed to buy their bread. In this condition they returned to Rome. Camillus, as dictator, is called a second Romulus, and to him is due the glory of not having despaired in those distressing circumstances. End of section 13「Section 14 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Tartar Invasion of China by Meha, B.C. 341. By Demetrius Charles Bulger. The first Chinese are supposed to have been a nomad tribe in the provinces of Shenxi, which lies in the northwest of China, and among them at last appeared the ruler, Fo He, whose name at least has been preserved. His deeds and his person are mythical, but he is credited with giving his country its first regular institutions. The analysts of the Chinese chronicles place the date of the creation at a point of time two millions of years before Confucius. This interval they filled up with lines of dynasties. Preceding the Chao dynasty, the chronicles give ten epochs. Prior to the eighth of these, there is no authentic history. Yu Chao She, the nest having, taught the people to build huts of the boughs of trees. Fire was discovered by Sai Jin She, the fire producer. Fu He, B.C. 2862, was the discoverer of iron. With Ya Wu, B.C. 2356, is the period whence Confucius begins his history. He says of that epoch, The house door could safely be left open. Ya Wu, greatly extended and strengthened the empire and established fairs and marts over the land. One of China's most notable rulers was Qin Chi Huangti, who was studious in providing for the security of his empire, and with this object began the construction of a fortified wall across the northern frontier to serve as a defense against the troublesome Hyongnu tribes, who are identified with the Huns of Attila. This wall, which he began in the first years of his reign, about the close of the 3rd century BC, was finished before his death. It still exists, known as the Great Wall of China, and has long been considered one of the wonders of the world. Every third man of the whole empire was employed on this work. It is said that 500,000 of them died of starvation. The contents of the Great Wall would be enough to build two walls, six feet high and two feet thick, around the equator. It is the largest artificial structure in the world carried for 1,400 miles over height and hollow, 
reaching in one place the level of 5,000 feet, nearly one mile above the sea. Earth, gravel, brick and stone were used in its construction. The weak successors of Huang Ti finally gave way to the usurper, Kao Tzu, who had been originally the ruler of a small town and had borne the name of Li Yu Pang. The reign of Kao Tzu was distinguished by the consolidation of the empire, the connection of western and eastern China by high walls and bridges, some of which are still in perfect condition, and the institution of an elaborate code of court etiquette. His attention to these things was, however, rudely interrupted by an eruption of the Hyongnu Tartars. The death of Qin Chi Huangti proved the signal for the outbreak of disturbances throughout the realm. Within a few months, five princes had founded as many kingdoms, each hoping, if not to become supreme, at least to remain independent. Meng Tian, beloved by the army and at the head, as he tells us in his own words, of 300,000 soldiers, might have been the arbiter of the empire. But a weak feeling of respect for the imperial authority induced him to obey an order sent by Yul Chi, Huang Ti's son and successor, commanding him to drink the waters of eternal life. Yul Chi's brief reign of three years was a succession of misfortunes. The reins of office were held by the Yunuk Chao Kao, who first murdered the minister Li Sep and then Yul Chi himself. Ying Guang, a grandson of Huang Ti, was the next and last of the Qin emperors. On coming to power, he at once caused Chao Kao, whose crimes had been discovered, to be arrested and executed. This vigorous commencement proved very transitory, for when he had enjoined nominal authority during six weeks, Ying Guang's troops, after a reverse in the field, went over in a body to Li Yu Pang, the leader of the rebel force. Ying Guang put an end to his existence, thus terminating in a manner not less ignominious than any of its predecessors, the dynasty of the Tsins, which Huang Ti had hoped to place permanently on the throne of China, and to which his genius gave a luster far surpassing that of many other families who had enjoyed the same privilege during a much longer period. The crisis in the history of the country had afforded one of those great men who rise periodically from the ranks of the people to give law to nations the opportunity for advancing his personal interests at the same time that he made them appear to be identical with the public will. Of such geniuses, if the test applied be the work accomplished, there have been few with higher claims to respectful and admiring consideration than Li Yu Pang, who, after the fall of the Tsins, became the founder of the Han dynasty under the style of Cao Tzu. Originally the governor of a small town, he had, soon after the death of Huang Ti, gathered round him the nucleus of a formidable army and while nominally serving under one of the greater princes, he scarcely affected to conceal that he was fighting for his own interest. On the other hand, he was no mere soldier of fortune, and the moderation which he showed after victory enhanced his reputation as a general. The path to the throne being thus cleared, the successful general became emperor. His first act was to proclaim an amnesty to all those who had borne arms against him. 
In a public proclamation, he expressed his regret at the suffering of the people from the evils which follow in the train of war. During the earlier years of his reign, he chose the city of Luoyang as his capital, now the flourishing and populous town of Honan, but at a later period he removed it to Singan Fu, in the western province of Xianxi. His dynasty became known by the name of the small state where he was born, and which had fallen early in his career into his hands. Cao Tzu sanctioned or personally undertook various important public works, which in many places still exist to testify to the greatness of his character. Prominent among those must be placed the bridges constructed along the great roads of western China. Some of them are still believed to be in perfect condition. No act of Cao Tzu's reign places him higher in the scale of sovereigns than the improvement of the roads and the construction of those remarkable bridges. Cao Tzu loved splendor and sought to make his receptions and banquets imposing by their brilliance. He drew up a special ceremonial which must have proved a trying ordeal for his courtiers, and dire was the offense if it were infringed in the smallest particular. He kept up festivities at Singan Fu for several weeks, and on one of these occasions he exclaimed, Today I feel I am emperor, and perceive all the difference between a subject and his master. Cao Tzu's attention was rudely summoned away from these trivialities by the outbreak of revolts against his authority and by inroads on the part of the Tartars. The latter were the more serious. The disturbances that followed Huang Ti's death were a fresh inducement to these clans to again gather round a common head and prey upon the weakness of China, for Cao Tzu's authority was not yet recognized in many of the tributary states which had been fain to admit the supremacy of the great Qin Emperor. About this time, the Hyongnu Tartars were governed by two chiefs in particular, one named Tonggu, the other Meha or Mehe. Of these, the former appears to have been instigated by a reckless ambition or an overweening arrogance, and at first it seemed that the forbearance of Meha would allow his pretensions to pass unchallenged. Meha's successes followed rapidly upon each other. Issuing from the desert and marching in the direction of China, he wrested many fertile districts from the feeble hands of those who held them, and while establishing his personal authority on the banks of the Huang Ho, his lieutenants returned laden with plunder from expeditions into the rich provinces of Shenxi and Shezhuan. He won back all the territory lost by his ancestors to Huang Ti and Mong Tian, and he paved the way to greater success by the siege and capture of the city of Ma Ye, thus obtaining possession of the key of the road to Qinyang. Several of the border chiefs and of the emperor's lieutenants, dreading the punishment allotted to China to want of success, went over to the Tartars and took service under Meha. The emperor fully aroused to the gravity of the danger, assembled his army, and placing himself at its head, marched against the Tartars. Encouraged by the result of several preliminary encounters, the emperor was eager to engage Meha's main army, and after some weeks searching and maneuvering, the two forces halted in front of each other. Cao Tzu, imagining that victory was within his grasp, and believing the stories brought to him by spies, of the weakness of the Tartar army, resolved on an immediate attack. He turned a deaf ear 
to the cautious advice of one of his generals, who warned him that, in war, we should never despise an enemy, and marched in person at the head of his advance guard to find the Tartars. Meha, who had been at all these pains to throw dust in the emperor's eyes and to conceal his true strength, no sooner saw how well his stratagem had succeeded, and that Kao Tzu was rushing into the trap so elaborately laid for him. Then, by a skillful movement, he cut off his communications with the main body of his army, and, surrounding him with an overwhelming force, compelled him to take refuge in the city of Pingqing in Shanxi. With a very short supply of provisions and hopelessly outnumbered, it looked as if the Chinese emperor could not possibly escape the grasp of the desert chief. In this strait, one of his officers suggested as a last chance that the most beautiful virgin in the town should be discovered and sent as a present to mollify the conqueror. Kao Tzu seized at this suggestion, as the drowning man will catch at a straw, and the story is preserved, though her name has passed into oblivion, of how the young Chinese girl entered into the plan and devoted all her wits to charming the Tartar conqueror. She succeeded as much as their fondest hopes, could have led them to believe, and Meha permitted Kao Tzu, after signing an ignominious treaty, to leave his place of confinement and rejoin his army, glad to welcome the return of the emperor, yet without him helpless to stir a hand to effect his release. Meha retired to his own territory, well satisfied with the material results of the war and the rich booty which he had obtained in the sack of Chinese cities, while Kao Tzu, like the ordinary type of an oriental ruler, vented his discomfiture on his subordinates. The closing acts of war were the lavishing of rewards on the head of the general to whose warnings he had paid no heed, and the execution of the scouts who had been misled by the wiles of Meha. The success which had attended this incursion and the spoil of war were potent inducements to the Tartars to repeat the invasion. While Kao Tzu was meditating over the possibility of revenge and considering schemes for the better protection of his frontier, the Tartars, disregarding the truce that had been concluded, retraced their steps and pillaged the border districts with impunity. In this year, B.C. 199, they were carrying everything before them, and the emperor, either unnerved by recent disaster or appalled at the apparently irresistible energy of the followers of Meha, remained apathetic in his palace. The representations of his ministers and generals failed to rouse him from his stupor, and the weapon to which he resorted was the abuse of his opponent, and not his prompt chastisement. Meha was a wicked and faithless man, who had risen to power by the murder of his father, and one of whom oaths and treaties carried no weight. In the meanwhile, the Tartars were continuing their victorious career. The capital itself could not be pronounced safe from their assaults or from the insult of their presence. In this crisis, counsels of craft and dissimulation alone found favor in the emperor's cabinet. No voice was raised in support of the bold and only true course of going forth to meet the national enemy. The capitulation of Ping Ching had for the time destroyed the manhood of the race, and Kao Tzu held in esteem the advice of men widely different to those who had placed him on the throne. Kao Tzu opened fresh negotiations with Meha, who concluded a treaty on the condition of the emperor's daughter being given to him in marriage, 
and on the assumption that he was an independent ruler. With these terms, Kao Tzu felt obliged to comply, and thus, for the first time, this never-ceasing collision between the tribes of the desert and the agriculturists of the plains of China closed with the admitted triumph of the former. The contest was soon to be renewed with different results, but the triumph of Meha was beyond question. The weakness thus shown against a foreign foe brought its own punishment in domestic troubles. The palace became the scene of broils, plots and counterplots, and so badly did Kao Tzu manage his affairs at this epoch that one of his favorite generals raised the standard of revolt against him through apparently a mere misunderstanding. In this instance Kao Tzu easily put down the rising, but others followed which, if not pregnant with danger, were at the least extremely troublesome. The murder of Han Sin, to whose aid Kao Tzu owed his elevation to the throne as much as to any other by order of the Empress, during a reception at the palace, shook confidence still more in the ruler, and many of his followers were forced into open rebellion through dread of personal danger. What wonder that, as he had said, the very name of revolt inspired Kao Tzu with apprehension. In BC 195, we find Kao Tzu going out of his way to visit the tomb of Confucius. Shortly after this event, it became evident that he was approaching his end. His eldest son, Hiao Hoi, was proclaimed heir apparent. Kao Tzu died in the 53rd year of his age, having reigned as emperor during eight years. The close of his reign did not bear out all the promise of its commencement, and the extent of his authority was greatly curtailed by the disastrous effects of the war with the Tartars and the subsequent revolts among his generals. Despite these reverses, there remains much in favor of his character. He had performed his part in the consolidations of the Huns. It remained for those who came after him to complete what he left half finished. Under Ho Yi Ti, the Tartar king Meha sent an envoy to the capital, but either the form or the substance of his message enraged the empress mother who ordered his execution. The two peoples were thus again brought to the brink of war, but eventually the difference was sunk for the time, and the Chinese chroniclers have represented that the satisfactory turn in the question was due to Meha saying the error of his ways. Not long afterward, the Tartar king died and was succeeded by his son, Lao Chang. Meha's letter of excuse is thus given. In the barbarous country which I govern, both virtue and the decencies of life are unknown. I have been unable to free myself from them, and therefore I blush. China has her wise men. That is a happiness which I envy they would have prevented my being wanting in the respect due to your rank. End of section 14。section 15 of the great events by famous historians, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Alexander reduces Tyre, later founds Alexandria. B.C. 332 by Oliver Goldsmith. 
the master spirit, who could sigh for more worlds to conquer, was at this time high in his dazzling flight. Alexander has always been considered one of the most striking and picturesque characters of history. His personality was pleasing, his endurance remarkable, and courage dauntless. Educated by Aristotle, his keen mind was well trained. He was skilled in horsemanship, and his control over the fiery Bucephalus, untamable by others, has become a household tale in all lands. There never was a more kingly prince. A king at twenty, his career has been an object of wonder to succeeding generations. He shot like a meteor across the sky of ancient civilizations. His military achievements were remarkable for quickness of conception and rapidity of execution. His life was a progress from conquest to conquest. Alexander's army, with its solid phalanx, its darting cavalry and light troops, had become irresistible. He possessed Napoleon's ability to select good generals and to make the most of his talents. In battle, Alexander was entirely devoid of fear. After a victory, his chief thoughts were for the wounded. Like Napoleon, he also possessed that personal equation of absolute popularity with his soldiers. Their devotion to him was simply complete. After Thebes came the invasion of Asia. The invincible Macedonian had fought and won the Battle of Granicus. In this battle, nearly all of the Persian leaders were slain, and its result spread terror throughout Persia. Halicarnassus was next reduced. The march of Alexander was ever onward. In the citadel of Gordium, he cut the Gordian knot, and prophecy marked him for the Lord of Asia. And now Darius marched to meet him, making a fatally bad choice of battleground. Darius was totally defeated at the celebrated Battle of Issus, although he anticipated a victory. After the Persian rout and the flight of Darius, whose numbers counted for nothing before the Macedonians' skill, Lyndon welcomed the invaders, and Alexander determined to take Tyre. This was accomplished after a siege, which was attended with much cruelty. The siege of Gaza followed, in which nearly all of the citizens perished. In BC 332, Alexander began his expedition to Egypt. He conciliated the natives by paying honors to their gods. In his progress, he was struck by the advantages of a certain site for a city, and founded there the town which is now called Alexandria. All Phoenicia was subdued except Tyre, the capital city. The city was justly entitled the Queen of the Sea, that element bringing to it the tribute of all nations. She boasted of having first invented navigation and taught mankind the art of braving the winds and waves by the assistance of a frail bark. The happy situation of Tyre at the upper end of the Mediterranean, the conveniency of its ports, which are both safe and capacious, and the character of its inhabitants, who were industrious, laborious, patient, and extremely courteous to strangers, invited thither merchants from all parts of the globe, so that it might be considered not so much a city belonging to any particular nation, as the common city of all nations and the center of their commerce. Alexander thought it necessary, both for his glory and his interest, to take this city. The spring was now coming on. Tyre was at that time seated on an island of the sea, about a quarter of a league from the continent. It was surrounded by a strong wall, 
a hundred and fifty feet high, which the waves of the sea washed, and the Carthaginians, a colony from Tyre, a mighty people, and sovereigns of the ocean, promised to come to the assistance of their parent state. Encouraged, therefore, by these favorable circumstances, the Tyrians determined not to surrender, but to hold out the place to the last extremity. This resolution, however imprudent, was certainly magnanimous, but it was soon after followed by an act which was as blamable as the other was praiseworthy. Alexander was desirous of gaining the place rather by treaty than by force of arms, and with this in view sent heralds into the town with offers of peace but the inhabitants were so far from listening to his proposals or endeavoring to avert his resentment by any kind of concession that they actually killed his ambassadors and threw their bodies from the top of the walls into the sea. It is easy to imagine what effect so shocking an outrage must produce in a mind like Alexander's he instantly resolved to besiege the place, and not to desist until he had made himself master of it, and raised it to the ground. As Tyre was divided from the continent by an arm of the sea, there was necessity for filling up the intermediate space with a bank or pier, before the place could be closely invested. This work, accordingly, was immediately undertaken, and in a great measure completed, when all the wood of which it was principally composed was unexpectedly burned by means of a fire ship sent him by the enemy. The damage, however, was very soon repaired, and the mole rendered more perfect than formerly, and carried nearer to the town when all of a sudden a furious tempest arose, which, undermining the stonework that supported the wood, laid the hole at once in the bottom of the sea. Two such disasters following so closely on the heels of each other would have cooled the ardor of any man except Alexander, but nothing could daunt his invincible spirit or make him relinquish an enterprise he had once undertaken. He therefore resolved to prosecute the siege, and in order to encourage his men to second his views, he took care to inspire them with the belief that heaven was on their side, and would soon crown their labor with the wished-for success. At one time he gave out that Apollo was about to abandon the Tyrians to their doom, and that, to prevent his flight, they had bound him to his pedestal with a golden chain. At another he pretended that Hercules, the tutelar deity of Macedon, had appeared to him, and having opened prospects of the most glorious kind, had invited him to proceed to take possession of Tyre. These favorable circumstances were announced by the augurs as intimations from above, and every heart was in consequence cheered. The soldiers, as if that moment arrived before the city, forgetting all the toils they had undergone and the disappointments they had suffered, began to raise a new mole at which they worked incessantly. To protect them from being annoyed by the ships of the enemy, Alexander fitted out a fleet, with which he not only secured his own men, but offered the Tyrians battle, which, however, they thought proper to decline, and withdrew all their galleys into the harbor. The besiegers, now allowed to proceed unmolested, went on with the work with the utmost vigor, and in a little time completed it and brought it close to the walls. A general attack was therefore resolved on, both by sea and land, and with this in view, the king, having manned his galleys and joined them together with strong cables, 
ordered them to approach the walls about midnight and attack the city with resolution. But just as the assault was going to begin, a dreadful storm arose, which not only shook the ships asunder, but even shattered them in a terrible manner, so that they were all obliged to be towed toward the shore, without having made the least impression on the city. The Tyrians were elated with this gleam of good fortune, but that joy was of short duration, for in a little time they have received intelligence from Carthage that they must expect no assistance from that quarter, as the Carthaginians themselves were then overawed by a powerful army of Syracusans who had invaded their country. Reduced, therefore, to the hard necessity of depending entirely upon their own strength and their own resources, the Tyrians sent all their women and children to Carthage, and prepared to encounter the very last extremities, for now the enemy was attacking the place with greater spirit and activity than ever. And, to do the Tyrians justice, it must be acknowledged that they employed a number of methods of defense, which, considering the rude state of the art of war at that early period, were really astonishing. They warded off the darts discharged from the balusters against them by the assistance of turning wheels, which either broke them to pieces or carried them another way. They deadened the violence of the stones that were hurled at them by setting up sails and curtains made of a soft substance which easily gave way. To annoy the ships which advanced against their walls, they fixed grappling irons and scythes to joists or beams, then straining their catapultas, an enormous kind of crossbow, they laid those great pieces of timber upon them instead of arrows, and shot them off on a sudden at the enemy. These crushed some of their ships by their great weight, and by the means of the hooks or hanging scythes tore others to pieces. They also had brazen shields, which they drew red-hot out of the fire, and filling these with burning sand, hurled them in an instant from the top of the wall upon the enemy. There was nothing the Macedonians dreaded so much as this fatal instrument, for the moment the burning sand got to the flesh through the crevices of the armor, it penetrated to the very bone, and stuck so close that there was no pulling it off, so that the soldiers throwing down their arms and tearing their clothes to pieces, were in this manner exposed, naked and defenseless, to the shot of the enemy. Alexander, finding the resources and even the courage of the Tyrians increased in proportion as the siege continued, resolved to make a last effort and attack them at once, both by sea and land, in order, if possible, to overwhelm them with the multiplicity of dangers to which they would be thus exposed. With this view, having managed his galleys with some of the bravest of his troops, he commanded them to advance against the enemy's fleet, while he himself took his post at the head of his men on the mole. And now the attack began on all sides with irresistible and unremitting fury. Wherever the battering rams had beat down any part of the wall, and the bridges were thrown out, instantly the Argiraspides mounted the bridge with the utmost valor, being led by Admetus, one of the bravest officers in the army, who was killed by the thrust of a spear as he was encouraging his soldiers. The presence of the king and the example he set, fired his troops with unusual bravery. He himself ascended one of the towers on the mole, which was of a prodigious height, and there was exposed to the greatest dangers 
he had ever yet encountered, for being immediately known by his insignia and the richness of his armor, he served as a mark for all the arrows of the enemy. On this occasion he performed wonders, killing with javelins several of those who defended the wall. Then, advancing nearer to them, he forced some with his sword, and others with his shield, either into the city or the sea, the tower on which he fought almost touching the wall. He soon ascended the wall, followed by his principal officers, and possessed himself of two towers and the space between them. The battering rams had already made several breaches. The fleet had forced its way into the harbor, and some of the Macedonians had possessed themselves of the towers which were abandoned. The Tyrians, seeing the enemy, masters of their rampart, retired toward an open place called Agenor, and there stood their ground. But Alexander, marching up with his regiment of bodyguards, killed part of them and obliged the rest to fly. At the same time, Tyre being taken on that side which lay toward the harbor, a general carnage of the citizens ensued, and none was spared except the few that fell into the hands of the Cyclonians in Alexander's army, who, considering the Tyrians as countrymen, granted them protection and carried them privately on board their ships. The number that was slaughtered on this occasion is almost incredible. Even after conquest, the victor's resentment did not subside. He ordered no less than 5,000 men who were taken in the storming to be nailed to crosses along the shore. The number of prisoners amounted to 30,000 and were all sold as slaves in different parts of the world. Thus fell Tyre, that had been for many ages the most flourishing city in the world, and had spread the arts and commerce into the remotest regions. While Alexander was employed in the siege of Tyre, he received a second letter from Darius, in which that monarch treated him with greater respect than before. He now gave him the title of king. He offered him ten thousand talents as a ransom for his captive mother and queen, and he promised him his daughter Statira in marriage. With all the country he had conquered, as far as the river Euphrates, provided he would agree to a peace. These terms were so advantageous that, when the king debated upon them in council, Parmenio, one of his generals, could not help observing that he would certainly accept of them were he Alexander. And so would I, replied the king, were I Parmenio but deeming it inconsistent with his dignity to listen to any proposal from a man whom he had so lately overcome, he haughtily rejected them, and scorned to accept of that as a favor which he already considered his own by conquest. From Tyre Alexander marched to Jerusalem, fully determined to punish that city for having refused to supply his army with provisions during the siege. But his resentment was mollified by a deputation of the citizens coming out to meet him with their high priest, Tadua, before them, dressed in white and having a mitre on his head, on the front of which the name of God was written. The moment the king perceived the high priest, he advanced toward him with an air of the most profound respect, bowed his body, adored the august name upon his front, and saluted him, who wore it with religious veneration. And when some of his courtiers expressed their surprise that he, who was adored by everyone, should adore the high priest of the Jews, I do not, said he, adore the high priest, but the God whose minister he is, for while I was at Dium in Macedonia, 
my mind wholly fixed on the great design of the Persian War. As I was revolving the methods how to conquer Asia, this very man, dressed in the same robes, appeared to me in a dream, exhorted me to banish my fear, bade me cross the Hellespont boldly, and assured me that God would march at the head of my army and give me the victory over the Persians. This speech, delivered with an air of sincerity, no doubt, had its effect in encouraging the army and establishing an opinion that his mission was from heaven. From Jerusalem he went to Gaza, where, having met with a more obstinate resistance than he expected, he cut to pieces the whole garrison, consisting of ten thousand men. Not satisfied with this act of cruelty, he caused holes to be bored through the hills of Boetes, the governor, and tying him with cords to the back of his chariot, dragged him in this manner around the walls of the city. This he did in imitation of Achilles, whom Homer describes of having dragged Hector around the walls of Troy in the same manner. It was read in the past to very little, or rather, indeed, to very bad purpose, to imitate this hero in the most unworthy part of his character. Alexander, having left the garrison in Gaza, turned his arms toward Egypt, of which he made himself master without opposition. Here he formed the design of visiting the Temple of Jupiter, which was situated in the sandy deserts of Libya, at the distance of twelve days' journey from Memphis, the capital of Egypt. His chief object in going thither was to get himself acknowledged the son of Jupiter, an honor he had long aspired to. In this journey he founded the city of Alexandria, which soon became one of the greatest towns in the world for commerce. Nothing could be more dreary than the desert through which he passed, nor anything more charming, according to the fabulous accounts of the poets, than the particular spot where the temple was situated. It was a perfect paradise in the midst of an immeasurable wilderness. At last, having reached the place and appeared before the altar of the deity, the priest, who was no stranger to Alexander's wishes, declared him to be the son of Jupiter. The conqueror, elated with this high compliment, asked whether he should have success in his expedition. The priest answered that he should be the monarch of the world. The conqueror inquired if his father's murderers were punished. The priest replied that his father, Jupiter, was immortal but that the murderers of Philip had all been extirpated. End of section 15